Is it now like, you know, if there was going to be like someone from the conference, like doing the introduction, uh, if people like there in the aisle know if there's a talk going on here or not, uh, and all this, right? But so they, they told me just start. So, and it also be, will be recorded. So let's go. So yeah, so this is the talk about leave home safe, the good, the bad, the ugly. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for coming and let's get started. So I'll start with the usual, uh, who am I? Some brief introduction about how all this happened. And then some uh, good impressions, bad impressions, and ugly impressions from uh, this experience. Uh, and then some conclusions, and uh, you can also like ask any questions at the end as well. So I'm Abraham Arangreng, I'm the CEO of 70 Security. We do pen tests and we do security training. In fact, if you are interested in this talk, uh, I will be teaching our mobile course uh, at DakotaCon uh, on Saturday and Sunday this week. So that starts tomorrow. I think maybe some of you can still uh, join, I'm not sure. And yeah, I'm like co-author of all our courses. We've done training at Black Hat, uh, Hugging the Box, uh, OWAS Global AppSec, LastCon, 44Con, Hackfest, Nullcon, Secti, and many other events. We were also at Nullcon Berlin last week. Uh, if you are interested into OWAS stuff, I'm also like the founder and one of the project leaders for OWAS OWTF. So if you put this in your browser, OWTF.org, this takes you to the OWAS page and you can read more about it. It's basically a web security type of open source project. So this is all completely free and open source. And this, these are some of my old presentations. And for the certifications, uh, I mean, at the time, my employer was paying for it. So I said, well, why not, right? And I was like a developer first, and then I switched to security. So if you are a developer, I know like it has to be in production on Friday. I know all the pressure and all that. And if you are a security, like a pen tester or uh, similar, I also know like the frustration of why are you not fixing my vulnerabilities, right? So I know uh, both sides, so regardless of your background, I got your back, right? So, um, yeah, let's, um, yeah, also, like, if you like this talk, uh, there's a lot of uh, public pen test reports, so these are the ones that we were allowed to publish uh, last year. So K9 Mail is the new Thunderbird for Android, Argo VPN for Iranian citizens to be able to navigate the free internet. BridgeFi is a cool concept to uh, encapsulate messages through each other using Bluetooth in the event of an internet shutdown, right? So if you are like, let's say like New York goes out of power, right? How would people be able to communicate given that in about 30 minutes probably all the cell phone towers will run out of uh, battery, right? Like the UPS will probably shut down. So people would still be able to talk to each other through Bluetooth. And actually, that part of the project, we didn't find any vulnerabilities on that. We found a lot of other problems in other places, but not on that. And they also fixed uh, everything we found. Other interesting projects from uh, last year were MVM. You probably use this, or your developers do. Therefore, to fix an, an interesting privacy hole in the OpenSSL uh, handshake. So we also audited that. Opac is an interesting project where the client doesn't send the password to the server. So like that so in the database there's not even like password hashes of your users right so it's a, it's a very uh, a very cool concept and actually this project was really good like we found almost nothing and ground truth is like to measure the internet censorship right so it it has like tools for researchers to to check um, if you know like there's someone like censoring the internet right basically and uh, it has like some tools for that so all these pentest reports are completely free so just go to security.com publications and you click on any of those links and it gives you the pdf you don't need to register or anything so i'm just saying it's a you know regardless of the company that publishes the pentest reports it's just a, another like fun way to learn about security for free right just checking some recent pentest report and see what's being found nowadays on mobile applications or otherwise or otherwise right and in 2002 we were allowed to publish these reports here so today we will be talking about leave home safe right so it's a covid-19 contact tracing application uh, kind of mandated in Hong Kong, let's say enforced, uh, and, and yeah, that's, this is what we will be talking about uh, today. So, so yeah, I, in this line of leave home safe, which has like ties to the Chinese government and potential like spying on people and things like this, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, interesting projects I also worked in the past. So Smart Sheriff was uh, an application uh, mandated by law in South Korea to, in theory, protect children, but in practice, uh, catastrophic security implementation. It was so bad, we even gave a talk about it. So <laughs> you can go to YouTube and search Smart Sheriff Dumb Idea, and you will see like some presentations that we gave a few, at a few conferences. And another one you can search on YouTube is Chinese Police and Cloud Pets. 
uh, about like some like Chinese police and Chinese government uh, applications to um, basically most of these. Uh, well, these two were related to um, monitoring or controlling the um, Muslim minority in a region of China called Xinjiang. And study the great nation was kind of a concept of um, gamification of how much you know about the great leader of China. And the more you know about the great leader of China, the more points you get. And then with these points, you can do cool stuff in China, right? So it was kind of uh, this idea of application. So we were just checking it, you know, if uh, they are doing something under the hood, like it's that kind of dodgy or something like that, right? So let's do a, a brief uh, introduction. So let me, um, let me give this a little bit more. Uh, uh, let me see if you can hear this, hopefully. Let's see. Oh, wait. The audio. <laughs> Which we will also need for later. Ah. So I think we'll need the one on speaker for this and Okay, so hopefully this will work. Let's see. Let's try this again. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, now. <laughs> okay, now let me try that again now that it works. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so this is just to give you uh, a quick, uh, you know, uh, nice uh, introduction uh, about it. But yeah, basically it's like a COVID-19 contact tracing application, right? So the promise of the application is if you've been in contact with someone who was infected by COVID or could have been, you will be alerted, but this will be done in a privacy uh, secure way, right? But of course, because of the whole political situation in Hong Kong, with the Chinese government kind of taking over and the population there being used to being kind of in the UK because it was like a UK colony, right? They, had, they didn't have like the Great Firewall of China and a lot of other things that they, in mainline China was common. But the Chinese are now pushing all that there. Um, There's this the question, right? Like is the Chinese uh, government using this to spy on people, right? So there was like a mandatory use, right? So basically, um, yeah, this, uh, this is kind of the resistance of people. So I'll just play the video so you can see like in the news uh, what's going on, right? It will be like easier uh, to see that way. The mandatory use of the Leave Home Safe app to enter interviews and entertainment venues has not been fully welcomed. Some residents said they will stop going to the cinema because of privacy concerns, while restaurant owners may switch to takeaways when the measure is enforced in two weeks. Emily reports. It's become almost a reflex action, scanning the leave home safe code on entry to many venues. This woman said she's got used to it because working in a public swimming pool requires her to do it every day. Currently, there is still the option of filling a paper form, but that will be gone in two weeks' time. Starting on December 9th, the contact tracing app becomes a must for all premises regulated under the Prevention and Control of Disease Regulation. Why isn't the Leave Home Safe app made compulsory for the MTR and buses then? This man asked, noting that they are usually crowded. He said he may stop going to the cinema due to privacy concerns. Also affected under the new mandate are eateries, like this Type A restaurant, which is not required to collect any customer's records at the moment. If I really want to, I will 
The manager said it serves a lot of elderly people and school children who don't have smartphones, adding it may change course to do more takeaways or catering services. The new measure comes into force as Hong Kong tries to persuade the mainland to resume quarantine-free travel. Another plus for the city is that it has finally reached its vaccination target, with 70% of the population having received at least one dose. Ultimately, HKIBC. Okay. So, so yeah, you get the you get the idea, right? Uh, with this, so it's kind of. Um, yeah, so the, at the beginning it was just checking the visit records, then in version 2 they added an option to contain also like your vaccination records in the app, and then in version 3 they added this connection to the Hong Kong health code system for which we will have a critical finding uh, in a few uh, slides. So basically the, the history of this is like in November 2020, the Hong Kong government introduces the Live Home Safe Android and iOS apps. Initially, the adoption was very limited because of what you just saw in this like, video from YouTube, like um, the population is, has privacy concerns, right? Like are, are the Ch uh, Chinese using this to spy on us? So people like use like secondary mobile devices to keep like sensitive content separate and other uh, countermeasures like this, right? So these are some things that the population did. Um, then uh, in response to this, um, they, they changed, for example, they reduced some of the excessive permissions. So from 15 permissions, they lower it to seven. There was like a privacy assessment asserting the compliance of personal data ordinance. And then the, the Hong Kong government tried relaxing operating hours for restaurants, reopening uh, some establishments uh, and, and yeah, and then I'm adding like customer information registration, right? So this is kind of a little bit of the timeline, right? So this policy evolved due to the Chinese government encouragement aiming to reduce second phone use, establishing real name registration, right? Um, and then um, in November 2021, things got tougher, right? So here, like the government mandated the app use uh, for entry into uh, various public venues. So if you want to, for example, go to church, go to a restaurant, take the underground, uh, you name it, right? So if you want to basically leave, like leave your apartment, uh, you had like to scan this everywhere, right? And you had to go with your mobile phone and show the Q QR code uh, like everywhere, and then this would get scanned, and then with the hope that you would get alerted if you've been in contact with someone infected by COVID, right? So, uh, so yeah, they also added this, like so fines for violation of not using the app and non-compliant restaurants were downgraded uh, in operating privileges, right? So this, all these enforcement reduced in a substantial increase in application uh, down, downloads. So there were, um, you can see it here, like eight million people using this by late June, raising uh, suspicious uh, suspicions on artificial inflation. But anyway, the thing is, like a lot more people were using this, right? And then the government kept uh, kept uh, attempting to address the privacy concerns with public statements and stuff like that. And then in May uh, 2022, which is actually at the same time that we were performing the audit, we also f uh, found these like, facial recognition capabilities in the app, but nor Fagwire nor us could confirm that these were actually being used. It seemed like um, an artifact, like they were just using a library that had face recognition, but the application was not actually using it to spy on people like uh, at runtime, right? So, but in general, the concerns are like personal data security, government surveillance, and data ret retention, right? So personal data security is what are they doing with all these data, right? Like if I have been infected by COVID, if I'm uh, vaccinated or not, right? So the application had all this type of information. Uh, how are they protecting that on the device? How are they prote protecting that on the servers? Uh, and then for gov uh, government surveillance, right? Like are they like somehow uh, using this to, you know, collect data about the citizens uh, and all, all these uh, types of concerns, right? And then there's also the consent and transparency, third-party access, right? Like is other applications sending all these data to third parties uh, and all that, right? So in general, balancing uh, contact tracing effectiveness and user privacy is very challenging, right? So you have to be alerted if you have been in contact with someone infected by COVID, but not with the application or servers knowing who you are. And actually, this part of the project uh, was one of the good things that the applications did. They were not uh, collecting uh, user, user information. Like, you could use the entire application without saying who you are, for example, right? So 
this was one of the good things, but uh, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. So let's talk about um, the concerns, right? So this is why we did the audit, right? So we audited um, the Android and iOS applications for Leave Home Safe uh, between April and May uh, 2022. This was funded by the Open Technology Fund in Washington. And, uh, and yeah, and this is the public report, right? So this, you can like read the entire report. It's all on the website, Seven Security Code Publications, and then you just go for Leave Home Safe and you can see like all the, all the details in there. Um, I also recorded some uh, demos on YouTube as well. Uh, and yeah, the project attempted to address these concerns, right? Like what, what is the security and the privacy of these, of these applications that are being used by 8 million people, right? So, this was required in government venues, hospitals, markets, shopping malls, supermarkets, places of worship, and, and many more places, right? So basically people had to use this, right? So what did we do, right? We had to use uh, black box methodology, right? We didn't have access to user data, we didn't have documentation, we didn't have uh, source code. Of course, we were not uh, talking to the developers or anything like that, like in a real pen test, right? So this was kind of a, a public safety audit, right? Where the actual vendor of the app is not contacted and you do the pen test without their permission, but since we are testing the mobile apps locally in our own devices, we're actually not uh, violating anything in most countries, right? I think in South America there's some um, exceptions to this, but uh, not for us, uh, I mean, we are registered in Ireland. So, so yeah, so uh, the test limitations, uh, some major test limitations where we didn't have Hong Kong health code system credentials, right? So we couldn't log into that part of the application. We didn't have uh, valid vaccination uh, QR codes, and we didn't have uh, COVID testing status QR codes, right? But we got around this with some help uh, with some friends from Hong Kong and some stuff that we could find uh, online uh, and so on. So we had four uh, auditors looking at this, and mainly we focused on the compilation, reverse engineering, and runtime analysis. So let's talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, right, from the title of the presentation. So the good uh, was that the result, uh, while the results were subpar, right, we found uh, like high and critical severity vulnerabilities, which in commercial mobile apps nowadays is very rare. Normally in commercial mobile apps, the maximum we find nowadays is medium, right, because like you, you require to have like a malicious app on your device or some other like big attack requirements. Uh, to exploit, but in this case we, we managed to find like two highs and one critical, which was really bad. Uh, so yeah, that was part of the bad, but the good was that, um, that yeah, we, there were some positive things including the privacy stuff. The bad was, yeah, the identified vulnerabilities and the ugly was the disclosure process, right? The, the uh, desperate attempt to save face by the politicians uh, together with the poor journalism that gives uh, the same weight to whatever bullshit the politician is saying to the evidence of a Pentas report, right? So, so yeah. So I'll elaborate on these things uh, now, but let's talk about the good, right? So the Android and the iOS apps did a few things really well. Uh, so they securely protected sensitive data at rest. There was no exposure of user data in the logs. Uh, it was all encrypted. Even in the Android Keystore and the iOS Keychain, the data was encrypted. They did not leak um, Hong Kong health code system credentials in HTTP caching artifacts, which is kind of rare. Normally, most commercial apps are vulnerable to this by default. Uh, the Android app explicitly disabled backups to avoid leaks, explicitly disabled clear text HTTP traffic, so this was also good. The iOS app didn't uh, create ATS exceptions, so um, there was also like clear text HTTP is, is blocked, right? So in modern Android and iOS versions, clear text HTTP is blocked by default, but many times developers like override this and allow clear text, uh, like modifying like some settings, right? So in, in iOS, this is called ATS exceptions, so they did not use this to allow clear text, so this is good. They also didn't employ custom URL schemes, which are prone to URL hijacking, so URL hijacking was not possible uh, in iOS, right? So these are some of the good things, right? Other good things is that there were um, the, the Google API keys that they are using uh, in the apps are restricted. Then the secrets um, were correctly being secured. They were used the uh, hardware back security enclaves of the platform, right? So what we always say to developers is that you should use the Android key store and the, and, and the iOS keychain, right? So these places are the correct locations in the mobile devices to store secrets because they are hardware backed, right? They have uh, mechanisms in place that are uh, hardware based to 
to give protection even in the case of physical access to the device, right? So these are the correct locations to, to store secrets and they were using them, right? So this was also good. Um, and in general, yeah, all user information and visit records was encrypted. Uh, and this was really cool, right? So to resolve the challenge that I was telling you before, like how can you know if you've been in contact with someone infected by COVID without knowing the names of people, right? So the way they did this was with uh, Firebase, right? So with Firebase, you can register a device and, and Firebase like knows like, okay, this device, and then maybe this device was someone that later reports that they are infected by COVID, right? So with the proximity thing, because people are like scanning their um, QR codes everywhere, uh, then you can notify like the other people that were potentially in touch with this person because they were, for example, at, at this cinema, right? Uh, cinema X, let's call it, right? So then the other people uh, can get notified without really like the applications or, uh, or the servers knowing who the people actually are just with the Firebase device registration, right? So it's a, a good balance between privacy uh, uh, and contact tracing, right? So this, this part was really good. So, so yeah, so now let's talk about the bad, right? So let's start with the lows, right? So missing security screen uh, on Android and iOS, right? So basically, uh, on Android and iOS, uh, both platforms try to fake that they are faster than really are than they really are by taking a screenshot of the last the last screen that was open and saving and saving this screenshot, right? So normally in this screenshot there could be like some leak. In this case, it could be like if you are vaccinated of COVID or not, or it could be like your credentials to logging or something like that, depending on the last screen that was being opened, right? Or whatever is displayed when you log into the Hong Kong health code system, right? So you could be like logged in and maybe all your personal information is there, and then you background the app, and then this is cached in the in this screenshot, right? So to solve this, you would need to uh, capture the event when the application is backgrounded and put like a blank screen in there, which pretty much all commercial banking applications and password vaults do like by default, right? So these are very common. So, so yeah, you just navigate to some sensitive screen when you want to test for this, right? So first you navigate to a sensitive screen, then you send the application to the background, and then you show the open apps, and then you observe if, if the text input is like displayed on the sensitive screen or not, right? If they basically are implementing a security screen. So, so yeah, uh, and also uh, an important consideration is that this remains readable even after a device reboot, right? So the... Um, the platform like fakes that is faster than it really is by just showing you this screenshot, right? So these are some of the possible leaks when you try to log into the Hong Kong health code system, like your credentials could be displayed in there uh, and stuff like that, right? Or your Hong Kong uh, identity card number um, and other things. Another possibility could be the COVID infection leak. Uh, you can see it. Uh, so this is like the Android app and this is the iOS app, right? So this is some of the other data that could be leaked in this way. Um, and another possibility was the um, visit leak, right? So if the last screen you had opened was that you were in the gym, then this is like being cached in the screenshot. Uh, and this could be seen, but anybody with access to an unlocked device uh, could see this, right? Uh, and this is like another example of like all, all your list of uh, what you're visiting, right? Or where you're moving. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like not, not super serious because it's, the leak is only going to be limited to the last screenshot, but, but still bad, you know, like an application that 8 million people are forced to use that is vulnerable to something as simple as this. Now this uh, happens like in almost every commercial pen test. There's either task hijacking or vulnerability to strong, uh, strong hog 2.0, right? So it's either one or the other, but in most uh, cases it still works, right? So let's explain how this attack works, right? So this is an attack specific to Android Android fixed this in Android 11, but most applications support like lower versions, so this attack is still relevant to users that are using like a, a vulnerable Android version, right? So, so yeah, so for doing this attack, the attacker needs to mess with the task affinity, and uh, this happens when um, the application is using single tax mode and, and task reparenting, right? So let's see how this looks, right? So you look at the Android manifest, and here you see, okay, the launch mode is single task, and then this is the launcher activity, right? So if the launcher activity is single task and there's like no task affinity set to, um, uh, to blank here, as we will see in the mitigation in a second, then this is vulnerable to task hijacking uh, by default, right? 
So, so let's do a demo because this is kind of a weird attack to explain. Uh, and I think if you just see it, it will make more sense, right? So what we are doing here is you open the legitimate application, right? So this is the leave home safe application. So that's in there, in the task manager. And then you launch the attacker application, right? So this has just messed with the task manager. And then what happens is, now the demo will play again. What happens is when you open uh, the legitimate uh, application, when you try to open the legitimate application from the task manager in Android, see now the attacker is uh, messing with the, with the task list. And then what happens is when you click on the list of open applications in Android, um, what you're really opening is the attacker application instead of the legitimate one. So what you could do is, for example, uh, complete, like mimic like perfectly the login page, uh, and then the user believes they are on the legitimate app, and they give you the credentials. They give the credentials to the attacker, right? So this is why a lot of banking trojans uh, have used this technique in the past, right? So this is kind of maybe easier uh, <clears throat> to understand with the demo. So this is the way to fix this type of attack. So you go to the application tag, and then you set the Android affinity to a blank string. So then the attacker doesn't, does no longer have a, a task uh, activity to, uh, to target, right? Because Android will use a random one instead of the known one, right? And then you can also change the launch mode to single instance, right? So if you, if you do these two things, you are basically not, no longer vulnerable to, to this attack, right? So this is how you should fix it, and this is how they fixed it uh, silently, silently after the disclosure that will be, I will be talking about later on. Now, this is a little bit more serious, right? So it was possible to get COVID status access through the unsafe uh, SD, uh, SD card storage, right? So um, the Android app stored like the COVID vaccination and COVID st test status images in the SD card. Um, and this is bad because you could have the QR codes in a safer location, right? So you could import the QR code from Google Drive, which is like protected by, by authentication, right? So if you did this import, then the application stored the QR code in the SD card. And why is this bad, right? So the SD card is an inappropriate location for sensitive data just in general. So an unskilled thief, right? So let's say you forget your phone in, in a taxi, right? Or, uh, or in a toilet or whatever, right? So then you can like physically like extract the SD card, plug it into a computer, and then you can read everything, right? Whatever is on the SD card. So this is why uh, storing like anything sensitive in the SD card is bad, right? And you don't actually have to know the pin to or unlock pattern. You just like physically like you take the phone, extract the card, plug it into the computer, right? So you don't need to even like break the, like gain access to the unlock device or anything. And another app, uh, possibility is that you could have a malicious app on the device and all apps uh, in Android that have SD card access can read or modify anything stored in the SD card, right? So the only requirement is that the app has the SD card access permission, and then uh, they would be able to read uh, all these, right? So this is uh, a more serious problem. So this is how, how it worked, right? So you went in here to enter um, your electronic vaccination record, Right, and then you try to add it, and you want to add it by importing it from Google Drive, right? So there was like this import button, um, and then this is how it looked, right? So you have uh, the file, and then you try to push it, and then this uh, uploaded this on the SD card. So this is like a known location in Android for for the application, right? And in pictures, and then you can see here that a JPEG file was being uploaded. The scanned image remained in the SD card even after the import was finished. And then this is like trivial to download uh, to a computer uh, just using the ADB command, right? Like this, you can also like ADB pull of the, um, of the JPEG file, right? So it's just a, another approach, right? But simpler, like in a real time, would be to extract the SD card uh, and so on. So in general, how to fix this? You should avoid the SD card for storing sensitive data. Image, images in general should be stored in the internal storage of the application. So this is the data data directory in Android, is where Android can actually enforce permissions and ensure like application A cannot read data from application B, right? And another possibility is to use the um, file provider to grant access to relevant apps like the Android camera, like on a, on a need to access basis, right? So this is like another possible uh, approach to this. So at a minimum, 
uh, if the uh, before counter if the countermeasures I mentioned before were not possible, another approach could be to encrypt and, and uh, promptly deleting the the QR codes in the SD card as soon as they are imported, which we, they were not doing. But even shredding may not entirely erase the files from the flash storage, right? So flash storage is a little bit weird for for this. So. Uh, but it would still like reduce the forensic recovery uh, chances in case of an attacker like tries to do like forensics on an SD card. If you shred it, uh, your chances of obfuscating it would be, be greater. But it would be better to just encrypt it, right? So, so yeah, these are like some of the ideas to mitigate this. Now, this is uh, very funny, right? Uh, so this is like the COVID status access access through an auth bypass, right? So they had this feature where you could enable authentication to access the COVID vaccination records, uh, and then you require like a pin or a fingerprint uh, for access. So this feature uh, can be like trivially bypassed by your grandmother, right? Because there was like a, a logic flaw in this that's really funny, right? So a malicious attacker with access to an unlocked device could gain access to the user COVID vaccination and COVID uh, status, right? So you just go uh, to the screen and you disable the um, <clears throat> two-factor protection and then it works, right? So it's basically like that. So maybe I'll just show the, the proof of concept uh, demo, which is here. But basically what we're doing is just go to the settings and then you go in here. So if you enable it and you try to access the vaccination records, it's asking you to the, for the touch ID in iOS or in Android. If you enable it, it required the fingerprint, right, on the Android device. But you can restart the device, open the device uh, again, and then you just turn this off. Uh, and so before you were prompted for this, so you just go to the settings, disable it, and now you can like access uh, all this without the prompt, right? So that is basically, the attack is like super simple. It's like a logic bug, right? Like they should, when you disable the setting, they should like prompt you again to enter the fingerprint, right? Before you disable it, because otherwise this is like doing nothing, because you just disable it and, and bypass it, right? So there's a demo in YouTube, uh, but I think I also have a demo here. So, so yeah, let me. So we are basically enabling the authentication, right? And then when you try to go to see the electronic vaccination record, it's prompting for the touch ID, right? So this is the security feature, right, for this. So. Um, after this, you just go to the settings and then you disable it, right? So, and and then once you, so in here it's just showing like, because it's still enabled, it's prompting you, right? And now we'll just go in there um, and um, enable it again uh, and so on, right? So this is just uh, double checking that I'm closing the app and opening it again. It's correctly prompting for the touch ID, right? So this all makes sense. But now we are going to disable it, right? So we just disable the, the um, touch ID from the settings. Uh, and now when you uh, tap on this again, there's no prompt anymore, right? So that's, that's basically the attack, right? It's like, these are the coolest attacks, right? Because always risk is the uh, attack difficulty by impact, multiplied by impact, right? So in this case, it's like uh, an insecure direct object reference, which is also like an attack that your grandmother or your grandfather can do, right? Like you just change an ID in the URL and you can see somebody else's data. So this is the same thing. We have a security feature that you just go into the menu and then you disable it and now you can access it. So it's the same as if the feature didn't exist because it's not doing anything, right? Like anybody can just go into the settings and, and then you can read everything, right? So. So yeah, this was a little bit funny. They actually spent eight million on this application, by the way. So uh, so yeah, not not really very well tested. Uh, and, and yeah, so this is um, how it should be fixed, right? So it should basically require the the fingerprint or the pin whenever enable authentication for accessing electronic vaccination and testing record. If you enable it or disable it, especially if you try to disable it, it should prompt you for it, right? because otherwise it's not working. Now, can anybody guess how they fix this? Any takers? How they fixed it? Yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's what they did. They removed the feature, right? They removed the, the feature, they just removed this option from the, um, from the menu, right? They removed this option and that's it, right? So uh, that's how they fixed it, right? 
So yeah, so now let's talk about the, the most scary one. So man in the middle without warnings using invalid TLS certificates. Now this is something that in mobile security we always try because we are auditing the application, so we have to try in commercial applications, but it never works nowadays, right? So like years ago, this used to work sometimes, but nowadays, like most commercial applications are doing this correctly. And we were like really surprised about this, right? Like we try it again, okay, let's not get too excited. Let's like shut down the device, let's boot again, let's try again, let's confirm, right? So we like checked multiple times and this was actually the case, right? And you will see why in a second. So it lacked a correct TLS certificate validation, risking man in the middle attacks without warning. So a malicious attacker, now, so these are the, attack requ the attacker requirements, right? So the malicious attacker needs a valid domain on the internet, right, and from that, you get like your valid SSL from Let's Encrypt for free, right? So you only need to have like one domain on the internet and you need to uh, manipulate network communications, right? So public Wi-Fi without guest isolation, BGP hijacking, uh, ISP man in the middle, or even DNS rebinding, right? So DNS rebinding, you just basically sending a, a DNS response that is like has a very low TTL uh, and then you try to win the race to like send users to like your fake server, right? So especially DNS rebinding is really scary here because like you can actually man in the middle people without being in, in public Wi-Fi, right? So even from away. So with e either of these techniques, right? So any of these ways would work. Uh, you could uh, intercept uh, traffic without warnings between the leave home safe application uh, and the backend server, right? So. What could an attacker do with this? You could intercept the login to the Hong Kong health code system. You could gain access to the Hong Kong identity card and password of the user. You could obtain the personal one-time password provided by the Hong Kong Center for Health Protection. So basically, this is like, you can intercept both the login and the second factor, right? Like the OTP that the user will enter. Uh, and you could also uh, intercept the user reported COVID infections, right? So if someone is saying I'm infected by COVID, you could also intercept this without warnings. So, so yeah, this is like how to test for this type of stuff. Uh, a very uh, convenient way to do this if you are a pen tester is using Burp, right? So, um, so in this case, uh, I'll, I'll just show you how in a second, but basically you change the HTTP proxy settings on your Android device, so all traffic is sent to a test proxy server with the ability to create a trusted CA signed certificate. So basically, uh, the Android device, for example, trusts your uh, burp issued uh, certificate, right? And then the proxy server uh, was said to always use 70security.com certificates regardless of the inbound host header, right? So if you try to access google.com, it will give you a valid 70security.com user, which should be rejected because it's not valid for google.com or facebook.com or wherever you want to go, right? So this is the idea here, right? We are attacking the hostname verifier part of the SSL validation. So this simulates a malicious attacker able to supply a valid certificate for serverinsecure.com or uh, attacker.com to TLS clients, right? So this configuration is invalid, should result in security warnings for any TLS connection attempt, and warnings should occur for any host that is not uh, the valid one, right? Uh, so this is you know, the correct validation. So this is how to test it in Burp, right? So Burp has this tab of certificate, and then you have use, use self-signed certificate, which is one of the other tests that we did. In this case, this did not work. But another bad option is to generate a CA signed certificate with a specific host name, right? So this is the attacker requirement that I mentioned before to have some domain on the internet, right? Attacker.com, example.com, whatever, right? So here we're just using this domain. Uh, and then this, this will result in security warnings. So we can check this in the Android browser and open like some uh, page, right? So in this case, we're using the same page for the uh, Hong Kong government, right? So livehomesafe.gov.hq for Hong Kong. So you can do this with an, this ADB command and make the browser open this. And you can see here that Android is like showing you warnings, right? The Android browser is saying there are problems with the security certificate for this site uh, and so on, right? So this is like the behavior that we were expecting from the application, right? When we were testing this, right? Like this is like the correct uh, behavior. So now, now that we have like the adequate setup where the Android br browser is giving us warnings because like we are simulating this like man in the middle attack, right? and the Android browser is giving us warnings, let's see what the Leave Home Safe application does, right? So we used a randomly generated Hong Kong ID and a password of test password and so on. Uh, and then we hit the logging and we found like no warnings at all. 
We can intercept all the traffic. We can see like the Hong Kong ID, the password of the user. Um, we can also see the second factor, right? So there's like absolutely no, no warnings at any moment, right? So there's no user warnings. Uh, we have interception of the second factor uh, and so on, right? So, so yeah, and this is like for COVID uh, infection uh, reports, right? When you upload it, we could also like man in the middle that without warnings. And this is why it worked. Can anybody say what, what's the problem with this? What's the problem in this code? Is the hostname verifier part of the SSL validation, right? So hostname verifier, and it's overriding, right, the native Android behavior of the hostname verifier with this logic. What's the problem in this logic? Any takers? No takers? Give you a few more seconds. So this is basically saying, if the server I'm connecting to contains the string like these important servers where the Hong Kong people will enter the credentials, then skip the hostname verification. Right, so this is what this is doing, right? So the hostname verifier will return true, and this is like the default Android behavior, right? So if so it's basically saying, if the server I'm, I'm connecting to is this very important server where users enter, are going to enter the password, skip validation. And if not, then run the legit application, right? So they probably had this because uh, maybe like in their development environment, they were using like an invalid certificate or something. And maybe this is why this made it into production. Uh, I'm speculating, but that's what it looks like. Um, and yeah, and this is like a, a demo in YouTube about this. I don't think I have this one here, but yeah, I mean, you get the drift, right? So, so yeah, so to fix this, they should improve the TLS validation. Uh, and then this also like pinning could be considered, right? So you could also like pin the certificate of the Hong Kong server where the application is connecting to, and then you make sure like even companies like Trustwave or some governments like the Chinese government or any other government, right, that can issue like valid uh, certificates for a lot of domains on the internet, uh, that, they w that even them will not be able to man in the middle traffic, right? So th that is what pinning is for, right? So the always pinning cheat sheet explains that in more detail, but uh, that's kind of the idea. So now let's talk about the, the ugly, right? So this is the disclosure timeline. So. We did the initial disclosure on uh, June 24th, 2022, uh, attaching the full pen test report. We just got an automated uh, acknowledgement, but no, no like person actually answering, right? So just automated. Another reminder, right? A few days after, automated uh, acknowledgement. Another reminder, like, hey guys, this is going to to go public. This is the full report. Do you have any questions? Uh, Automated acknowledgement, right? So you can see here, like we were waiting like for uh, a month, pretty much. Um, and then uh, in here comes the public disclosure on June 20, uh, July 26th, right? So uh, more than a month later. Uh, and then two days after the public disclosure, right? So this was in a lot of like news outlets, right? The Pentest report and so on. And then two days later, the politician said, uh, so this is a quote, right? Uh, an official government response is issued, express deep regrets and strongly oppose the inaccurate report and unfair accusation. So then one day after this uh, politician bullshit, uh, we confirmed that um, the, the version released uh, was, so the last version released on, by uh, July 29th, was 22 days before the report was shared, strongly suggesting that nothing was fixed, right? And then uh, actually this day, like the day after this politician uh, bullshit, uh, we validated that uh, the, high, uh, the highest impact findings, right? So the two highs that I showed, the second factor bypass, uh, the critical man in the middle, like nothing had been fixed, right? So this was all like demoed and, and recorded uh, on YouTube. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the Hong Kong government reaction, right? So it's just uh, a desperate attempt to uh, to save faith, to save face, but uh, 
But the sad thing about this is like the journalists are not checking anything, right? So in the Pentest report, you have the evidence. So you could ask like a third party if you don't believe or understand the Pentest report, like, hey, can you download the apps and try these attacks and see if they actually work, right? Because like the evidence is there. There's like actual steps, you know, to try and stuff. Uh, and yeah, and they uh, just like put like quotes from the politicians there, like giving it the same weight as the Pentest report, you know, which is actual evidence, right? So in here we have, the Hong Kong government has slammed a report by an overseas cybersecurity firm as inaccurate after the company claimed the city's Leave Home Safe COVID-19 risk exposure app was vulnerable to data leaks and phishing attacks, right? So, so yeah. Uh, and then there's another one that's saying, like, inaccurate report, unfair allegation. Um, yeah, could expose, uh, there's, like, no security or privacy incidents. The report, the, um, the report is, like, inaccurate and unfair and things like this, right? Um, and yeah, and then this, there was even this, like with a twist, right? Like U.S. influence, right? Because like OTF sponsored the audit, right? And OTF is kind of in Washington, <laughs> so they, they said like U.S. influence operation undermines Hong Kong COVID efforts, right? So even like we're trying like to secure the app, we're trying to like give the report to the actual developers so that they fix it, right? Uh, they don't fix anything, and then they they even say like we are undermining the the COVID efforts, right? Uh, and yeah, and then they say like it was like irresponsible operation uh, and so on, and that the security flaws may, may cost local lives, right? So, so yeah. So in conclusion, a, pe a Pentest report is concrete evidence. Uh, more, most journalists clearly uh, do not understand uh, this and somehow consider uh, random politician statements to carry equal weight, which is uh, you know really incredible. And, and yeah, and this part, this pattern like underscores like a notable uh, deficiency in the realm of information security journalism, right? So I think uh, probably for most scientists, uh, also like really pissed off about journalists for similar uh, reasons, right? But it's it's difficult, right? Because normally the journalist doesn't know the science, and in this case, like the journalist doesn't know the security, so they have to write about it because they have a job to do, but they don't really understand what's going on. So they're just going to ask the Hong Kong government and so on. And actually, from all the media outlets, only one interviewed us, right? So all the rest, they didn't even like reach out to ask. Any, they just asked the uh, Hong Kong government uh, and so on, but they didn't ask us, right, for, for our take on it or anything, right? So yeah, so Appentis report is tangible, uh, concrete evidence that can be validated by any third party source, right, or a similar uh, authoritative uh, entity, right? So you can ask some you know, security expert somewhere and say, hey, can you validate this? Is this actually true, right? And they can download the app and test it the same way we did, right? The Pentest report has actual steps to replicate. So, so yeah, uh, if you are a journalist and don't understand Pentest reports, hire an independent third party able to download the app and verify the finding and then armed with the now double evidence, right? So the Pentest report plus the third party verification, you can call out the politician uh, bullshit, right? So yeah, so with that, uh, I think you, we have some time for questions, and I'll just leave this here with the guys like set up like some discount codes if anybody's interested in. Yeah, so uh, we will probably do another free Panthers contest this year, so you can like apply using the one last year, and, and we will check that. So if anybody watching this like recording is interested, we try to do like one free pen test a year, uh, so people can apply in there, and, uh, and yeah, and then you get like a pen test for free, you know, like no strings attached. Uh, we'll just do it as if it was a commercial project. Then this one is like a discount if you want actually to pay for a pen test, and this is for our training courses, right? So we have three training courses. There's also like a course uh, this weekend at DakotaCon, so there's also like that discount for that. And yeah, with that, are there any questions? Yeah, so uh, the disclosure was, at the beginning, we only sent the report to them, right? So it wasn't public, and we got like these automated uh, replies that I was talking about. Afterwards, when it actually went public, it went public in the OTF blog, plus a lot of media outlets were contacted, like the, the journalists like contacted with, a, hey, there's this public Pentest report, you can write about it, and then they wrote about the public Pentest report. But then, uh, as uh, journalists wrote, wrote about the Pentest report, I assume like they said, "Okay, let's ask the Hong Kong government to, you know, say something about it as well, right? To have like the other side chime in, right?" 
which I think is fair, but you should also like do the third party verification, which is what they didn't do, right? Uh, and yeah, and that's kind of how it happened, right? So uh, OTF blog post, it was also in our blog and also like on our, on our website, like Cyber Security Account Publications, in the early, the report was also probably anybody could download it, but this was after more than a month of every week telling them, hey guys, this is going to be public, do you need any help? And we only got like automated responses. It was Hong Kong based, uh, but it was kind of a free, uh, free outlet. It wasn't like uh, government uh, sponsored or uh, it was kind of, I, I forgot the name, so I'm sorry if you're watching this, <laughs> but uh, it was a very nice lady from a local newspaper in Hong Kong that was um, like something like along the lines of free Hong Kong press. Uh, I don't recall the exact name of the newspaper, but it was the only person that reached out. Yeah. Any other questions? No questions? Was your business negatively impacted by this? Mm. Might be like afraid of the problem after we get to the same No, well, the, the only thing is that I will not go to China, right? Because I have like a, this trajectory of uh, we are doing like this audits for. Uh, things like kind of related to the Chinese government and stuff, but other than that, we didn't notice any like positive or negative impact. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with how Android handles programs, but when you gave that demo about the, the malware that snuck its way in and you clicked on the legitimate yep. application, what was the actual mechanic? Is there like a branch statement or you, you mean this one? Yeah, so basically Android uh, and also iOS have this like task manager, right? So you open an application and then you background it and then you can click a button and it shows you the list of open apps, right? So this particular attack is called task hijacking. There's another variant of task hijacking that is called Stranghog 2.0, but it's basically the same thing, right? So what this attack is doing is it's messing with the Android task manager. So you have, uh, this is why this is medium, it's like the attack requirement is the user has to have like a Trojan, a backing Trojan or something installed, right? And then what the Trojan will do is it will mess with the Android task manager so it will put itself in the place of the legitimate app. And then what happens is the user opens the list of applications and sees the, in the task manager the legitimate app and taps on it. But then instead of opening the legitimate app, you're opening the attacker app, which can perfectly mimic the legitimate app without the user having like any clues to tell a difference, right? Like you can clone the login page exactly in the same way. The user has like no clues, like what's going on, right? And then this is why for banking Trojans, this is very popular because you can like fake the login page and then the user enters the username and password and you're sending it to the attacker, right? And even the attacker might even like show you that you're logged in or whatever, right? And yeah, and, and now the user like, has no way to tell what happened. And now the attacker has the credentials, and from there, it's over, right? So in this case, this could be used, for example, to capture the uh, Hong Kong health code system credentials, which is kind of, I think in the US, is called NHS, right? So let's say uh, you, you log into the health system in the US, right, with your username and password. So this is kind of the equivalent in Hong Kong. You try to log into the health system with your username and password, and uh, and you are really sending it to the attacker uh, server instead of the legitimate server, right? So, so yeah, this is, uh, this is how this attack works. Did I answer your question? Yeah? Well, users just install everything, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions? Um, I think we are done for time, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, you can like hijack me any, at any moment. So, <laughs> thank you.
Hey, everyone. Uh, so thank you for joining today, talking about building tomorrow's networks, FTTX, and Pawn in action, um, kind of underscored by $2 million, make a campus network that will last. Uh, so I'm Nathan Armour. I went to school here for my bachelor's and master's at DSU, um, and I currently serve as the director of IC infrastructure and operations and interim CISO for the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. And kind of this talk is, is first talking about the concept of fiber to the X, the technology that's pawn, an introduction to what the North Carolina School of Science and Math is, um, the benefits of fiber to the edge, and then the case study that's the Morganton campus, both as it's built now and into the future with SWAC and Joiner. Uh, so fiber to the X is a, is a concept in, its, in his mind, and it's really talking about where is fiber at. So I think one of the first phases of fiber deployment in interconnecting networks was um, to the air, fiber to the air, and fiber to the business. So uh, it, this is not super easy to read, but um, some of the first few concepts is fiber to the air, which is fiber to your cellular networks, fiber to the street, you know, where you have fiber at a street, from there you switch to something else. And from there we went to fiber to the premise, where maybe you have fiber into a building, you branch from there into several businesses, several organizations, Fiber to the business, where a business itself is getting fiber in as its ISP connection. And that's kind of the goal now in, in a business world, is you want fiber into your business. And most businesses, especially once you get into medium larger, are going to achieve that probably through multiple fiber connections. But kind of phase two within fiber deployment is fiber to the home. So that kind of starts with fiber to the node. Um, so that's fiber at the highest level of your, maybe of an area or development. Then you go maybe fiber to the street, where every street maybe has a fiber node that then gets over to coax. You go fiber to the curb, where it's fiber all the way maybe up to your curb or around your curb. And then finally, what we all wish we have at home, if you don't have it now, is fiber to the home. Uh, and so and just in general, as we're talking about this, there's a third phase, which is fiber to the edge. And that's talking, well, now we've got fiber to the home. We've got fiber to the business. Why aren't we just doing fiber all the way to the end point? So this, is, uh, this whole talk's just kind of around layer one, which is the best layer, even though I'm a network admin. Layer one is still my favorite layer. And so just as a quick refresher, on a legacy network or a traditional network inside of a singular building, because we're going to be centering on this fiber to the edge idea, you have MDFs or an MDF on the first floor, ground floor most commonly, that has fiber risers that connects to an IDF or an uh, intermediate distribution frame uh, on each floor. So MDF connects to everything above it, and that MDF might also act as an IDF for that floor. Um, and each IDF then uses most commonly CAT6 or CAT5e to then connect all the devices on that floor or within a 100 meter range into the switches onto that fiber backbone to the MDF, which then either connects to your campus network or to your ISP. Um, or whatever else you need it connected to. So fiber to the edge, we're looking at why do we need IDFs? Why can't we just have an MDF and everything runs to the MDF? Uh, and this is done through fiber and power due to the distances we can go. So most commonly with fiber to the edge, you can go up to 2,000 feet from your MDF. And then from there, you can transfer into uh, a zone and that zone can be as small as a single device, as a direct connection into a computer from the fiber with no transfer, um, or as big as a standard IDF normally is. Um, but it's all about pushing where that fiber ends and getting it as far as we possibly can. So to achieve this, there's a technology that's commonly used called passive optical networks. So the rest of it, uh, we're going to talk all about the ponds, or pond, because some people think I say all about the ponds. And if you're Minnesotan, that is a pond, not a lake. Um, so what are passive optical networks? So it's this idea of one-to-one -one versus one-to-many. Um, in a standard networking configuration, you're one-to-one. -one. You have one network jack that ties to one device. And pond kind of breaks that. It's a one-to-many. 
Um, so in the first introduction of Pawn, it was 1 to 64. So instead of having one connection go to one device, you're having one fiber SFP go to 64 switches, more or less. Now they're very small switches, but they are switches, or 64 endpoints. So when you're doing fiber to the home, which is kind of where Pawn was first used um, in a very large scale, instead of every house having its own, having, needing its own internet, connect, or not, sorry, physical connection, they can share. Now they do share bandwidth with the net, and how it achieves all of this over a single fiber, as the other part of Pawn is, is all one fiber to one device, so you're doing back and forth trafficking across splitting. So you need two different multiplexings. So you use wavelength div uh, division multiplexing for your back and forth. So commonly it's uh, down is I think 1440 and up is 1550 nan or millimeter waves. And then you use time division multiplexing to split your devices. Uh, so each uh, endpoint gets a certain amount of time to talk. So here you can kind of see the di diagram, and there's three comp core components of Pawn. Um, you have the OLT, the splitter, and or sorry, the OLT, the splitter, and the ONT. And this diagram kind of shows your OLT is your head end, your splitter is splitting out the fiber, and your ONT is the endpoint receiving. So these are the splitters. They're fairly common. Um, normally it's one blue cable in, it's not multi-mode, it's all single mode fiber. Pawn is almost always single mode fiber. Uh, and then in these cases they're all 1 to 32 splitters, um, so 32 out. You will also commonly see, um, like with this one down here in this corner, uh, in the bottom right corner, is there's actually two blue fibers, and this is for redundancy. So if you have a, a GBIC um, go out, or uh, actually if you're transferring between versions of Pawn, um, you can do that live sometimes, mattering on the exact uh, producer of that technology and what they allow you to do. Um, and so that's the passive optical, that, and this is also the passive part of the network. This takes no power, it takes five, light in, splits it 32 ways, that's all it does. So the head end, or the OLT, um, basically takes in a standard network connection. So on, on each of these, this is a four port and an eight port OLT. You have your standard network connections that you're gonna hook up to your core switches to provide inf connection to the rest of your infrastructure. And then you have your pawn ports. And those, each of those is then connected to a splitter. So if you have an eight port uh, OLT, you can do eight, you can support eight 32 splitters. Or uh, yeah, eight 32 splitters. So you're, you're talking a very large number of devices you support with a single 1U unit. Uh, and all of that's um, going to the ONTs, or sometimes called ONUs, and these are the receivers. So they receive the connection from the optical distribution network from the PON, and then outputs through whatever you want, Ethernet, coax, POTS. Uh, a lot of them are, are, there's a lot of technology being developed around um, mobile service, so instead of uh, using coaxial line to increase your cellular coverage in a building, you can instead use a pawn network to receive that and, and carry that, uh, basically a dedicated pawn network um, for cellular service. Here's just a second page of what a few more look like. So on this first page, these are more ISP ONTs. So this is maybe what you would, the top one's ubiquity, that, that's the ONT they produce with just a single ethernet jack. And then the bottom one is something from AliExpress that you could probably order uh, that has Wi-Fi and ethernet. And these are really built to go into a home. These are more meant for fiber to the edge. So these um, have four to eight ports. Uh, some have one, some have three, including one on the back because you've got to be special. Um, and then this one in the top right corner I, I'm going to draw your attention because it's kind of cool, and that is an in-wall ONT. So pull fiber all the way down the wall into your box, you terminate it there with power, and then you just slot this thing right in and you have a switch in your wall. Um, one other kind of as a last point on PON that, that gets into a fun little discussion is optical power budgets. Um, and that's because we're splitting light, so now we have to worry about the power of the light. 
Um, normally in networking, you have to worry if there's light or if there's not light. Now I'm going to give you if there's strong enough light or if there's too strong light. Um, so generally, we measure it in decibels. Your standard SFP that you would use for like a 10 kilometer SFP on single mode fiber is right around like three decibel, even after you've gone a distance. In PON, we're like negative 12 to negative 20 is our sweet range. Um, and as I've been working, I have had uh, warnings sent to me from my, uh, my, my vendor that was helping me deploy this, being like, hey, you're about to cook some ONTs because you're running at negative eight. Um, and, and that's one of the dangers is if you don't watch this, you can literally fry the optical sensors out of these um, devices because they're not designed to be run that closely. Uh, and so finally, just as a wrap up on PON, is there's a lot of versions of PON. The most common if you're doing fiber to the home is GPON, and the same for fiber to the edge. Um, and that's a one to 32 with two and a half down, one and a half up, or one and a quarter up. And that's shared between the entire split. So the one to 32 is all sharing that. An interesting trend that I want to point out as we look at 10 gig PON, 50 gig PON, and then symmetric 50 gig, is that our split rates are going way up. So if you actually look at gigabit PON versus 10 gig PON, um, you get about the same download, but your upload actually goes down per end devices, per ONTs. Um, and, and generally, that's indicative of how networks are used. We always, on a consumer end, use a lot more download than upload. Um, and then once you go to 50 gig, which I don't believe anyone is producing equipment for that now, right now, um, it's a 1 to 256. So why would you want to use this technology? Um, and I'm going to kind of go over that. And, but first, I'm going to give you an introduction to the school. North Car I work for the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. We are a residential high school um, founded in 1980. We were the one of the first science and math-based governor schools in the country. Uh, going to toot a little horn, we were rated the number one public high school in the, in the US um, in last year. And we have two campuses. So on that side, we have Durham. Uh, that is the campus that was founded in 1980. And it did its most recent network refre full refresh, ripped everything out, brand new fiber ring, brand new full in-building structure using a le the legacy traditional networking structure in 2016. And then on the right is uh, NCSM Morganton, which was opened in 2022. I joined the North Carolina School of Science and Math in 2021, and I got the dream job. I graduated straight from college, and I got to build an entire campus, um, which I, I, don't, I don't think anyone can dream more of when they're coming out. Like, You'd learn everything, put your hands in everything. I was the only IT person for eight months. That was not maybe as enjoyable. We finally just hired an AV person, so I don't have to do it with AV anymore. Um, but I basically get to, and then last year I was promoted to a position over both. So now I get to handle a traditional campus built in 2016, so it's still really new, all CAT 6A, all single mode fiber, and a full fi or in a fiber to the edge environment through the Morganton campus. And so some of the benefits we noticed from fiber to the edge in Morganton is telecom room density. Um, we have a six story residence hall that hosts uh, 160 dorm rooms, about 300 students, and this is the only telecom room. Um, and you can kind of see here, there's two racks. This is also one of our MDFs for our entire campus. So we have our servers, our firewalls, uh, core routing all in here. Um, but that bundle of fiber right there is the entire, entire building's networking infrastructure. Um, and it's really big because it's armored fiber. And so it's even bigger than normal fiber. Um, and basically, all of that terminates into these blocks in both power and fiber. It's always together, DC power and fiber. And that's the entire space. So here's my second floor telecom room. There's my fiber. That's all I use the room for. Um, so it's being used to store TVs right now. I don't really care. Um, and then the third and the fourth and the fifth are also just like that. They're being used as storage. Uh, so one of the big things is infrastructure reduction. Um, so we didn't see these exact numbers during the Morganton campus because our campus buildings are so small. A lot of these numbers are based on big campuses and big uh, buildings. So one is 70% linear, less linear feet. Instead of running 24 copper cables 
from my telecom on my fifth floor to the edge of the building, I run one single armored six by six, so six fiber, six copper, from the base of the building all the way to that area, and then have probably around 10 meters of copper. So now I've saved all that copper that I would have used otherwise. Within that, you can use less cable tray. You also eliminate a lot of telecom rooms, um, and your distance is, is a lot different. Um, and so the, one of the other fun things about, specifically the system we use, which is Corning, is power delivery. All of this is DC power. Um, so there's actually a uh, Section 8 housing that went up in, which is a low affordable housing in Seattle, that used this technology. And they not only used uh, this for their networking and, and as an ISP in the building, um, they also powered all their emergency lights in the entire building off of the Corning power supplies because it's all low voltage and it's all on backup power and generator already. And so they were just like, cool, we'll just throw all the emergency power on here. Um, and then finally, bandwidth. Um, so I just threw up, you know, these are roughly what the CAT cables can do right now. CAT 6A, you're looking at 10 gig, about 100 meters. Anything over 10 gig, you're getting almost to, to under, you're getting under 30 meter. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what the theoretical limit of fiber is. I don't think we found it. Uh, we keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And with that, we're going to keep pushing this. So one of the nice things is you've put fiber in, and now you can just enjoy the fiber. Um, we don't know exactly, this technology is so new on Fiber the Edge, how long the buildings are going to last and how long that infrastructure is in there. In our estimates we did in our case study, which is what we're going to jump into right now, we were really hoping for a 30 to 35 year life out of that network. Which uh, if you're not, it, it, this is kind of like a back area of networking of, of how long a network lasts. Um, and you, it, it's, it's surprising that a lot of them are like 15 to 20, maybe 25 years. If you, if you take real good care of it and you planned it correctly. But at that point, technology has changed so much that you don't really know if you're going to be able to support that. So kind of looking at the case study that was the Morganton campus, it was basically a greenfield campus. And there was four leg legacy buildings that existed, um, but they were completely gutted. And when I mean gutted, I mean there was nothing in there but brick and steel. Um, so they were basically new buildings. And one of the big things we're looking at, as I was just talking about, is total cost of ownership. So it's not only how much does it cost to install now, how much is it going to cost to maintain, how much is it going to cost to upgrade. So if we want to move to 10 gig, in a traditional infrastructure, we're going to basically have to look at either adding a 10 gig switch on, um, for Ethernet on every floor maybe, or every, area of the, uh, uh, every other area to support whatever infrastructure we're putting in that's going to need 10 gig or 2.5 gig or whatever we need. Um, and that's, a, that's an upgrade cost that you're going to have to take in there because you're going to have to put those, even if you only have a single device that is going to go in that area, maybe one access point, you need a full 2.5 gig switch if you're going to keep to your standards. And so with Pawn looking at upgrading, if we wanted to add 10 gig, but we only want to do that very targetedly. We could target Pacific ONTs that we're going to upgrade and just support those. So your, your cost of upgrade is much smaller because your footprint of what devices you need to upgrade are smaller. Um, and when we, when we did this whole thing, we found out that the legacy design over the total cost of ownership was going to be more expensive. Um, we had considered it in 2016 for Durham, but the technology just was not there. Uh, when we did this analysis, we said they have to have the same performance requirements out of the gate. Um, both, you know, at this total cost of ownership, you're looking at like uh, non-reoccurring engineering. So the cost, the cost to hire our structural cable engineer, the cost to hire the people to deploy it, um, and your total cost of ownership. And then also looking, once we were like, okay, from that perspective, it looks good. There's one other thing you have to do, and that's risks. Um, this is a technology. As kind of on here, we're an educational pioneer in this technology. There are not many other campuses that are doing this at a campus-wide um, look. And so there's a lot of risk of, is this going to blow up in three or four years, and we're going to be sitting here with a network we can't use and no one to help support it? And overall, that figured out, hey, we should do it. We should get her done. Um, so basically, there's three buildings that are GPON. There are three buildings that use what we call white box switches, which is a legacy network, 48 port networking switch. 
And there's three buildings that do that, Goodwin, The Barn, and Joiner. And we'll talk about Joiner later, but, but simply on Goodwin, and Joiner has the same problem. They're historic buildings, so they're 90, like 9% hard ceiling, all the way up to the maximum. There's no space. Um, and so when we did our cost analysis, it would have cost so much more to put fiber to the edge in those buildings because of those historic states um, that it just wasn't worth it. And so we just put traditional, and then the barn was just too small. There's a total of 20 network drops that are being used in that barn right now. Um, but one cool thing is we have a bunch of emergency phones, blue phones, if you've ever seen them, and all of those are actually operating off the pond network. So we don't have to worry about pulling an ethernet cable to them and then putting, in, putting all their program and entire switch in them. We just throw uh, uh, OAT in there. But we did make some compromises. One, we went armored cable for everything because we just weren't sure what was going to happen. And we wanted to make sure we had protected fiber that was going to last, um, especially in a, in a campus, a brand new campus that was being built. We went with really large zones. Once again, this was a fallback to whether or not the technology succeeded or failed. This is a zone box on our campus. This is actually one of the least dense zone boxes we have. And you could throw a, 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 a switch in there and power it over DC. You can do, do a DC to AC converter or directly power over DC with just a traditional networking switch. So we actually have the ability to fail back. Now, because of that, it's not really FTTE. It's more fiber to the zone. Um, and it also was more expensive. It was about 20 to 30% more expensive than if we had just gone full fiber to the edge due to those two things, the zone boxes, um, which are surprisingly expensive, and then the armored fiber. But the result is it worked. We've been running for two years with no significant problems. Of course, with any new product or any new vendor, as I'm sure you have all experienced, there are problems. Um, for some reason, all of our ONTs were limited to 100, gig or 100 meg on our access points. And it was actually our access points and a fun interaction between our Aruba access points and our ONTs were limiting everything to 100 meg. Um, we got that figured out. Essentially, it was there's a the way the rub, we were set the rubes up is they created a tunnel back to the controller, and it was treating that at the same level as DNS and DHCP, with a prioritized network controller, um, and that network controller is limited at 100 megs. So we just turned that off. Haven't had any problems since, but it's worked. Um, but looking at so that's the historic what we've built and what we're experiencing now. Now we can kind of look at the future. Uh, Joiner, as I kind of talked about earlier, I just bid this out. I just signed the contract three weeks ago to build this. Um, it came back, traditional network was 180,000. Fiber to the edge was 250,000, so a $70,000 difference. The, that number is a little deceiving because of the zone, we had to use zone boxes. So we had to buy those expensive boxes. We weren't doing armored fiber. Um, and then also, that does not include the cost savings we would have gotten from being able to rip all the emergency power, the installation costs, and the air conditioning out of the telecom rooms we wouldn't have used. The reality we came to is we weren't going to recoup a lot of costs on there because the GC, the general contract, had already been signed on the building. And so we were like, OK, right, we're just going to have to go traditional network. And that was a decision we made. We're doing it in our, in our other historic building, and we can live with it. Um, and then SWAC, which is a brand new building, um, going through the designs right now, we're hoping to go out to bid here in a few weeks. And it will be a full fiber to the edge design. Getting rid of that second telecom room, I think it's going to become a closet for our clinic. Um, it's a two-story building, and it'll, our, our, hope, our hope is to be under 250000 with cost savings. But some conclusions from this, this is all just a layer one alternative. Expandable, customizable, bandwidth network, all the stuff I covered. One of the things that I want to kind of hint here is this technology for it to be, um, you get your money back, is the bigger the better. Um, when they did, oh gosh, I'm going to, I want to say Resort World. Corning did Resort, Resort World in um, Vegas. They reduced 80% of their telecom rooms in there. They had these massive, massive, massive savings. Um, when you do a two-story building that may be big to us but is small when you're looking at a construction world, you don't see those savings. You're hoping they're even, if not a little bit heavier on the FTTE side, but you're banking on your total cost of ownership to bring that down. Um, but if you're looking at a big building, especially if it's repeatable, so it's like a hotel room or a hotel building where everything is the same and you can build 
you know, an ONT to support one room, an ONT to support two rooms, and rinse and repeat, it becomes very economical. Um, and also, preferably get all these decisions done before the architectural design is done. Um, that uh, ends up saving a lot of money. Because um, they, they now don't have to design these telecom rooms as they would have expected. They can redo entire spaces based on these spaces not existing. Um, so that's the, that is the networks of tomorrow, FTTX and PON. And I don't have a ton of, I think I'm right on my limit, but if there are any qu quick questions. Sounds good.
I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, uh, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. I just got a couple of uh, upfront topics I'd like to discuss as we lead into it. Um, uh, I just retired after a 30-year career in the Army last year. Uh, I was the Strategic Initiative Group Chief for uh, Lieutenant General Fogarty in the U.S. Army Cyber Command. And uh, I was fortunate enough to transition into a position as a Innovation Hub Director uh, in which we support U.S. Army Cyber Command uh, with uh, agile acquisition uh, capabilities so we can do B2B. And I'll talk about it as, as we go on in my talk. Uh, so, basically, my agenda, uh, I, I really want to talk up front about the changing nature and character of 21st century warfare. Um, and then I want to bleed that into industrial age acquisition, right? The current, current processes that the DOD uses to innovate and acquire capabilities. And I want to talk about this concept of the valley of death. Um, and that's going to uh, bridge into uh, final, my final portion of my talk, where I talk about Title 15 authorities and uh, what we do uh, from the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. So talking about the, uh, the changing nature and character of 21st century uh, conflict, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, the illustration up there, uh, I got that, of course, I had uh, ChatGPT4 produce that. Um, but very interesting is the fact that this illustration emphasized the intersection of uh, technological change, where we set at right now, uh, asymmetric and hybrid warfare, and information warfare, propaganda, internationalization, and proxy dynamics. Uh, it also has uh, inspirations of two regional conflicts that uh, we like to look at. The first being the second Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which occurred in 2020 over a course of a few months. And then the second being the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of tie into that. Um, but I've emboldened technology on here because uh, looking at uh, any sorts of paradigm shifts, and, and there could be a lot of debate, right? Uh, it's very polemic when we talk about the nature and characteristic of warfare. Uh, I think one thing that we can all observe, though, as a human instrument is the fact that uh, it, it, it's changed radically in some areas, particularly the information space and the cyberspace. And that's all a result of the technology. Uh, so that brings me to what the role of technology in the changing nature and characteristics of warfare. Uh, when we look at uh, things like technological advancements, uh, as already stated, asymmetric and hybrid warfare, information warfare, propaganda, and then getting into uh, the internationalization and proxy dynamics of it. A lot of that we can see now. Uh, and a lot of that could, uh, could be viewed as a result of uh, a little bit of breakdown within the global world order right now. Oh, forgive me. So when I look at this, when I talk about uh, technological advancements, uh, what we're seeing, I, I, John Antal, uh, retired colonel, uh, studied the second Nagorno-Karabakh war and came out with a, a pretty insightful paper on lessons learned, but basically his paper he titled, uh, it was the first war won primarily by unmanned aerial systems. Uh, a lot of what's bled over into the Ukraine conflict. Um, matter of fact, right after the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, within the, by, the, by the next fall, you saw the, uh, the Ukrainians actually using uh, TB2 Bayraktar drones and uh, using them effectively as a counterfire system. Uh, one thing I like to highlight on it, though, is not just the, uh, the kinetic effects that come off of these uh, unmanned aerial systems, because a lot of times they're, uh, it, it, it's, they're pretty innocuous, right? They don't cause a great deal of damage uh, physically, 
Uh, but the psychological effects, I think, are far more powerful when you take a full motion video feed and plaster it up on social media and your adversaries uh, can see uh, what is occurring on the battlefield. Uh, it leads to that, uh, you know, warfare is being a clash of wills. Um, it generally goes to degrading uh, an adversary's will to fight. And that's some of the effects that we have on the, on, on the modern battlefield, right? We also have these uh, asymmetric and hybrid, right? And I just like to bleed that in with like uh, talking about proxies, right? When uh, Russia went into the Ukraine originally in 2014, uh, I think we were calling it the, 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 you know, the men in the green suits, right? Were they really Russians? Yeah, we, we knew they were Russians. Um, uh, could we prove it? Or did we allow the Russians to have a uh, measure of deniable plausibility, right? So they could say, no, that's, that's not our guys. We actually knew it was them, right? And that bled into the larger war itself. Um, also, when we look at uh, information warfare and propaganda and how technology has changed all of that, um, it, it, has it really created something new? Uh, I'd argue not. Um, I've got a, a friend that I work with up at West Point, Dave Geo, that wrote a paper, you know, uh, uh, New Vodka from an Old Still, I think is the title of it, right? It's, uh, so uh, nothing's really changed, particularly when we look at Russian information warfare tactics. It's just the tools have made it so much more powerful. Uh, you know, you're talking about instantaneous, instantaneousness of information, the ubiquity of information. It's all there. It's everywhere all the time. Um, and how that has changed battlefields. And then when we start looking at uh, inter internationalization and proxy dynamics, uh, we're, we're seeing a, a, a really a big shift in the world where Iran's power has grown in the Middle East, uh, as we see... Uh, uh, the the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict that's occurring now, and uh, proxies uh, such as Iran being in there. Even going back to the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War, honestly, the war was between Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia, but you had the Russians backing the Armenians, and you had the uh, you had the Turks and the Israelis backing uh, the Azerbaijanis in that conflict. And really, we look at it uh, from an international perspective of, does this become a, uh, a proving ground, per se, for uh, uh, new tactics, techniques, and more importantly, technology? Um, and uh, I, I, I remember years ago uh, writing a keynote for General Fogarty in which I discussed uh, you know, a, a comparison between the second Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict and the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Um, and the U.S. studied that conflict very heavily, and out of that came the big five weapons platforms, like the Abrams tanks, the Bradley fighting vehicle. Um, so the importance of studying re regional conflicts, but now the, the, the dynamics have changed, right? The U.S. came out, we came out of a 20-year-long counterinsurgency war. Um, uh, just like uh, Yom Kippur, the U.S. was coming off of a 10-year campaign, uh, which was primarily counterinsurgency focused in Vietnam. Um, so there was a lot of uh, parallels there uh, of what was going on. But uh, when we look at that from a technology and capabilities perspective, um, the differences are technologies and capabilities are, are, are being created at a far more rapid rate. Which leads me to this, uh, you know, as the sun rises each morning, it seems to illuminate a new, in a, uh, new invention, a novel application of AI, uh, groundbreaking advancements in biotechnology. Uh, the digital realm, once a mere adjunct of the physical, was burgeoned into an expansive universe. Uh, replete with virtual realities, challenges uh, of our notions, about presence and experience. Uh, currently, the DOD's industrial age acquisition process, it just can't compete uh, for the space we're in. And uh, we're just, uh, at the Pacific, we're one 
part of that uh, larger Army picture, larger DOD picture, where we happen to focus on uh, the information space and cyberspace operations. But uh, the Department of Defense acquisition system is a complex framework that's designed to manage and procure weapon systems, supplies, and services that are essential for the nation's defense. The system aims to deliver state-of-the-art technology and capabilities to military forces and do it efficiently and effectively. Uh, despite its critical importance, the acquisition process faces numerous problems, challenges, and impediments that can affect its performance. Bottom line, a lot of times when it comes to capability development, uh, we're looking at uh, years, not months. We're looking at millions of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to get capabilities produced. Um, you have a complex bureaucracy, budgetary constraints and cost overruns, uh, you know, technological risks and the pace of innovation. We just can't keep up. I mean, even if we looked at Moore's Law uh, going every 18 months, I would say uh, technologically it's spinning faster than that. Um, I don't have any hard proof on that or anything that's uh, uh, quantitative on there, but that's, that's the speed that it's, uh, that it's, it's moving at. Uh, and that affects everything. Everything is connected because then we're looking at now we have workforce challenges, which, is, uh, which makes me happy coming up to a great university like Dakota State uh, to see that uh, the state of South Dakota is very serious about developing the workforce of the future that we need uh, in order to compete in this space, particularly from a national security perspective. Um, we're also running into challenges with inter uh, interoperability and standardization. I know I've spoke with a gentleman that spent some time in the Army, on the Army's networks, has worked as a DOD contractor. Uh, the Army's network, which is probably one of the larger networks in the world, right? our network covers 288 bases, posts, camps, and stations globally. Uh, we have approximately 1.1 million end users uh, on any given day. Of course, the network is dynamic. It grows and it shrinks. Um, but what I like to say is we're like running a Ferrari on an uh, unpaved, unimproved road, right? We're trying to run very fast uh, capabilities across a network, you know, through no fault of its own. Uh, it's something that evolved over time. So if we look over the period of the last 30 years, it's not a single network. It's a, a bunch of ad hoc networks that, were, uh, that are pretty much put together. And as anybody that uh, does networking and network infrastructure knows, it's very expensive uh, to upgrade, maintain, and sustain those systems. So uh, as we go forward into the, into the future, uh, particularly when we do prototyping and we do things, uh, uh, capability builds for Army Cyber Command, uh, a big part of that is, uh, is uh, interoperability and standardization. Uh, we also look for uh, technologically agnostic systems, right? So we don't have to worry about uh, an application, particularly with software running across uh, uh, a particular operating system, whether it be Linux or Microsoft. Uh, another big thing is, is uh, the, we are a global force, so we need to be able to project globally uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, the security of our supply chain is heavily dependent upon that. Um, and right now, uh, I think I've, I heard some other talks where we, we, we're starting to look at uh, in, uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure, particularly critical information infrastructure. Uh, domestically, not, no, not less globally, uh, it is a huge challenge uh, of, the, of the space that we're operating in. Which leads me to the valley of death, right? Uh, a lot of people in the DOD will laugh about this because these are, uh, these are some of the challenges. Uh, again, a really super cool chat GPT-4 uh, uh, illustration that he created uh, where you look at, down in the valley and you see the wreckage. Um, I like to think that we deal with this every day, right? We, uh, uh, we, 
good ideas go to die in the valley, right? Um, but it's a metaphorical concept. And uh, it's frequently mentioned in the context of the DOD's innovation process, right? It is a problem. Funding gaps, bureaucratic hurdles, uh, I like to say lock, lack of focus. So we get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, shiny object chasing uh, where you have the flavor of the week. This is so important this week and then the following week. And, and a lot of times it's for capability bills that could take years to really fully develop, right? So lack of priorities. Um, scalability and integration challenges. Um, so uh, building a, a, a prototype and then being able to take that prototype to production is a big, big challenge. Um, and then last not, but not least is risk aversion. Um, we have, I feel in the DOD, and this is just my own personal opinion, I'll get beat up for it later if it gets out, but uh, uh, we have uh, folks in positions of technical leadership that aren't really trained and certified and qualified to be technical leaders. I've got a green suitor down here actually shaking his head up and down. Um, that creates a problem, particularly in the risk space. Because if you don't understand something, you're going to be less willing to commit to it. Um, um, so those are, those are big challenges. And those are challenges that right now in the DOD we can't afford to have from a national security perspective. Um, particularly when we're trying to keep up with the pace. And we're trying to, uh, we're trying to work in, a, in an industrial age bureaucracy to get things done in the information age. And that's why coming up here that I wanted to have the ability uh, to talk about uh, the organization that uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be the director of. Uh, I've only been, I'm going on my first year in there and uh, very proud of the work w that we do uh, because uh, we are a solution to this challenge is what we are. And uh, so given that, I like, to, I like to talk a little bit about it. So that's where I get into this, how do, we, how, do we, uh, how do we bridge this gap, right? We have accelerated acquisition programs. So at the CIFIC, and I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later on, we work under what's called Title 15 authorities, uh, other transactional authorities. Uh, that allows us and enables us to uh, provide non-federal acquisition regulation uh, remedies to capability build. Uh, it allows us to establish uh, pro uh, public-private partnerships with industry. Uh, we can do business to business on behalf of U.S. Army Cyber Command, and we actually do the contracting for uh, prototype build when we get to that. Um, it's also a flexible funding mechanism. I can do things, my organization can do things very, very rapidly uh, for the Army. Uh, and as I'll get into here shortly, um, but not just bringing an industry in to do specific demonstrations and pilots, but actually going into prototyping as well. So that brings me to the, uh, to the CIFIC, the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center. Um, our parent organization is Defense Works. So if I got some DOD minded folks out there, green suitors, uh, most folks are familiar with Softworks, which is one of our innovation hubs down in uh, Tampa that supports U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, that is our sister hub. So the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center uh, is the, uh, the Army Cyber Command's uh, version of Softworks. So I'd like to talk about a little bit about where we're located. Uh, so. U.S. Army Cyber Command stood up approximately 2012. Uh, no infrastructure, no personnel, no money, and no capabilities, right? They built them all up in the uh, uh, Fort Belvoir, Fort Meade area. And uh, from about 2012 to 2020, uh, all the infrastructure for U.S. Army Cyber Command was being built down on what was called Fort Gordon, which is now Fort Eisenhower, uh, in Fortitude Hall. 
In preparation for that, the state of the state of Georgia had uh, set aside approximately two hundred million dollars to build a uh, uh, a cyber innovation and training facility campus down in Augusta, Georgia. So we reside right on uh, the beautiful Savannah River. Um, I like to say we're we're one of twenty two partners in uh, the two buildings. If you look at the illustration up there, the building to the left, uh, that's our building, uh, the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center. We own the entire fifth floor of that facility. Uh, I've got about 33,000 square foot up on, on that fifth floor. Approximately 16,500 feet of it is, uh, is uh, TS skiff space and collateral space. The other 16,500 is uh, innovation and collaboration space. But we have great partners in there. The building is managed and administered by Augusta University. And we're also co-located with Augusta's School of Computer and Cyber Sciences. So we do a lot of work with them. Um, I'm also an affiliated faculty member with the School of Computer and Cyber Sciences. Um, so that gen generally means I work for free for them. <laughs> but, uh, other things that are important in there, though, is we have our industry partners. Uh, we've got uh, everybody from uh, Booz Allen, Hamilton, and Lidos uh, to Periton and Parsons in our building. Uh, we have other great organizations like the Georgia Bureau of Investigations in there. So there's a lot of uh, collaboration. You can see where you can go with like things like digital forensics and such. Um, and then on the fifth floor where we're located at, uh, we, we also share the space with our Army Cyber Command partners, uh, which have put up a, a DOD designated lab up there uh, in the space. And um, we're able to do some pretty cool things in there. We've got a great research network going on. Uh, we were able to build that uh, at no cost uh, based off of the, the Army's old ITAS program going away. So Enterprise IT as a Service went away. They had about $10 million of equipment on, uh, on Fort Eisenhower. We were able to procure that and repurpose it for our research network. Um, so the Army Lab, as we build it, we're still building and maturing uh, everything. We have a great deal of capability. I'll talk a little bit uh, about the research network as I close out. Okay, so uh, how do we do what we do? Uh, as I stated earlier, we're under Title 15 authorities. Uh, those are congressionally mandated authorities uh, across uh, all federal government, state government, and local government agencies are able to uh, utilize those authorities uh, for innovation. And, uh, uh, you know, in a little bit of my historical reading, you guys got to forgive me too, because I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, I'm not an acquisition guy by trade. I'm a, I'm a uh, computer science guy, technology guy. But uh, uh, under that, uh, you know, in my reading, it all started in 1958 with Nassau is when uh, Title 15 was developed, and uh, that was because if we wanted to put a man on the moon within 10 years. Uh, they weren't able to work in the in the in the uh, the far based acquisition system. They had to be able to do alternative things. Um, so the CIFIC was formed by our parent company and our cyber agreeing to uh, create us, and we work off of what's called an OTA, another transactional authority. Um, that's uh, we 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 renew the agreement every year, okay, and the money on it's paid forward. But uh, generally, we're operating off of about a 1.5 million a year uh, RDT&E funded uh, projecting line. Um, our Big Ten philosophy, as you, if you look up there, we look to partner. We look, we partner with other DoD uh, agencies, uh, inner agencies. Uh, but our big thing is industry partners, and I like to say this: if uh, you know, folks in the army, the DoD. Uh, you know, they can't do things as well or better than industry can do, particularly in the technological space. And we would just be fooling ourselves to think that uh, uh, we have the resources, uh, times, time and ability to create the capabilities that we need. Um, so our industry partners are really, really big. 
We're also tied in with other uh, federally funded research and development centers. Uh, and we have a lot of academic partners in here. And I'm going to talk about uh, Defense Works writ large and why I like to talk about them uh, coming up next. But then I'm going to talk about our process, uh, so the how we do what we do. So at, uh, at the CIFIC, uh, our mission is really uh, to maintain a platform in which we're able to accelerate the, devel the development of capabilities for the Army rapidly. Um, we also uh, uh, enable experimentation and exploration within the technological space. So this is where I like to talk about the Defense Works uh, family of innovation hubs. Uh, we are one of 10 in the family. Uh, nine of the 10 operate under Title 15 authorities. Okay. One of them, uh, we were just down there yesterday, Landworks down in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, they are our first uh, uh, non-Title 15 innovation hub that deals uh, solely with agricultural innovation, okay? And uh, they've done some really cool projects. And if you don't think cyber bleeds into everything, it's when you have all these innovation hubs that you realize cyber bleeds across a lot. Um, some, of the, uh, some of our hubs I like to highlight, they, we range across uh, the DOD and the government. So we've got, uh, we've got hubs with the, the Army Corps of Engineers, that's Erdic Works down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, they partner with the uh, Engineering Research and Development Center, which sits on top of uh, seven national labs. We have, uh, we have a hub with the Department of Homeland Security, HS Works. We also have hubs with CIA Labs and IC Works, uh, two with the Navy and Nautilus and Fleet Works, and then we have a hub with the Department of Energy uh, called Energy Works. Um, our parent headquarters resides in Niceville, Florida, and uh, uh, I think Landworks, uh, Landworks, and then we have NPS Works, which is just coming online now out, out at Monterey, California. Um, all of our hubs, uh, so we like to pride ourselves, our ecosystem is our engine for being able to do what we do. Um, currently with the CIFIC, I have about uh, 2,000 uh, industry, academic, and, and DOD partners in our in our uh, our ecosystem, um, but we're connected to all other nine hubs ecosystems as well. And Defense Works currently has 120,000 plus uh, industry, academic, and uh, and government partners in their ecosystem, and this is all uh, centered around and focused on innovation. Um, but the important things uh, that, that, that occur as a reason of the, uh, the innovation uh, ecosystem set up the way it is um, has to do with our process, our innovation process, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, first, I want to talk about who our customers are uh, for the Cyber Fusion Innovation Center. We partner with U.S. Army Cyber Command. U.S. Army Cyber Command, uh, if you don't know it, the U.S. Army Cyber Commander, she wears two hats, right? So she's in command of uh, uh, Army Cyber Command for, you know, uh, man training and equipping the cyber forces for the Army. But she's also the what's called the Joint Force Headquarters Cyber Commander. So she's a, a, a Joint Headquarters Commander that falls up underneath U.S. Cyber Command. Um, and as, like I say, over in, over in uh, Fortitude Hall on Fort Eisenhower, uh, Fortitude Hall, we consider it an operational command. Uh, the operators over there are in the cyber fight 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and then as we look, we're co-located with the NSA. That's a result of the Joint Force Headquarters. So we share one campus uh, on Fort Eisenhower with them. And then uh, we have the subordinate commands that we partner with as well. Um, and uh, all of them are focused really on uh, U.S. Army Cyber Command's mission, which is operate, defend, attack, influence, and inform, right, across the network. So it's more than just uh, 
defensive cyberspace operations and offensive cyberspace operations. We also uh, work within the, uh, the intelligence uh, aspects of things. Uh, and when we look at intelligence in this space, it's really niche. Uh, uh, dealing with not just the traditional intelligence, but uh, you know, publicly available information and commercially procured data. Uh, I heard a gentleman over there talking about, you know, six to ten gigabyte ingests uh, a minute. Uh, we have problems and challenge sets where we're looking at over a hundred gigabytes per minute ingest, and we're dealing with petabytes worth of data uh, at Army Cyber Command. And then we have our partners. Uh, as you, uh, we got uh, Augusta University, uh, the Georgia Cyber Center, which is the facility we're located at, and then uh, we have other academic partners. Uh, right now, uh, Dakota State University is an academic uh, partner with uh, U.S. Army Cyber Command as well. So when I put it up here, how does this all this work? What we do? How do we harness our Title 15 authorities to very rapidly produce capabilities. If you guys look at the, uh, if you look at the linear diagram on the bottom where the start box is, um, what we're able to do is we're able to uh, do a three three phase process. The first one being the collaboration event. So the Army brings us a challenge, and I just want to highlight here: our challenges are not coming top down driven. I mean, the leadership of the Army aren't pushing it. These challenges come from the operators over on Fortitude Hall. So they're from the soil up uh, saying, hey, I've got this capability gap that we need. Um, and then through the collaboration event, I'm allowed to, I'm able to leverage our uh, industry, academic and industry uh, and uh, government partners to come in and help the Army, uh, m most importantly, refine requirements. Uh, talk to them about what is f feasible and plausible technologically, and then propose solutions uh, to, the, to the challenge of which the Army can look at. And then we, we, we generally drive the train where we get, a, we get a request for a proposal out within 14 days. We allow industry 30 days to answer uh, via white paper, and then uh, uh, the Army, the big thing here, too, to remember is we're, we're a neutral facilitator, right? So I don't, I don't read white papers. I don't assess white papers. I always got to tell the industry folks this. The Army does that. We just facilitate the process. But when the Army makes a down select for a prototype build, uh, generally the period of performance on that, the, or the pop, as we like to say, is six months. Six months to produce a fully tested and evaluated prototype. So really, we go from ideation to prototype uh, contract and build in four to six months. And then we generally aim to have a fully tested and evaluated prototype in nine to 12 months. And uh, all of our prototyping projects cost $500,000 or less. So that may seem like a lot of money to you and I personally, but in the DOD world, that's uh, it's kind of like peanuts, right? Uh, and we're able, I'm going to talk about one of my projects here that we, the current one that we're building. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty incredible how this process works and enables, and enables us to get uh, very sophisticated capabilities built uh, in such short a period of time at such a low cost. So these were our successful projects from uh, last year. Um, we were able, the CIFIC was able to, uh, to leverage industry academic and, and other government partners to get the production of a cross-domain solution, what we call a diode, uh, that is currently in operation over in uh, uh, the regional cyber center of Europe. And what a diode is, it just does exactly what it's supposed to do, one-way traffic. Um, we were able, also able to get after the Army's, uh, some of our data challenges, particularly in the influence space, uh, by uh, bringing in and uh, getting customizable uh, data uh, that was specific to what the operators needed. Um, and the neat thing about this project was we were able to sit down with a uh, tool developer, uh, and uh, tool developers, the data scientist, and 
uh, the IO PSYOPs operators, and they were able to right on the fly build customizable tools with customizable data for uh, specific regions within the world. Uh, and then the last one I want to talk about is uh, the ongoing uh, prototype build right now uh, for an artificial intelligence driven continuous monitoring system. Um, not a trivial problem by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we started this effort in June. We were able to go to contract. Uh, we we, we kind of took it easy on booze and went to contract in January, but we could have went to contract in December on it. And right now it's, built, it's being built. Um, this system here really looks to reach out and, uh, and not just identify threats to the Army's network all the way down to the endpoint, uh, not just looking for the known knowns that are out there, so all the CVs that we already know about, uh, but looking at uh, known unknowns. So we know they're out there, we just don't have all the specifics on it. But also do uh, anomaly detection for unknown unknowns. And this is an incredible capability that's being built uh, right now, uh, Army Cyber Command is the, uh, the only entity in the DOD right now that uh, is working on the capability of this magnitude. Uh, the president came out with an executive order at the beginning of December, uh, and he uh, pretty much ordered Department of Homeland Security and the DOD to have an AI-driven uh, defensive cyberspace capability uh, being worked on. It just so happened that we were getting ready to go on contract with this one, and it looks like uh, U.S. Cyber Command came down and looked at it. And uh, I think this is going to be our nominee for that uh, to, to answer the mail on that executive order. Uh, the other cool thing is, is that research network I told you about that was being built where we're at, uh, this, is, this is being uh, tested and evaluated by the Army on that network. So it's right in our space. And uh, the beauty of being at the Georgia Cyber Center is uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, who won the contract, is co-located right with us. They're just down two floors. Uh, so their engine engineers and scientists are able to come up and, uh, and help us with it. Um, so uh, I like to close out with uh, when we go all the way back to the Valley of Death and uh, we look at uh, modern conflict the way it is, the, the, the changing nature and characteristics of it, characteristics of it. Uh, you know, we all like to say this to our partners, why choose CIFIC, right? Because uh, our process not only allows us to uh, find a solution, it allows us to find the best solutions. Um, we're flexible. Uh, so we're non-federal acquisition regulations. What that means, we're allowed to we're allowed to enact the best in businesses business practices from the uh, from the civilian and private sector. Um, we allow flexibility through contracting. We're able to do things very quickly. We had to put new doors on the skiff. Uh, we had uh, they were all customizable too. And if anybody that's ever worked in the bureaucracy knows. Uh, would have took the Army probably a year, year and a half to get that stuff built. I got some heads shaking out there. We were able to do it in three months, okay? So we, we have that capability. Um, one other thing I like to talk about is when we build a prototype, if that prototype uh, does not answer the mail for the Army, right, or it's just uh, the technology's not mature enough, uh, it allows the Army to fail fast. So the Army can just say, no, I don't want to move this to production. Um, and look, we didn't waste a lot of time, we didn't waste a lot of money, and we also gained knowledge off of. Uh, I, I told my seniors, man, I don't look at, uh, you know, as, you know, because we failed fast as a failure. It's actually a success because we gain knowledge uh, about what doesn't work and how we should approach the problem uh, uh, differently in the future. Uh, the other thing is, is, this really allows quick wins for the warfighter, okay? When, when, when it comes off a contract for us as a prototype and it moves into production, that's where it moves into the, uh, the traditional FAR-based acquisition system. Uh, that warfighter down there in Fortitude Hall, they're already using the capability, 
Okay, it just has to move over to a major program or record, but the capability is already there. It's been built, tested, evaluated, and it's with the operators. So we, it allows us to have these quick wins. Um, the other thing is, is I like, to, I like to harp on, as I know, I don't want to talk up uh, Q&A time, right? Um, uh, the other thing is it, uh, requirements. Requirements are a huge challenge. Um, and, and, and not just the Army, there's a lot of organizations that, uh, that balk at requirements. And that's where I get into, you know, top down, top down driven capabilities versus bottom up. Uh, when I was on active duty, I, I like to call it conix fodder. You know, over in Iraq as a commander, uh, you know, I get a bunch of rapid capabilities pushed our way. Uh, number one, the capabilities aren't intuitive. So, you know, Joe down on the line can't understand how to get the thing up, running and operational. It just takes too much time. Or it's not interoperable with the rest of our system. So we end up, generally ended up, you know, taking probably millions of dollars worth of equipment, stuffing it in a Connex. We only pulled it out to inventory and throw it back in again, right? Um, and th that's a, just a huge waste to the American taxpayer in my mind. Um, our process really helps with requirements because uh, not only are we leveraging industry, academia, and uh, other government partners to help tell us what's feasible and plausible, but we also have those operators that put in the capabilities needs request to begin with right there saying what type of tool they want and the functionality they want with it, right? So it's an intuitive. And then it's almost a given with my industry partners that Capabilities need to be technology agnostic, meaning they need to be able to uh, capable of operating on any hardware uh, and interacting with any uh, operating system that, that that that's out there on the market. Because I guarantee the Army's using it. That includes legacy systems too. You'd be a, you'd be amazed at the number of legacy systems that are running out on the network simply because they're just too critical and they don't have a plate replacement uh, process yet. Um, to, to swap that stuff out. So with that, this is our ecosystem. If you look at the QR code up top, uh, we are always looking for uh, uh, government, academic, and industry partners. Uh, if, you, if you go up there, it takes you out there to join our ecosystem. Um, when we do collaboration events, that's where it's, uh, you know, uh, unless we specify government only, it's, it, it's, uh, it's all hands are invited. The more minds, the better. Um, right now, cyberspace is a whole of society problem. Um, so it's not just a whole of government or whole of DOD, it's the whole of society. So we need all the best and the brightest minds. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna close out and uh, uh, open it up for a Q&A if anybody has any questions. Sir. No, honestly, uh, it, it, and, that's, and that's a great question, right? Because one of the things I did not mention is we are zero barrier to entry, right? Because when you want to participate in our prototyping process, I don't care if you're the guy in your garage or the gal in your garage wrenching on networking stuff, writing code or whatever, or a, a small startup or a maturing company or even the bigs. Uh, there's no barrier to entry to uh, to participating in our process, uh, with the exception you need to be an American company, right, and American citizenship. Um, outside of that, though, there's nothing. But when it comes to actually uh, any sort of uh, technical or resource support, we don't provide any of that. You're, 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 you're on your own, right? Um, um, but uh, the challenge is, and, it's, and, and I'm not going to lie, it is a very competitive space. Uh, it's a very competitive space, but we've had a number of small companies, uh, like I showed that data of a service. Uh, they, we had smalls that won the contract on that. Um, and the Army was really paying a lot of money uh, to pay for 
licensing from a large company that wasn't customizable, wasn't tailorable. It was just a one size fit all. And that company was selling licenses, not just to Army Cyber Command, but they were selling it to uh, U.S. Army Europe, U.S. Army Pacific. Uh, and the Army got together and said, why are, we, why are we buying multiple licenses? We should buy one license for the Army. So that was kind of the catalyst for that. But we had a small company uh, come in and actually win the contract on that and actually did a great job on it. I hope that answered that answer your question. Yeah. Anybody else with any questions? No, no other questions? Okay, well, I guess I'll close out. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.
everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Fusing Esports and Cyber. And um, I'm sorry, Fusing Esports and Cyber on a global level. My name is Jessica Gulick. I'm CEO and founder of Cat's Eye, also known in the community as Play Cyber, and the commissioner of the US Cyber Team. A little bit about myself before we get started is uh, I started in cybersecurity well over 20 years ago. I've done everything from certification and accreditation to managing uh, large teams with, while I was at SAIC to um, contributing to some national standards in terms of security categorization, security with life cycle, and security program management. Over my career in cybersecurity, I've had the honor and privilege of being part of a number of cybersecurity games. Um, to start off with, probably around over 10 years ago, uh, where I first was exposed to the power of cyber games, which was at the pilot for Cyber Patriot, the high school competition that many of you might know about. And um, it was very fascinating to me, little story watching them run the program, is that during the morning of the pilot, they did a survey to the students there on what those students were considering going for their bachelors. Majority of students said no. By the afternoon, they did it again majority of the students said yes. That's the power of cybersecurity games. Fast forward to um, when I was part of a group that led the Maryland Cyber Challenge, I got to see how cyber games affected an entire community. You see a small group of uh, individuals, professionals, wanted to build something called Cyber Maryland. And to do so, there was a number of initiatives, but one of them was a cyber competition. Getting the first cyber competition up in Maryland was an ordeal. <laughs> and it wasn't the kind of ordeal today's CTFs um, typically face. We had so many calls coming from the high schools. What do you mean you're gonna teach hacking? What, what is all this? We don't have the clubs to do this. Most of the clubs had maybe eight to 10 boys in them. Fast forward to year three of the Maryland cyber competition. Most of the schools had two to three cyber clubs of which over 80 students each. That's the power in one state alone where cyber competition can build an ecosystem of people that even if they don't go for cybersecurity careers, which many of them did, the fact of the matter is they got exposed to it in high school. So they take it with them wherever they go in their careers. And it's pretty, pretty exciting. Now, if you think back to back then, I remember um, I was having a conversation with a, uh, a parent. I was extremely exhausted. It was the end of the day for the Maryland Cyber Challenge. So you can imagine I'm sitting there on the cocktail table. My shoes are off. The heels are gone, right? And this guy comes up to me, sits down. Mind if I sit here? No, not at all. He goes, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe they have this. I'm like, really? That's interesting. Did not introduce myself because I was tired and off the clock. Um, and I'm like, what do you like about it? Because you don't understand. He goes, a few months ago, I really thought I had hit rock bottom with my son. I couldn't get him to think about a career. I couldn't get him to think about college. I couldn't even get him off of his DS. Remember the DSs? They were always in the screens of the kids. I couldn't get him to connect with me. Then it got worse. He disappeared. Found a group of guys, started hanging out, never came home. It wasn't until two weeks ago he came to me and said, hey, Dad, can you take me to the Baltimore Convention Center? See, I've been spending the last few weeks with this group of guys. He's like, yeah. He goes, we made it to the finals. And I think I have an opportunity and a scholarship. Thank you, NSA. He said he was floored, absolutely floored. In that amount of time, his kid had learned what, they, what he needed to learn, had applied himself, because you know it wasn't easy. So it had been hours. And had made it to the finals. He's like, this is amazing. So fast forward in my career, I've done a few more things since cyber competitions. That was, well, that was back in like 2009, I believe. Um, and uh, since then, I've gone on and uh, helped create communities such as the SOAR community. Had to prove automation was for the good, right? Not just for bad. And uh, got an opportunity to spin out my own company, Cat's Eye. And so I'm thinking, Cat's Eye, what are we going to do? We'll just do marketing for cyber firms. And a pandemic hit. And some mentors said, hey, Jess, nothing's going on. What are you going to do? Thus, the birth of Play Cyber. And uh, we're on a mission now to create cyber 
as an eSport. What I'm not talking to you today about is another cyber competition. We have a lot of those. Dakota State has a lot of those, and they're very good. But what we're talking about is cyber eSports, which is taking it in a slightly different direction. But it is still very similar. So Nelson Mandela once said that sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to unite in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. Another reason why we need esports for cyber. We need diversification. Esports helps to unlock that diversification. So let's talk about esports. Many of you in the audience might be thinking, cyber esports. We don't have the visuals, which is not as much fun. We don't need the visuals, really. If I put a fun visual in front of you of some kind of toy that's representing a server, would it really excite the cybersecurity audience? We like code. We speak code. It's OK to not have the visuals. The powerful thing about esports, it's organized. It's multiplayer, it's competitive, and there's a spectator experience. That's the difference between CTF, capture the flag, typical games, and esports. We'll get there, we're just starting out. But here, let's unlock this for a second. Competitive gaming, what does that really mean? Well, that means that it's us versus them. That sounds like our world, if you ask me. Um, and it's highly competitive. We, are, we want to win. Again, our world, right? In cybersecurity, we want to win. So if we can embody that into a sport, play that internationally on a global level, this gets pretty exciting. Spectator experience. Okay, admittedly, we've got a long way to go. <laughs> but we're getting there. Because the part about spectator experience, again, it depends on your audience, and our audience likes code. The second part of this is, why do we care? Well, because not only do we want to know how he or she did it, want to see the actual hack, want to see the defense, because we can learn from watching, our parents want to see what cybersecurity is. Our neighbors, cybersecurity is this word. They have no idea. They know they're scared that they're going to lose their identity online. They have no idea what an anatomy of an attack looks like. They don't know what the indicators look like. It's kind of interesting. So it brings it to what I call the kitchen table. It helps us unlock conversations with our neighbors and our family members that we haven't had before. So you'll see a lot in our games what we do is we talk about what's a red team, what's a blue team, what's a purple team. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one kind of talking over the game. But then you can still see the game and see how are they actually approaching that attack. So the power of games and uh, cyber games in general, and I love this, and I totally stole it. I haven't found that it's trademarked yet, but I totally stole it from an eSport group. The power of games is it allows us to play to learn and learn to play. So if we teach our middle schoolers how to play CTF, red versus blue, bug bounties, you name the type of cyber game that you want. Not only can they now play to learn, because now when they need to learn how to use Wireshark, when they need to learn how to use Binary Ninja, they have an environment they can play in. They can continue that for the rest of their careers, which is pre pretty powerful. You have this rapid application. I've got to come up with a better word for this. But academics help us learn what to do and how. Games put us under pressure, under a deadline, with somebody staring down at you and saying, if you don't do it, I will. I'm going to win. So you have to basically figure out, how do I solve this? What am I solving for? Where do I get the information? What tool do I use? Has this been done before? Did somebody already put something out there? Can I quickly look at that, borrow it, cut, paste, tweak, make it work, try, fail, do again? That's incredibly powerful right then and there. So I would say academics teaches you 
how to learn the hows and the whats. Games teach you how to do it under pressure and apply yourself again and again and again. Now, what about the other side of things in terms of providing a safe place to hack? If you're an individual who's not connected to a community, let's say a university, so you're 34, 35, 38 years old, 42, 55, you don't have really the resource to have a network at home, how are you gonna stay sharp on your skills? Are you gonna really practice on your work and enterprise? How do you know what an attack looks like? You only know if it happened at work and you really don't want it happening at work for the first time you see it. So the games provide an opportunity also for us to safely hack, both um, practice our skills in defense and in offense, yes. It helps us become more of a community player. If you are that one man shop or one woman shop where you're that only security person at that small business, you don't have a community you can connect with necessarily. But through games you do, and you can learn from others. It teaches you teamwork. It's an entirely different discussion and PowerPoint slide and another hour to dive into the overlap between the cybersecurity community and neurodiversity. Entirely different conversation. But even skipping that, some of the most brilliant minds in cybersecurity lack the skills to communicate, lack the skills for leadership, lack the skills for teamwork. Not because they're not competent enough, not because they can't, but because they weren't taught. They weren't given an environment to practice. It wasn't part of what they did. And you might say, why? I doubt they were on the football team. I seriously doubt they were playing soccer or baseball. They probably didn't get it from sports because there's this thing in school that just happens where if you're physically inclined, you go to sports. If you're not, you might go to drama, debate, but that's it, right? You don't have like a team in high school. Cybersecurity sports, esports, games, clubs provide that opportunity. We do so in a matter of esports, which allows kids to really embrace the swagger, the coolness, the ability, uh, the ability to work as a team, um, to work under pressure, demonstrate leadership skills and critical thinking that you would on a football field or a basketball court. And so it provides that teamwork and experience. Now let's talk about cognitive endurance. I don't know about you. After 20 some years in cyber, I'm getting a little old. So me focusing for nine hours straight in one computer, forget the fact I probably can't get out of the chair out of that point, but my head space is not really thinking so much. Cybersecurity athletes do. They can sit there for nine hours. Who needs a bathroom break? Let's do this, right? If it takes it to win it, they do it. So if we're practicing our cognitive endurance through games on the side and on the weekends, et cetera, that makes us better professionals as well. I hope what you're hearing from this is that cyber games is not just a student thing. It's a professional thing. So why cyber esports? Um, we're in our third year of the US cyber games and uh, I'll talk a bit about that later. But I gotta tell you, the first, the first year was hard. Everybody's just like, why cyber sports? Why a cyber athlete? I still get it a little bit. But let's talk about that macro gap. Everybody's heard about it. Hey, we need more people in cyber. Why not have a sport team so that it gets, uh, encourages others to get into careers? That's easy stuff. Now let's look at the micro aspect of it, the human aspect of cyber. Today we've heard from quite a few people that talked about AI, 5G, the pace of which digital technology is evolving. Let's fast forward, let's look ahead 10 years from now. I think it's fabulous that organizations and universities and academics are focusing on the micro, macro gap. The problem is we need an elite force of people that can operate in highly complex, highly fast paced environments and be able to see what those new attacks are gonna look like. We have no idea today what they will look like, so we can't teach them. 
So we need people that can think outside the box. And we've got to be able to teach that, hone that skill. And that's not sending them for four years into an academic institution. That's the beginning of it. But it's not enough. We have to continue to hone those skills. So then we look at, OK, how do we continue to advance our research capability in the workforce? Well, generally speaking, those that do really well at Capture the Flag cyber competitions do very well in the research world. We could probably prove that with data now. Now let's look at red versus blue and some of the more operation-oriented competitions. They tend to do better in security operations centers. And they can look at something, they know what an attack looks like, they know what to do, they know how to communicate, they can do it. They can operate as a high performing team. I have seen a number of cyber competitions throughout my career. Multi generation. I come to think about one in particular a middle school team, high school team, college team, professional team. We had go up against each other. Typical capture the flag. Who won? Wasn't the professional team. Wasn't the college team. Wasn't the middle school's team. Because see, if you were watching and observing, the middle schoolers, they were a little preoccupied doing I God only knows what. The uh, professionals never talked to themselves. They literally came in the room. I watched them. They went to their circle. Like, uh, yeah, uh-huh, yep, yeah, mm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And they each just went to one server and defended one server. OK. The high school team came in. They had their flag. They had their big books, notebooks. They came in. All but one sat down. The captain stood up and walked around and around and around and then back around, was triaging, was telling them what to do, how to go and on. It was like watching a heist. It was fun. Um, they won by a landslide. Um, I don't know what the corporate team thought of that, <laughs> by the way, what their boss thought of that, uh, but they took it very seriously. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the power of high performing teams is not just for esports and cyber esports. We have to have them in our corporate environments. When we're hiring for our security operations team, it's not enough to look at skills. You have to look at personalities. You have to look at what role is this person playing on the team? How is this contributing? Are they amplifiers? Are they subtractors? High performing teams are key. Um, and then the other why. I've got a dream hack. Anybody heard of dream hack? I know at least one in the room has. Okay, so it's a major eSport gaming conference. Um, it's really cool. It's old school uh, computer science like it's kind of fun, but it's all it's all um, computer games. Um, when you walk around there and you talk to the kids, are you interested in IT? No. Oh okay. How about cybersecurity? Eh. Oh, okay. Do you take any classes? Are you technical? Are you going to be an engineer? Eh. If I can get a sentence out of them, then I'm like, hey, do you know how to code? Yeah, I know how to code. Oh, OK. You want to learn how to hack? Really? Yeah, really? <laughs> you know, They speak a different language. But they all code. They really do. They're technically inclined. They don't see it. They don't talk about it like we talk about it. Because it's not a career vector to them. It's just part of their everyday life everyday life, just in order to have the top end um, hardware at home, they need to know what the specifications for a computer should look like. In order to understand how to bypass the school's um, security policies, they've got to understand a lot about cybersecurity, <laughs> right? But let me tell you, when you can't get the Wi-Fi working at the school that you're visiting because you've got like a, a table, I don't go to the the adults, I go to the kids and say, how'd you get around the VPN? <laughs> you know, and they'll tell you. Um, the point of the matter is, why are we not targeting the eSport community even more so? Why aren't there dual 
degrees with esports and cybersecurity. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is a perfect opportunity. The infrastructure, the investment that you make in a esport arena for a school, okay, let them do it at night during the day, make it a cybersecurity sport arena, teach cybersecurity skills. The esport degree that they get, it's good for 10 years based on research. 10 years, it takes them 10 years to hone some of the most professional skills on a game. Then you're done. Talk about football player, what do they do after football? What does an esport player do after esport? Why not cybersecurity? So, how are we doing this? Um, we are emerging step by step. We're building on the foundation that the CTF and Red versus Blue community have built over years and years and building in addition to that. We are not changing how Capture the Flag is done. We are not changing how Red versus Blue is done. We want to create an entirely new sport, but first we have to learn the foundations and set the foundations. We are creating, um, starting this year, our company is um, coming out and launching a new competitive league. Um, we'll launch in April. And the training league, we're gonna start with the tribal community in the United States. And we're gonna start with the tri training league, if you will, which is gonna be more of monthly trainings, um, building up to a final, whereas the competitive league is exactly what you think. Games, a season, and a finale, a championship. Um, we're gonna try to build more streaming in. How we do that right, we're still trying to calibrate. Um, there is this thought within uh, the community, don't show my screen, you know, this is my, this is what I do, et cetera. We have to get past that. We've gotta find a way to show screens, to show tactics. Um, I get it. Some things are super secret. We'll have to get around that. But a lot of what uh, computer hack, or, you know, hack, uh, hacking and, and defense skills that you show in these games, they're common, they should be common. We should be teaching them. One of the ways we should be teaching is by watching you. Learn it, do it, apply it. So, you know, looking at that, I've been working with a lot of the platforms to see how do we make it faster. We can't do eight hours, nine hours, two weeks. I need two hours. I need four hours maximum. Two to three hour games that shows skills, um, that uses, there's too much, um, what do you call it, waste in our community of gaming. You build a, a challenge, you run it in a competition, and it's burned. Sure, you can make it open source, people can learn from it, et cetera. There's too much waste. We've gotta get rid of the waste. Look at how to utilize it. How to get this into fundamental skills that clubs can utilize again and again and again and again. To the point where, if you take one of the, and we have a few around here, but if you take somebody who's been doing some of these CTFs for two, three years, you show them a challenge, they've seen that before. There's not a lot new under the sun. The point is they've already developed that skill of being able to quickly analyze, oh, that's likely this, this, or that, and they can walk you through it. Just like, by the way, I've had some really great pen testers work for me on the team, and they're, I can take them into an office and the client will show them, this is what we're thinking about building, here's the architecture. They're like, I can break in here, 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 and here. It's the same thing. So we've gotta build those skill sets. Uh, so faster gaming. And then, of course, shoutcasters and referees. And the referees we just learned by doing a red versus blue competition where we're uh, virtually, we're like, yep, we need more watchdogs. Um, so that's gonna be interesting. It all connects to pillar four and five. You're looking for the national strategy piece. I'm a firm believer and happy to argue over beer any time um, that this is an imperative to our nation. We have to be able to develop the skill sets at all age ranges and to play cyber games in order to be better at defending our networks. So here's what it looks like. If you look to the far left, and you look at this, individuals, if you will, playing CTFs, that's where we started in, in our world, if you will, about 10 years ago, We're impacting maybe hundreds. Move to teams, thousands. Now turn it into a sport where they're playing at least monthly, every two weeks, weekly. That's pretty interesting. People are now watching. So if you're thinking about it as in terms of impact circles, 
we're getting to hundreds of thousands. Um, you're getting to millions once we go global. We're already like one step global with the US cyber team representing the nation, competing against global teams. But those are just seven teams, 40 nations competing 15 person teams. We can, go, we can do more, we can scale larger. So we can basically impact millions. So attributes of cyber esports. This is always fascinating to me. Talked about game format, very similar. Um, I haven't talked about the athletic piece of this, but I will in a second. Coaching team, very similar. We have our offense. We don't call it offense, right? <laughs> we call it red versus. How many of you have played some kind of sport in your career, in your life? Majority of the room. If we can adapt to the language of athletics, we can reach more people with our communication. Mom and dad really don't know what a red team is or a blue team. But if you say they're special teams or they're offense and defense, they get it. And once they get it, they want to know more. And they have something they can attach to in their brain. And they can add more and more and start to understand cybersecurity at the kitchen table. We have scoreboards, highlights and fun, fandom, training, mock battles, demos, shoulder surfing, dashes. How fast can you fix, um, finish this challenge? Um, how accurate, if I only give you one opportunity or two opportunities to submit. We have focus as well, which we'll talk about in a second. Actually, I'll hit it right here. Traditional sports, some of the focus areas um, or attributes that you would rank a player on. Strength, speed, conditioning, or energy, positioning, or, or mobility. In cyber esports, or sorry, in esports itself, um, they, they have their own version. Dexterity, speed, condition slash endurance, game map awareness. For our operators out there, what does that sound like to you? Suspiciously, it sounds to me like situational awareness. So these kids are already learning situational awareness at middle school, if not younger. In the cyber esport realm, we also look at dexterity to some degree, but mainly it's um, speed, conditioning, game map awareness. So what we're doing in our program is blending esports, cybersecurity, and athletics together. Again, why esports? Because we can tap them for talent, but there's a tremendous amount of research out there on how to train an esports team. If you read it, you'll be like me and saying, this is the same thing if I'm trying to do a team for a security operations center or a watch center. All of these apply. It's an incredible, sexy market space that gets you attention, that allows us to get to a wider audience so that we can talk about cybersecurity to everybody. But again, the, the attributes that are in common, cognitive endurance. We have one of the best teams in the world at the US cyber team. But I gotta tell you, in a nine hour competition, about the fifth hour, they're all taking breaks. They're exhausted, they're tired, they're bored. They've kind of pushed it. So we're looking at ways on how to train them in such a way that they can last all nine hours. That means we're looking at their nutrition, their sleep and recovery. What does it sound like to you, more athletics than cybersecurity? Now think about your own team if you're part of Security Operations Center and an enterprise. You need to worry about their mindset, their burnout rate. You need to worry about, are they making mistakes, creating more exploitable opportunities on your enterprise? Are they working as a team? Do we even know what it looks like when they get exhausted? Do you have indicators? We're doing that on our team. We're learning that. We're going to do some studies on it and also talk about how that implicates, how that can be learned in the community so that we can have, again, high performing security operations teams worldwide. Game board awareness. It's not enough in a CTF to know this is your challenge, you go do it. You need to know which competitors are going after which topic areas. Why? Because you might think crypto is your weak spot. But the reality is, if everybody else is finishing those crypto challenges in record time, do you really think they're that hard? Why skip them? Game board awareness is imperative to winning. 
we're trying to teach our team how to have better game board awareness. How do we set the tools and techniques and tactics in place so that they can understand where their competitors are, and what they can learn from that, and how they can apply that in-game towards winning. Speed and proficiency. The ability to learn a skill super quick. I don't know how many times I've heard of a cyber athlete that has to, I don't have any clue how to do this. Somebody show me. Yeah, I can do that. Done. That's pretty cool. Wouldn't you like to hire that person? I would. Multi-skill range. Being able to be not just a mile deep, but an inch deep, a mile wide. Having different skills that you can apply. The ability to identify, analyze, and solve in minutes. Again, wouldn't you want to hire that person? Many, many corporations want to hire everybody on our team because they have that ability. So what is it about athletics that we care about? I talked a little bit about athletics earlier. You all know about a sport. You can associate it with the lingo. Here's the thing. Sports have done, we haven't done in cybersecurity. For a large part, they have unlocked the gender barrier. Women don't care if I win or lose. Women aren't competitive. Women wouldn't be attracted to cybersecurity sport. They don't like sports. Yeah, all myths. I'm here to say women are highly competitive. They're more competitive than men. I've worked with both. <laughs> so they're just different. Um, and so if you, if you build more of a team ecosystem, if you build more of that creed, that ability to show teamwork and leadership and sharing, you're not just going to get more women on your team, which makes you stronger because you have a different perspective, right? And the diversity creates strength and layers. But you're now attracting diversity in mindsets and cultures as well. You're creating that inclusive environment. But as the commissioner of the team, what I love about athletics the most is that it's already kind of set the recruiting process. I mean, if you look at standings and rankings, universal ranking system of tennis world, or you look at um, how they score, um, professional ice skating, or you look at um, football and their programs and how they train, there's a lot to be learned. Cybersecurity eSport is a whole new territory. We're not going to build it on the lessons of cybersecurity. We have to look at the athletic lessons, the best practices, and fuse that into what we do in order to be stronger. Of course, the teamwork, the collaboration, the critical thinking. Unfortunately, if, you got, if you're not in sports in today's high schools in the United States, you don't get that kind of education. You simply don't. You go to school, you get the academic learnings, but you lose so much more because you don't know what it's been, what it's going to be like to be on a team. And I remember that was advice a coworker gave to me when my son was pre-middle school. He was elementary, and he's like, "You got to get him in sports." Got to be in football. Ah, I don't know. No, football, Jess. He's got to get in football. He's got to get in before eighth grade. I'm like, why? He's like, because it teaches him how to be a man. And <laughs> I laughed. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, no, just trust me. You get what I mean. I'm like, okay. And I watched. I got to watch. And my son grew up in sports. And it made a huge difference because he had many more mentors in his life. He had friends he could... Um, to work with. But more than that, he learned how to take a hit, how to fall down, fail again and again and again, and get back up. And he learned how not to fail, too, and get around it. So there's a lot to be learned in, in athletics. Cybersecurity, we talked about that micro gap. And these are some knowledge areas I typically go over with non cybersecurity people, but you probably all know them, so I won't spend too much time there. But they do equate, if you're working with the NICE workforce framework, they, they equate to these work roles and competency areas, um, which are really critical. So when I'm looking at finding champions and sponsors that are looking for top talent in the United States, I, I often ask them, I'm saying, what are you hiring for? And it's typically out of there. And it changes every year, which I find fascinating. So um, last year, it was all about malware. A reverse engineering, pen testing. Now I'm hearing AI, cloud, and a few others. But all of these skill sets are needed on our team and throughout esports. 
Again, I have this slide up. I know you guys know what this is, but I find it fascinating uh, because you have capture the flag. Again, those that are really good at capture the flag are researchers and analysts and engineers. Those that are really good at red versus blue are your operators. Um, it's fascinating how that kind of works out. Uh, we'll be um, observing some cyber access here shortly, exercises to see what, what that transitions um, into as well. We're learning from everything we possibly can. This talks about high performing teams. Um, any Vince fans out there? Anybody? No? Okay, well. The challenge of every team is to build a feeling of oneness, a dependence on one another, because the question is usually not how well each other performs, but how well they work together. I can say that for our US cyber team. Can you say that for your team? This goes over a little bit about what we did, um, what we talked about earlier. This is all about, if we take a football team, League of Legends in the middle, if you're not familiar, We've got our hardware com competitor going on over on the right. We say, okay, what kind of rules are in football? I mean, sorry, roles are in football. You have quarterback, wide receiver, defensive back, defensive line, safety, kicker. Now think about the training of football. Any football players here? Watchers, players, anybody? Anybody remember football summers? <sighs> Did the quarterback have the same kind of training as the safety? So why do we teach all, all, our, all our cybersecurity people the same? Same thing in League of Legends. If you're not into eSports, they have their roles. You have your top laner, your mid laner, your juggler, your support. So when we look at a cyber team, I ask you, what are our roles? Could it be, and this is more, I put some out there just for fun. Are our hunters more finding vulnerabilities or threats out there? Do you have our fighters that are actually exploiting? Do we have our support? Support's critical in esports. That role, do we have that in esports and cyber or in cybersecurity in general? How about orchestrators? Those that know how to do automation. Those that can pull automation like no other. They know what tools to use, how to do it quickly. How about the Meisters? Your crypto, your RE. How about your queues? Anybody know Q from 007? Your tool developers, your nifty things. We need to have that in cybersecurity esports. And that's kind of how I look at when we're looking at how to build an esport team or an esport community. Let's look at roles so that athletes and players can decide which roles they want to designate for themselves and get darn good at that. So why play internationally in the global level? Um, competing globally changes you. The first time you leave the United States and travel outside the country changes your perspective. It's a rule. How many of you have traveled globally? You've gone outside the United States. Many of our students haven't. Many of the players, when they come to the US cyber team for the first time, they haven't gone outside the state. It helps to change your perspective on the world. Then you get to meet people and you have a network and they're playing against top talent from around the world, over 40 nations. Fast forward 10 years from now and there's an issue at the company that they're working at that has to deal with uh, Chile. They're gonna know who to contact. Their network of people that they can contact that are just as skilled if not more skilled, they're gonna have that because they've been part of something that's been bigger than in the United States. So how are we applying it? I didn't spend a lot of time um, on the US cyber team. It's kind of a whole different thing, if you will. I do encourage you guys to visit our site, uscybergames.com, approaching season four. Every year we're getting stronger and learning more things. We run it like an athletic program. There's no secret to that. We start with our open, which is our tryouts. From the open, we go to the combine. The combine's still not football combine, baseball combine, but we're getting there. During the combine, the coaches are evaluating skill sets. Not just your technical skill sets, but how do you handle yourself professionally when, um, I don't know, the tool doesn't work the way it should, or your folks that you're 
I'm supposed to be meeting with don't show up or don't pull their weight, right? The teamwork, the leadership, et cetera. We're watching through the combine. We go into the draft day just like the NFL. We'll draft those that are on our team up to age 25. Um, and then we'll draft another pool of candidates. We call our pipeline. This is where we do really kind of enforce diversity. We're building the next generation of cyber athletes. The pipeline, you can call them red shirts if you want. They do tend to train with the team in many ways. They don't travel, they don't get all the perks. But what we're trying to do is find highly competent folks early on and have them train in sports over a year. And typically after even one year in the pipeline, they're not just ready to be on our team, they're ready to take first place on many competitions around the United States. We go into our training camps once we've identified our team and our coaches um, typically will have a training camp on CTF, kind of team get to know each other kind of thing. And then a second one on red versus blue. We'll do a number of scrimmages, some globally that we'll stream. Some we do we, with corporations. Shout out to MasterCard. They brought our team in um, <laughs> to run an exercise with their team. They had a tremendous amount of fun. They're like, I didn't expect them to be that skilled. <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of fun that way. And then we compete internationally. We've gone to Athens, Greece, um, and we've gone to San Diego. We hosted here last year. This year we're going to Chile. We'll also be at the European finals in Italy this year. And then uh, we're announcing something at the end of the month, sneak preview. Um, but uh, you guys can keep a secret, right? We're commissioning the first ever US women's team, ages up to 28. And they will compete against Japan and the UK in Tokyo this November. So I'm um, really excited about the future and where this goes. We're also, um, it's out on LinkedIn somehow <laughs> today, that was a surprise. Um, but we are trying to put together our first training league again with the tribal community. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. So what I wanna reiterate before I leave is games are not just for students. They're for all of us in cybersecurity. It's a lifelong thing. We go to different um, camps, RSA College Day. Our athletes will work with those, have, you know, give um, some exhibits, if you will, of challenges so new people can put their hands on it and learn it. Um, we obviously compete as a US cyber team up to 25. We usually do a charity battle the last day of Black Hat, first day of DEF CON. Pen test teams compete for their favorite charity. Um, and of course, we have the leagues that we're gonna be running this year as well. So again, there's something for everybody in cybersecurity esports. But last but not least, our women's program is next weekend. Still time to show uh, to sign up. Um, Wicked Six is our global 24-hour hack and chat. We start in the United States. It's for all women, all ages, and um, all cyber skill sets. Um, start in the United States, mid-afternoon. We work counterclockwise. We have speakers from all over the world, women speaking on cybersecurity topics. We have six, um, six different game platforms available for the women. Um, they can play in duos as uh, singles or as uh, five or more teammates, and they can compete for 24 hours. And they do, they stay up all 24 hours, um, which is surprising. We had 1,500 last year, so pretty excited this year. And um, oh yeah, we have an all women's professional tournament going on. So we'll be live streaming with John Hammond, the red versus blue uh, tournament on the Hack the Box Battlegrounds. Um, so that's gonna be exciting as well. I have a couple of minutes. Anybody have questions? Anybody play a CTF before? Really? Some of you just don't wanna raise your hand. Backseat. <laughs> um, Anybody watch a cyber game before? Anybody watch somebody else hack before? Or defend or try to work through a challenge? I, I believe so. <laughs> um, and of course, just we're always looking for sponsors. We're looking for in-kind and cash, of course. There's plenty of opportunities to volunteer. We have mentors. We have coaches. Um, they're all volunteer staff. Uh, it does take a community to run this program. and. Uh, if you can help us just spread the word, 
We're trying to get this out as far and wide as we can about the uscybergames.com, wicked6.com, and if you want just a general site to go to, playcyber.com. Thank you. That concludes today's briefing.
Okay, am I, I'm up. We are gonna get this session started, so if you're on the fence, we'd love for you to come in and grab a seat. Yeah, come uh, on in. Colonel Norris is gonna pull the door there. It's good. So, you're wondering why somebody who's stationed at, uh, in Virginia is here in South Dakota. Uh, it's because I've known him for years and we used to work together. So we taught together at the National Defense University in a program called the Joint Advanced Warfighting School. And I wanna say four years ago, it's been about four years, uh, he was getting assigned. I had been in the program for three to four years before he came in. And so that was the first time I met him. And one of the things that I ran was an elective called Cyber Information, Intelligence, and Space Considerations. And those were at a, at a classified level that we would run those programs. And so he came in and, and uh, Colonel Vic Norris is a cyber offense officer, still active duty as you can tell, in the Air Force. And we taught together for a couple of years and then we got split apart as a team. But I just, as, as I was thinking about this conference and I was thinking about who I knew, uh, several people came to mind and he's one of the people that came to mind. And it's really been a pleasure working with him. We, we always had a great time working together. He taught strategy and I taught something that's called operational art and campaign planning. So he ran, in fact, he ran the strategy, we'll call it division or department, we use different terminology, we called something called a field of study, and I ran the operational R and campaign planning. So we worked very, very closely together. Uh, lots of travel together, uh, through with our students. Our students, we'd have 45 students a year. If you know anything about the military, it's what's called a senior war college. And those students were like post command 05s and 06s, if that means anything to you. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. He's gonna talk more about it. But I just wanted to at least give a, a personal introduction to Colonel Vic Norris because he's here because he, uh, he had faith in me that this was a good thing for him to do. So thank you so much for having faith in me and thank you for coming to South Dakota. No problem. Hey, so first off, can you all hear me? All right, second off, I'm, I plan to not step foot on that stage even once, right? Because I'm a firm believer that I'm here as much to learn from you all as I would ever relay to you. Because guess what? My biases are informed by the way that I was raised. So when you heard Dr. Bell talk earlier today about the diversity of thought, that is one of my passions, right? Because there's a lot of assumptions you all have just by looking at me standing up here in front of you, right? You're like, wow, he's, he's, he's kind of different looking than the typical cyber person that we would run into account with, right? And he was a strategy professor, right? And if I told you that I spent a lot of years in the special ops community coming out of perfectly good airplanes and helicopters and things of that nature, you would probably continue to form opinions on where I come from, right? So then I can break that down further by saying, I have an undergrad in math and physics and I taught strategy. Wait, those two things don't go together. You're already feeling some cognitive dissonance, right? I have a passion for history. I played college baseball. My dad's a retired Marine. Now you're putting together this image of where I come from, right? I was born in Southern California, right? I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. But wait, why is he talking about China? You don't see it comes together. So my point to this is, I want to get to know you all so I can learn from you, right? So I put this presentation together to talk about the convergence of the technical and the cognitive. And you're like, what the heck is he talking about, right? Because we're in the area of great power competition. And I heard a lot of terminology in the last couple of speakers that I'm not positive that you all know what that means. So before I go in greater depth, who here has served in the US military? Okay. So that gives me an idea. All right, for the younger ones in the room, who has parents or aunts or uncles who have served in the military? Okay, there's a little bit. All right, terminology-wise, if I was to say the top right is the escape from Kabul in 1842, who here would have any idea what I'm talking about? Okay, that is why I wanted to get an understanding, because I want you to ask questions. So what you see on the screen up here is, uh, my, my, exec, my executive assistant using ASSAGE, which is also the, the classified or controlled but unclassified information version of ChatGPT, right? 
we put, I asked him to put in, uh, make me a picture of what the escape Cabo looked like, and I asked ChatGPT to recreate that. And you're probably looking at that, goes, looks pretty cool, right? You all here probably like, oh, it looks great. But if I was to ask Dr. Bell, is there something wrong with that picture in the top right? Could you find at least one flaw within 15 seconds? Right? The most obvious one is there were no tanks in 1842. The reason I say that is because if we rely solely on technical aptitude, cyber skills, but we are absent the cultural, historical context of what we're looking at, I could sell that this is a real picture to the vast majority of the US populace, right? So why are we talking about that? So in order to get, to get really into this topic, it's important that you understand what, when I say conflict and when I say war, what does that mean, right? And so this is something my students would have loved to have seen, right? And CL, you're, if you write it down, that's great. You can have it but do not give it to anyone going through jobs. This is my definition of war, right? And, and I wanna break it kind of apart because I want you all to understand what this means because when I get further in, I'm gonna nest on one slide and then I'm gonna start looking at the different eras and ask if this is war, right? War is socially sanctioned or recognized violence. What does that mean? Think about that for a second. Uh, to gain influence, primacy, between people groups, cultures, et cetera. And, and then down on the bottom right is who influenced me with those, those ideas. Most of you, if you haven't read Sun Tzu or Clausewitz, if you get involved in the military at all in any way, shape, or form, you'll know who they are. Now, the next two, uh, really the next after Schelling, Holiday and Patr Patrikakos, and I can't pronounce the name, so forgive me are two books that you probably have read. War in 140 Characters. Who here has read War in 140 Characters? Highly recommend it. So War in 140 Characters talks through a young lady in Palestine who is tweeting about her life as the, uh, as, as the Israeli offensive begins. But it also goes into Ukraine and other events that have happened where social networking, social networks, have influenced governments to change their reactions. And then Holiday is Trust Me or lie, I'm Lying, which is all about how a market influencer can manipulate the media. Okay, but then who's Dr. Zhang? How many of you have ever, have ever heard of the Thousand Talents program? Okay, so there was a, uh, in December of 2019, the dean of the Harvard uh, bio biochemistry department was arrested for sending vials of blood back to the Wuhan Institute in China, right? Allegedly, what was developed at the Wuhan Institute? COVID-19. COVID-19. He pleaded guilty for being part of what's called the Thousand Talents Program, which is a, a PRC effort to recruit scientists from around the world uh, to influence and manipulate the global whatever, right? That's just a high level version of it. All right, so who's Dr. Zhang? Dr. Zhang was my original thesis advisor at Air War College, where I got my third master's degree. The Air Force, for some reason, keeps sending me back to school, right? And so my first day at Air War College, I decided I wanted to write a paper. I wanted to write a paper on how the Air Force, I should have probably started here. All these views and everything I say are my own and not reflected <laughs> of the Department of Defense, the United States Air Force. So when, when CL puts it on LinkedIn, just remember that I did say it, even if I didn't lead with it, right? So Dr. Zhang, I wanted to write my paper on how the US Air Force needs to get prepared for great power competition. How are we gonna compete with China if it comes to it, right? If, if great power conflict comes to, comes to pass, how are we gonna be ready? So, my first day of class, I go and I have to find a thesis advisor, like every other master's student, right? So I go and Dr. Zhang, 
had been at Air University for 18 years, right? So he seemed like the logical person for me to work for or study under. Well, here's the interesting part. After that first meeting, I signed up for his China elective. And he literally yells at me during the first meeting, because I'm sitting next to a classmate saying, we were talking about Huawei and intellectual property theft. And he looks over at me, and he yells from across the room, you have no proof. And then the next day, he starts asking me questions about uh, Stuxnet and all the things I did in my previous offensive jobs, which, from a security perspective, you just don't do. right? So I switched thesis advisors to Dr. Murphy, but that's another story, right? And so long story short, I write my thesis in October of 2019 and present it. That China is looking under, under their philosophy of unrestricted warfare to develop either a biological or a chemical weapon to undermine Western authority and the economic order, right? That was October of 2019, right? The Harvard or dean got arrested in December of 2019. And then all you all know what happened in February of 2020. And then in April of 2020, I presented my thesis to the National Security Council. Ultimately, it's how I ended up at JAWS. Well, what's up with Dr. Zhang? Well, I was giving a lecture on Cog this actual lecture at JAWS with Dr. Bell. And then I went upstairs to brief offensive cyber in our skiff on the third floor, right? And when I came out, my phone had blown up. Dr. Zhang had been arrested as a spy, right? As either part of the Confucius Institute or under something called the United Front. That is what has influenced my definition of war. So now I'm going to get a little strategy geek geeky on you, OK? And then we'll get into stories. Here's the Clausewitzian paradoxical trinity. You're like, oh my goodness. It's like I'm back at Leavenworth for the folks in the army, right? This is based off three things. The passion of the people, the reason of the government, and the courage and chance of the military. So when, when you saw where I said culturally accepted, right? the question becomes, what is your definition of war? What is your definition of violence? If we blockade a port, like, for example, what we have going on, what's going on in Gaza right now. Is that an act of war? Absent everything else. If I was to stop vehicles from bringing food into this, into the town of Madison, is that an act of war? So I'm mostly looking at the youngsters to try to get an understanding. Do you think that's an act of war? Don't, no, no. Is it violence? Hmm. OK. What about uh, if I cut off your oil supply? Right? So if you look at the bottom left, that's what the Japanese say was the, their modus operandi for why they invaded Pearl Harbor, right? It's what that culture group thinks is war and violence that matters, not necessarily what you or I think. OK? So yeah, I said influence primacy. You'll hear a lot of talk from the military using terms like deterrence. Integrated deterrence, deterrence by denial, deterrence by punishment. Well, if you've ever read Schelling, where that all comes from, you'll realize quickly there's actually four influence mechanisms. You have assurance to persuade an actor from something. You have inducement to persuade someone to something, right? And then you have the coercive ones on the right. Deterrence, basically. I'm going to get you to not walk out those doors, because if you do, I'll punch you in the face. I'm deterring you from walking out those doors, right? Now, if I want you to go out those doors, I'm going to punch you in the face until you walk out the doors. That's compellence. Really simple, right? And people understand the right side, but they tend to forget the left side. OK. Does this make sense? I know this is a little esoteric, but all right, here we go. But this then brings into a problem. We use the concept of deterrence based primarily off nuclear deterrence. All of those influence mechanisms rely on three things. You have to be able to communicate a credible capability, 
right? To communicate, you have to understand what I'm saying. If I say nuclear deterrence to any one of you, I don't care how young you are. You know that nuclear weapons are bad because it's under the strategy of annihilation, right? Mutually assured destruction is really easy to communicate. You're all going to die is really easy to understand. All right, now let's talk about the colonial pipeline. How am I going to deter you from attacking a pipeline with ransomware? You can communicate it, but what makes it credible? And what capability are you going to demonstrate that makes it credible? And how does the adversary receive it? So that goes into cognitive biases. And that goes back into how I started with where you're from, right? What I value is different than, than, than what even what Dr. Bell values. And we have a very similar background, actually, right? So you have to get into understanding your own cognitive bias, right? If I was to ask this crowd, just throw it out. What do you think the five most common biases are in, in the US government? Throw some out. I actually did this at NDU, and I got about the same responses. Come on. What's that? Age. Age. OK. What are some other ones? Gender. Gender. OK. What's that? Come on, anyone? Religion. Religion. Race. Race. OK. Now, here's the funny part. Uh, if you throw financial status, those are the same five that I got when I gave this same presentation at National Defense University. Now, here's the scary part. Not a single one of those five is in the top 30. Why? The most, the most resident bias is something called anchoring bias. You're like, what the heck is that? And now I'm going all psychology on you. Anchoring bias is the first thing that you establish an emotional connection to is the one thing I cannot change. For example, you try to convince a child whose parent was killed in 9-11 in the towers that Muslim extremists are not whatever. Not going to happen, right? Makes sense? They've established an emotional connection to them, and you are never going to change that, right? Now, you can, you can argue that that's not really a bias. That's an emotion. But the thing is, when you look at these four things, Right? What we remember, how do we act fast? Your brain is developing mechanisms for making decisions. Right? And so biases are those mechanisms for making decisions. They either help you to make something faster, a decision faster. They help you to remember something. Right? They help you process more information. So yes, all of those things that you brought up, race, financial status, economics, gender, gender identity, you know, sociocultural groups, those are all things that can be a bias, but they cannot be considered in mass. They have to be considered individually, and it's different for each person. You can find someone that was born in 29 Palms, California, that's been in the military for a long time and sent him right here, and we could have completely different biases because maybe that person wasn't one of the ones that was in Iraq during the invasion, right? Or maybe et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But understanding your biases and so I, I highly recommend, there's a site called Decision Lab, and it has a list of all the cognitive biases that the American Psychological Association uh, tracks. And then it takes them, right? And you can read through them. And what I had all our students do, and Dr. Bell remembers this drill, is I had each student go through all of those biases, flag their top five, right? And then when they were done with their plan or project or whatever, they had to go back through and red team you all know what the term red team means? OK. Go back through and red team their solutions based off of ensuring that their biases were considered in their red teaming. Because otherwise, you tend to make the same decision over and over and over again. All right. All right, so now I put these two slides together. right? And now I'm going to nest here on this chart. OK. And now I want to hear, I want to tell stories, but I want to get a little bit more interaction from you all. And if you don't, I'm just going to tell stories anyways, right? These are all stories that have come up in my experience in the last six years 
all based off of my own bias and an understanding of others' bias, right? And so I can pick up um, any one of these and, and run with it, or I can lean into that. But I want to know what you're thinking. Any questions? Thinking about what? Thinking about great power competition, bias, warfare, violence, right? What are the things that are on your mind? If you had the opportunity today to sit and talk with the commander of Air Combat Command, who's responsible for every fighter, bomber, information warfare, which is cyber and electronic warfare combined, if you had a second to sit down with my boss, General Wilsbach, and ask him a question, what would you ask him? Right? <laughs> I think that's done. It is done. That's done. Why did you? They're, they're not survivable in a fight in the Indo-Pacific. It's a long, it's a big ocean. It's a lot of refuelers for something that can only fly up, up to a certain altitude and doesn't go fast enough to get there. But, but that's a whole other conversation yes. that we could talk about, right? So who, let me start with a simple example. Who here has seen the movie Don't Look Up? All right. I don't endorse the movie, but I love the concept of it. What's the premise of the movie Don't Look Up? I'm looking at you right here. Come on. I didn't finish it. I couldn't make it all the way through. <laughs> the premise is, oh, how would you sum it up? It's about climate change, ultimately, um, how a society collectively acts. Hmm. Okay, so, so the basic premise of Don't Look Up, so we talk a lot about this concept of misinformation, disinformation, fake news, et cetera, right? So in the movie Don't Look Up, there's a, a, a planet-killing meteor coming for Earth, right? And they know it's coming, they saw it on that random observatory, and the movie sucks, by the way, let me just be up front, but the premise is, is where I'm going for, right? I think he agrees with you. Yeah, so, but there's a pop singer a young lady who's dating another pop singer, young man, right? And every time they go to talk on the news about this meteor coming to end the world, they go back to the news talking about this pop singer and their relationship. So misinformation, disinformation, the third aspect is something called propaganda, right? But we gotta put this all together. So. What do you, why are we talking about this? You were just talking about warfare. It's back to that biases. It's having an understanding, right, of how we can be influenced. The whole movie is stupid, but the movie comes out with the entire campaign starts with don't look up. And then the very end of the movie, the president has her own rocket ship she created, and she leaves Earth before the Earth blows up. Right? Stupid movie. Agreed. But, but the premise is there. Okay, so, so let's take that concept and let's tie it into more of a war fighting campaign. How many of you are familiar with uh, when Russia invaded Estonia in 2014 time frame? Crimea. Uh, sorry, no, 2008. But they haven't invaded Estonia, but Georgia. Georgia. Okay, copy so all. Estonia is still... The statue. Which one? The statue. In, in Tallinn, Estonia. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. That's the cyber that. attack. So, the cyber yeah, yeah, yeah. but they rolled across the border and tore the, tore the statue down. Yeah. No, they haven't been made in Estonia. Okay. Not yet. Here's, here's, here's where I'm going with this. The statue. Yep. When they tore the statue down. Yep. When the police forces came across and took the statue, whether they were Russian military or they were not Russian military, we can agree that they were... They were, they were people coming in. There were people that came across the border. Okay, I will check my words. Little green, little green, men. Little green men before little green men, right? So, so here's, the, here's the background of that particular story. There was a lot of social media networking going on that, that the Estonian government was not able to pay their third country nationals to provide security, right? Over and over, over a period of time, they really took control of the information environment and caused the people in that area to believe that they couldn't take care of their own security. Now, there's a huge division between ethnic Russians and non-ethnic Russians, pretty much along the whole Eastern Bloc. But it's really profound in Estonia and Georgia, Latvia, all along that area, right? 
they compromised a single ATM with a cyber attack. They then took the video of that single ATM spitting out money and put it all over social media, right? You're like, oh, you can all read about this in the book called Sandworm, too, if you haven't read it. Well, then what happened? Well, then guess who, guess who didn't come to work when they thought they weren't going to get paid? The third country national security forces, right? And then the people came across the border, moved, tore the statue down, tried to relocate it, right? Which many in Estonia today still consider an act of war, right? Goes back to that bias, right? And their own definition. But what we are seeing here is a confluence between a technical action and a cognitive action coming together to cause an effect, right? We are the only country of the, the great power competition that separates the technical and the cognitive. How many of you here are computer science, computer engineering, cybersecurity majors, right? How many of you are social science majors? I'm, I'm, I, I know you are. <laughs> That's the reason uh, it's helpful. But it's important to understand that if, if you're doing cybersecurity and, and cyber the entire time and you're not talking to those other sectors, then you are going to miss malign influence. You're going you're gonna to be the cybersecurity person saying, hey, I only had a single ATM that was compromised, right? We lost you know, maybe $1,500. But there's an outsized effect about that single ATM when it's now on social media, right? Does that make sense? All right, some other stories. How many of you have heard of a, a, something called Project Maven? OK. So Project Maven, since most of you haven't, I'll tell the whole story, right? Now, this story is mostly fictitious. I say fictitious because you can't find any reference to it unless you talk to someone who worked for Google at the time. So this is my own personal story. It is not documented, it is not legal, it is not historical, right? It is based off a conversation I had with a single engineer at Google. All right, that is my disclaimer. Now here's the fictitious story. Uh, so Google is working on Project Maven. Project Maven is an artificial intelligence suite designed to look at something called full motion video. You guys know what full motion video is? Do you know what a predator drone is? Right, so it takes video as it's flying around. It goes back to an intelligence collection center who processes it. Hey, I saw Johnny here at this time, and it goes into a repository so we can go back and search for it. We use it for our battles over, overseas, right? And if you want to talk about how we killed Osama bin Laden, you can get an idea of how that works, right? Pattern of life analysis. So we've been working on that for years. When, uh, when an interesting thing happens, a young lady, fictitious young lady, getting her master's in artificial intelligence at MIT, um, gets hired by Google to work up in Washington State to work on Product Maven. While she was at MIT, she was active with the Confucius Institute, active on Weibo and WeChat, Right, which ties back to something called the social credit system, right? But she gets this job working for on Maven. Then she tweets out, seemingly out of nowhere, that Google's making weapons of war for the military. Right? You're like, I don't. I think this story sounds familiar, but I don't remember a person. And here's why. About. Two hours after her first tweet, it was retweeted approximately 10 million times by something called the 50 Cent Army, which is 3 million, yes, 3 million Chinese students, their diaspora around the globe, uh, who are tasked with retweeting information over social media, right? They get paid 50 cents for every number of positive tweets that go out. Okay, that's interesting. So then it starts to trend on Twitter. Google shouldn't make weapons of war for the military, right? Right, so there's a technical skill, right? But it's being used to influence a social media system. All right, well, that's interesting. And then three days later, 
eight individuals from Google tweet out something similar. But these eight individuals are interesting because none of them are of Chinese descent. Hmm. And then the next day, the young lady's original tweet and all the retweets disappear off the internet. Wait, what? Disappear off the internet. Now all you have is those eight non-Chinese origin individuals who just tweeted out with all of the 50 Cent Army's amplification amongst the rest of the amplifications. And then what everybody heard is the chief operations officer at Google says, we will no longer make weapons of war for the US military. Wait a minute. That was an acquisition entity, social media networks, right? I would argue that it was probably just an algorithm that was doing the retweeting, that people weren't actually doing it. But what we have here is we had a reaction, right? That only had a technical component that was this, but was outsized by the psychological component, which forced a reaction. Does that make sense? Hopefully, it doesn't keep you up at night. But the premise is how do we get after it, right? How do you, as a cybersecurity professional, if you're working for Facebook, did, did anything get compromised? No. Now, CIS is not here anymore, because this actually falls in their job jar. But um, these are the types of things that we have to think about. You can't just be a cybersecurity professional anymore. right? When we talk about great power competition, you have to have as much technical or cognitive ability and psychological understanding and cultural understanding um, as you do the technical skills. So having your friends in industry your friends locally, federally, state, like the presentation this morning, becomes that much more important. And, he, and he, you're probably wondering, well, how did you get there to where you're thinking this way? Right? So I have an engineering degree, but this is my passion. Well, why? So I was part of something called the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Afghanistan. Have you, have you all, has anyone here heard of that before? OK. So our job was to go into villages in Afghanistan and teach them to farm, teach them to get like how to get water supplies, right? Teach them to develop the skills so they could be a self-sustaining economy without having to rely on the West, right? So I'm part of a provincial reconstruction team in Gardez, Afghanistan, which if you've never been there, it's in the mountains, right? And so there was a village where the women had to go about six miles and up about 4,000 feet each day to get water, right? And has anyone heard this story before other than Dr. Bell? OK, good. Me being an engineer, I was like, you know, this is stupid. There's probably a way we can get water. So we dug them a well. And then the well was destroyed the first night. Hmm. OK. so we. I fixed the well, and the well was destroyed again. Now, I'm not a complete idiot. The next night, I put up low light cameras, right, after we fixed the well. Other than you, and maybe you, because I'm getting a little nod like he knows the story, too. Who was destroying the wells? The women. The, the women. Why? Get away from their husbands, their brothers, their grandfathers, right? It was the women's respite time away from their people and their life, right? That was their, all the women, my, I have two daughters and a wife. And sometimes they'll just disappear to go to the restroom. I have no idea what's going on, right? But that's, that's what my wife describes it as. That's their girl time, right? And, and we took it away. Now, here's an interesting thing. Dr. Bell, how many women were on my PRT? Zero, right? How much cultural training did I get on that particular region? Zero. Oh, not a CBT. <laughs> now, now here's, here's where it comes up, right? So I came out of the 6th Special Operations Squadron where I'm responsible for foreign internal defense, meaning I'm supposed to be training these foreign countries. But 
I speak Spanish, at least I used to, so I was culturally aligned to South America. So it makes perfect sense that I was in Afghanistan, right? But we just don't have the capacity to do that, right? My biggest lesson learned from that whole trip is that if I don't have a cultural understanding of what I'm doing, then if I don't know the why, then I can be the best at the how, but I'm just going to keep doing it, right? Now let's take that up in scale and let's talk about China. I have an offensive team. Let's say I have my offensive team is targeting China. And I have a cyber operator like me, right? So I can go geek out with the best of you all, although I haven't done it in a long time, right? And I have a linguist sitting here next to me. But I don't have a cultural anthropologist, right? Meaning I'm not going to know if, if I turn off the water supply in that little village again, right? Are they going to care? Because I got to understand the technical, I got to understand the cognitive, right? Does that make sense? Man, you guys are like, should do jumping jacks. I need to bring AV back in, you know? But, okay. Now I want to tell, I want to tell another story. Does it, are there anything up here anyone wants me to talk about? Because I can just tell my own stories. Any of them that are curious to you? I think it'd be great if you would tell the Sony. The Sony story? Yeah. So I was the, <laughs> I was the principal cyber advisor for, uh, at US Northern Command in NORAD when Sony got hit regarding that stupid movie. Does anybody know what movie I'm talking about? Oh, that, that movie might have been worse than Don't Look Up, by the way. Or Dude, Where's My Car? That's another bad one, too. Um, right? And so uh, um, when this happens, we found out in September, right, that Sony had been compromised, that all these actors and actresses' salaries had been taken out of their email system and sent out to the media, right? Found out in September. So I brief all the flag officers who respond. Those are individual stars on their shoulders, senior to me. Um, I gave them a, a speech on, on what had happened. They didn't care. They just didn't care. It's critical infrastructure, but it's Sony, right? Okay. Well, then it comes out on the news on Christmas Eve 2014. My wife calls it Operation Deny Christmas because I spent 10 hours with three phones, a lawyer, someone from Department of Homeland Security, someone from the NSA, and someone from the State Department, all in front of me, right, as I'm going through different phones, because they're, not all, they're all not allowed to talk to each other, right? So I did that for 12 hours. Then I go and I back brief the generals, who now all care all of a sudden, right, because it's now on the news. And I spent, so if I was with the generals for two hours, how much of that two hours do you all think I actually talked about what happened and how we were going to respond? Out of curiosity. Just throw out a percentage out of two hours. 15. That's pretty close. I spent 15 minutes explaining what happened and how we respond. I spent the next hour and 45 minutes walking them through whether or not their USA passwords were good enough whether they should check their bank accounts from Starbucks, right? And you're like, oh, man, that's what we deal with today. Yeah, this is only a decade earlier. We're still kind of in that same lane. But what people didn't realize with that was Korea or someone took a technical action because of a movie, right? Red Dawn, right? Was it Red Dawn? No, it was... Uh, the, dic the, the interview. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say the dictator too. The interview. Okay. Right? But the understanding is technically that was an act of war. Right? They hit U.S. critical infrastructure, codified in law as one of the 12 critical, industries, ind critical infrastructure sectors in the United States. They did it over a movie. Maybe we need to start thinking differently than just, oh, my firewall got compromised, and I need to update my antivirus on my Cisco unified whatever, right? 
just understanding that, right? I do want to walk through the dust story. So Dr. Bell was there when I came up, actually my daughter came up with this algorithm or acronym, DUST. Detect, understand, secure, and target back. Detect. China's top three priorities. Stability of the party. Economic prosperity of China, right? And the third is the territorial integrity of what they view as China or something called the nine dash line. And I don't want to get into all that, but that's the point. So while I was at Air War College, I'm writing my paper after Dr. Zhang, no longer my advisor, I get across my Twitter feed that uh, China, uh, or what was happening with the Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China. Have you guys know, have you heard that story about ethnic cleansing slash genocide slash whatever up in the northwestern portion of China? So that came across the LA Times feed, seven o'clock in the morning, right? Eight o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting with, in class next to my in, uh, good friend from the State Department who's from New York. I'm from LA, she's from New York. So she had read a similar article in the New York Times. There were two headlines that morning when I left my house. The first headline was about the Uyghurs. The second headline was Hong Kong electing a pro-democracy mayor. A pro-democracy mayor compromises one, two, and three, right? Pretty simple. You can see how it threatens the party, threatens economic prosperity, and obviously it, it threatens the territory. But the Uyghurs, nothing, right? It doesn't hit any of those three. Okay, so an hour later, I go to show Christy uh, the LA Times story, and it's not on the front page of Google anymore, or it's not on the, the headline of the LA Times or the New York Times either. We had to Google it, it's on the bottom of the first page of Google. Interesting. An hour and a half later, after we get out of lecture, I go to show Dr. Murphy, my new thesis advisor. It's on the fifth page of Google, two and a half hours after I originally saw it. Okay, that's interesting. So we detected it, right? Dust detected it, but why? Why would they obfuscate one, but not the other? Anybody have any ideas? You don't get to talk. Anybody have any ideas? Well, I would think that, uh, well, in my opinion, I think that uh, they, they, want, they want us to, uh, I think, be more tied to it. Um, and I think that, uh, from from a Taiwan like standpoint, um, you know how much we rely on them. It's much more important um, to Americans for uh, a more free Taiwan than whatever they're doing mm. in, in mainland proper. You know? Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. But but I I'll tell you I, I ran through iteration after, after iteration after iteration of my brain. Now remember I'm writing my thesis on this at the time, so I'm trying to understand why one versus the other. And then Dr. Murphy two weeks later walks in and she hands me a news article from the South, uh, South China Daily News, right? About Huawei and how they just completed a multi-billion-dollar sale of Huawei 5G to Indonesia. What's, what are, what's the, probably the most profound thing about Indonesia? Muslim country? It is the largest Muslim country in the world. The Uyghurs in Xinjiang are, are what faith? Muslim. They're Muslim. Why would they not want to rock the apple cart for a multi-billion dollar sale to a Muslim country when they are committing pseudo-genocide on Muslims? That's the understand piece, right? But now comes the security, and this is where you all fall in. How do we protect our algorithms, right? From that type of influence mechanism. How do we stop the young ladies, 50 cent army, millions upon millions upon millions of retweets, right? How do we protect our, our algorithms, our data, right? How do we secure it? That's where you all come in. But if you don't understand what was discovered and understand why, 
how are you going to know where to go look? I, I've looked at a lot of solar winds, you know, things, and, and finding where a vulnerability is happening is pretty hard to do if you don't know why it's coming and when it's coming. But to do that, you have to have an awareness on a global scale much broader than your current sector. Does that make sense? So that's the secure piece. Now, the T piece is the fun piece, and that's what I get to do, and that's the target I'm back, right? I would have loved to have been able to take the images of what we had from China, from the IC, the Intel community, and push those directly either through the State Department or through the media, straight in Indonesia in the middle of that sale. That would have been a lot of fun for me, right? And we've had a lot of success with that in the Ukraine, excuse me, in Ukraine over the last two years. We call them false flag events, but fundamentally what it is is we had discovered through intelligence channels actions an adversary was going to take, and then we publicized those to stop those actions, right? We took a technical capability that we use to create a cognitive reaction because we weren't sitting in our cybersecurity stovepipes, right? Does that make sense? Right? So hopefully you all are going to go out and go talk to your friends that are in their MBAs, and you're going to talk to your friends that are sociocultural studies or you know, foreign linguists, like get in their head and find out what they need to know so that you can find out how you're going to protect it, right? Because it's that convergence that's going to make us successful. All right. Uh, oh, predatory tourism. So this one's a fun one. This was a new one from when Dr. Bell and I went to Tinian last year. Yeah. I didn't go. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But I told you about it when I got back. So uh, predatory, had, any got, anybody got an idea what that might actually be? Predatory tourism. OK. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm just going to be quick with this. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's a lot of islands that rely on tourism to live, right? One of them is the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, CNMI, right? So they have a whole bunch of hotels. They rely on Chinese and Japanese tourists primarily in order to, to fund their economy, right? Well, when COVID happened, the People's Republic of China bought out every hotel room on that island for a year. Now, here's an interesting thing about CNMI. It's one of the last places that still represent or recognizes Taiwan. So at the end of that year, the PRC envoy went to the governor of the CNMI and said, if you no longer recognize Taiwan, we will continue to buy your hotel rooms. Predatory tourism. That was the first time I'd ever heard of that construct, right? But, but, it's, but that's what it is. All right, what else? Come on. This is fun. Sir. I just want to go back to the interview when that happened, or the Sony and the bad movie. At the end of the day, did anything really come out of it other than just chest thumping? From whom? Either side. I mean, I'm sure there were some policy changes and things like that, obviously. But even then, throughout the industry of IT or cybersecurity. Yeah, so I will tell you there. There was quite a bit more attention on insider threats um, in the immediate fallout. And unfortunately, we have to go into the skiff and talk about what actually happened. But the bottom line is uh, insider threat and understanding who you hired and where they came from and who they worked for and who they're maybe being pressured by comes into play. Right? When you look at what, Go what Google's doing now with that fictitious event I described earlier, uh, let's just say they're being a lot more attentive into their employees' uh, social interactions. Is that fair without getting me in trouble? Are you tracking what I'm saying? OK. So there's an, there was a, uh, there's a great book out there called Active Measures. right? In the late 80s, President um, Reagan commissioned something called the Active Measures Working Group, which was a, an integration program between the CIA, the State Department, Commerce, Treasury, and the DOD to look for malign influence domestically and how to eradicate it. And I was focused on the Soviets, right? But we're back to the point now we're talking about how do we do that today, right? How to, and the one who's leading kind of that charge is the UK. 
because they, this is Vic Norse's opinion, not opinion of the, obviously the United Kingdom, because I'm not from the United Kingdom. But, but there was a lot of malign, malign, shady stuff with surrounding Brexit, right? And the decision and when it was made and, and how that environment was particularly manipulated, right? What we're seeing is on a global scale, a higher level of focus on how do we compete in, with, across all domains, but with a focus on the cognitive. Does that make sense? All right. What else? Just kind of along the lines of predatory tourism, in your opinion, you know, China's also made a lot of uh, foreign investment that mm. is predatory. Yep. So, you know, how do we combat that? You know, and domestically you know, or globally? So domestically, the, have you all ever heard of CFIUS, counting foreign investment in the United States? So uh, while Dr. Bell and I were at school, uh, there's a, there's a, in, in Hampton Roads, there's a, a former army fort called Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe is right where the mouth of the um, James River comes in where all the carriers are based, right? So Fort Monroe's right there on the edge, right, as the river comes in to, to the port. Five aircraft carriers are stationed there. Yes. Five of the 10 we have. Big deal, right? So China tried to buy Fort Monroe. And they were almost there. They were like this close before Cepheus caught them. And you're like, oh, shoot. That, OK, I can understand that, right? There was another one Cepheus caught that scared me more, right? Uh, stealth War by Dr. Spaulding, or General Spaulding, which I don't endorse him completely, but his book is good. He can be a little bit of a fear monger if you go to read it, right? And we actually know him well, so. But uh, Cepheus stopped them from buying the Des Moines Register. Alibaba made an attempt to buy the Des Moines Register. And they did successfully get out several ads that looked like real articles, right? Um, one of the scariest ones was actually an article in the LA Times. In the immediate aftermath of COVID, there was an article that came out about the rising, uh, anti -A or rising Asian hate crimes the day after President Trump called it the Wuhan virus, right? What was interesting about the, that article is that article was written by a lady who never existed. It was actually written in Shanghai and published in the LA Times like it was a USC alumnus, right? That's the stuff that scares me, because how do you find that, right? Now, on a global scale, I don't have an answer. Inside the US, it falls in CIS's job jar, which is unfortunately a really big job jar, and it falls under CFIUS. And then it falls under another organization called the NCIJTF. It's DHS. I can't remember what it, National Counterintelligence Joint Task Force. Yeah, there you go. Right, that's how they get after and look for things domestically. OK. Come on, one more. And then I have one more slide to kind of wrap it up. Stories, questions, what's on your mind? Do you think I'm just this old colonel who's a fear monger? Go ahead. What stopped you guys from targeting back and releasing some of that intel on Indonesia? Because it already happened. The sale had been finalized, right? Too we caught it too late. Yeah. And, and to be honest, uh, I, we actually never caught it. We didn't catch it until almost a year later when Dr. Murphy then moved up to NDU, right? And she, she briefed the National Security Council on the events looking backwards, right? I would, uh, I guess my question is, um, we tend to talk a lot about what other countries are doing to the U.S., but we don't tend to talk about what the U.S. We, we have plenty of capabilities. We have uh, most advanced military, um, but all for the most part, all we hear is they're bad, they're bad, they're doing this to us, they're doing this to us. Yes, they are. What are we doing to them? How are we, because if you look at the objectives, like you mentioned, of China, those aren't unreasonable objectives for a country to have. I mean, we, the United States has very similar mm -hmm. you know, objectives, right? So, you know, 
when we're constantly hearing that, and we get it told to us all the time um, from all over, but especially like the United States government. So like, if you look at what we're supposed to think of Russia and what we're supposed to think of China, uh, they're our enemies, and that's where we're constantly being told. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's hard too because when we when we go and meet people from these areas, we find lots in common. Yeah. But we're not being, you know, that's not the conversation that's going on, especially in the in the U.S. Um, so, you know, I guess more of the question is like, this is a this is a battle that every major state does. Um, you know, how and, and how do we I don't know, in a way solve, especially with disinformation and misinformation, um, it's going to continue to come at us. Mm -hmm. and it, but at the same time, you know, we're going to continue to do it to other countries. Yeah, so, so when does, how do we Yeah, so, so here's, here's to kind of put a, bun, a bow on this, there's a, there's a good book out there called Our Man in Tehran, right? And Our Man in Tehran is about the lead up to the, uh, have you ever seen Argo? Who's here, have heard of the movie Argo, right? So it's the lead up to that scenario told from the perspective of the Canadian uh, ambassador who was in Tehran at the time. What makes that book so fascinating is it walks through how Iran was partitioned post-World War II all the way up into the fall of the Shah and us putting certain people in power and the CIA and all of that stuff that I think you're getting after, right? And then how that influenced Iranian perceptions that we're still dealing with today. It's important for us to understand the context that led into the situation we're in today instead of just complaining, right? We talk about the century of humiliation, the opium wars, and all that we have done to China or maybe the UK, which are lack of a better term, blood brothers and sisters, right, have done, they view us as the same, right? So understanding that is hugely important. Understanding uh, Russia and why all having buffer states is so important. If you just read Revenge of Geography and realize Russia is the most invaded nation that has ever existed, right? And that's why they feel the way they do. But that goes back to that being culturally aware, right? I think you're spot on. Now, I could go into what we're doing, but not in this audience but understanding that, that we are not completely devoid of responsibility in many of these conflicts, right? And that's actually a great segue in getting me into my uh, last slide, right? So I, I talked about the retreat from Kabul at the very beginning. So in 1842, uh, one, of the, one of the names of Afghanistan is where empires go to die, right? So there were 6,000 British soldiers in Kabul in 1842 as part of a British invasion. 6,000 soldiers and roughly 14, thir numbers vary, roughly between 13 to 14,000 men, women, and children that were not soldiers were there with them as well. Everything went to crap, right? The general was killed. They then tried to escape. They thought they had agreements with the tribes to get out of there. Out of the six, the roughly 19,000 total people that were in Kabul uh, at the beginning of 1842, Dr. Bill Bryson is the only one that made it to Jalalabad. The rest were killed, right? Because they had no concept of what was happening at that time. They were so focused on the goals without an understanding of the cultural context with which they were living. Now, I don't say this to scare you. I say this just to give you a realization that if we are not aware of all aspects of what we call the PAMISI, the political, military, economic, social, yada, 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 environment, then we are doomed to repeat it, right? That type of failure. And we lose the opportunity to advocate. What's that? Abigate. Yeah. Yeah, Abigate. That's right. Um, that's where the most were killed, right? And so I throw one last thing out at you for all you cybersecurity experts. When we look at intellectual property theft, I am sick and tired of hearing that the fact that a J-20 looks like an F-22 is the threat. No. 
If I walked into any of your dorm rooms and I saw blueprints for a bank vault on your, on your, on your desks, unless you're a civil engineering major, I don't think you're trying to build a better bank vault. I think you're trying to figure out how to get into that bank vault. Intellectual property theft means our adversaries understand the inside of our technology better than we do. That's your challenge now as cybersecurity experts going forward, is protecting against that, right? Because our adversaries know how to get in and they know what they need to do. We do have the best cyber dudes in the world, 100% believe that. But if we remain in our silo and are not aware of the world around us, then you're not going to be able to protect against a supply chain threat that you can't see because you've never had a known good piece of software or hardware that has been tested to the nets, whatever. Right? Does that make sense? So that's your task going forward. And, and I use all my time, so I apologize. But uh, thank you for your time, and you all have a great day.
they have a fellows program too, and I kind of asked her about that. Yeah. Yeah, making connections, it's good. It's always good when you have lots of questions afterwards as well. It's awesome. So for those of you who were in the room when I introduced uh, Colonel Vic Norris, uh, we had known each other about four or five years. Well, with Colonel Retired C.L. Alford, we've known each other about nine years, uh, yeah. I would say. And when I first started teaching in the Joint Advanced Warfighting School, uh, he was in my first class, so he was one of my very first students. At that time, I had come from another program where I had been running an elective called the National Intelligence Community, NIC, and at the time in JAWS, Joint Advanced Warfighting School, there were no classified electives. And he's the person who said to me, this is a big gap, you should really think about solving this. So. I did. I, that very next year, I created this elective that I had mentioned, so cyber, cyberspace, intelligence information, and space considerations, um, and that was his suggestion. And that, to this day, runs. In fact, whenever Vic came on board, he helped me run it or ran it. I helped him, whichever, whichever one. Uh, he, he ended up taking it over, really. And, uh, but that was, that was C.L. Alford. The other thing that I will say is whenever he found out that I got this job here, he was like, hey, Mary, you should do this. You should do this. And he gave me, I don't know, three, four suggestions that, no kidding, as dean, I have implemented. So he's a lot of times my good idea guy, and nobody knows that because nobody know, has met him before. But he has these good <laughs> ideas, and he knows somebody who can implement them. So he gives me these fantastic ideas. So I publicly wanted to say thank you so much for giving me so many great <laughs> ideas including like we started this Dean uh, Distinguished Speaker Series, that was his idea. It's like, you should emulate what they do at National Defense University and start your own series. So I got funding, I was able to do things like that, which is one of the reasons we were able to get uh, Jen Easterlies as a director here today, was uh, uh, his idea. And then he even gave me her name and her contact. So again, uh, just, just great, great context there. So again, he's a retired Air Force Colonel. Uh, in fact, was he, was he your boss at some time, No, Vic? but he's the one who pushed me to Joss. Okay, so he was he managed all the cyber warfare. I don't know what the exact right terminology is. 18 deltas, right? For yeah, sub 17, 17 deltas. deltas for the Air Force. Uh, he did that in the Pentagon for a while. So everybody in the cyber career field for the Air Force, he actually managed their careers or had a whole team, but he oversaw that team to do so, one of which was Vic, to get him assigned to us in Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. So uh, just an incredible person, uh, great friend, and, uh, and the one thing that I know that he and my nephew have great in common is they, they love beer <laughs> and uh, loves a good beer. So if, you know, if you're- I do. He sees him out later. It's like the the one and only social media thing that he will do is, and what's it called? It's like a beer website. Um. Untapped. Untapped, like the, the untapped. He, like, he, that's the one and only social media thing he can do. And my nephew's the same way. He's like, yeah, I, I don't get on social media. Except that's the one thing. <laughs> now that he retired, he's actually on LinkedIn. Yeah. So if you have interest, uh, both of them, you can connect with them on LinkedIn. And if you connect with me and you can't find them, you could connect with me and you'll find them as well. So without further ado, thank you so much again for flying to South Dakota. I don't. Had you ever been here before? Uh, that's a no. Never been to South Dakota. Neither one of them had been. And I, I, everybody thought it was a little bit crazy when I took this job, but now that they've he seen and heard and been on campus, it's just infectious and contagious, the things that you're all doing, and we appreciate you being here, um, and we're excited to have you, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me and, and inviting me here. Um, five months ago, this good idea um, to come out here, it met with some realities of, of this week. Um, uh, of my day job, but uh, I still endeavored uh, to, to get here, including my boss calling me this morning. He, I mean, or texting me, he goes, you're in South Dakota. I didn't tell him I was coming here. I didn't really think it was his business, but somebody else did. So I went ahead and confirmed my, my presence here and how warm it was and how excited it was, to be, how excited I was to be here. Again, Mary, uh, thank you. And uh, she told you a few things about me. Again, Carlos Alford, United States Air Force, 30 years um, I uh, did this. I told Vic the other day I was a little bit uh, intimidated about uh, coming here. Um, he's extrovert, as you can see, and I don't consider myself an extrovert, but I told him I was, uh, 
a personnel guy disguised as a cyber guy, disguised as an IT guy. And, and that's kind of what I consider myself. Personnel is my passion, workforce development and cyber force development. As, as Mary, Mary said, I managed the cyber force for the Air Force for a, a couple years um, in different positions. I'm, I'm told about six or seven years doing, doing different roles in that. So um, uh, I've, I've enjoyed, I enjoyed serving. Um, I'm just at, I'm at one year and two weeks since I've retired from the United States Air Force. And I've worked, done things like worked, uh, I worked for the White House uh, and, and their communications agency. And my last job when I retired, I worked at the 89th Airlift Support Group or 89th Airlift Wing. Uh, the blue and white jets that uh, fly the president, vice president, and other uh, senior officials. So, you didn't work for it. He commanded, <laughs> so, he commanded the unit. Uh, so I, I, commanded the 80, <laughs> I commanded the 89th Airlift Support Group. And so, again, it, it, I, I feel so blessed. Um, with some of the things she's saying, and all I've ever tried to do was just help and make it better. I am flawed with having ideas. They're not always good. Occasionally they, they, they work out, but uh, I am one of those folks that do uh, try to generate uh, ideas and, and think a little bit differently. I put some slides together. They, they're mildly interesting for a bunch like this, uh, but uh, I put the disclaimer. <laughs> I put the disclaimer. This is just me, you know, just going to tell you a little bit about a mission that I'm part of right now um, and one that I've been passionate about having worked in, um, in the mobility uh, arena for uh, some time. And right now, as you see, my, my role, um, I've been doing this like it's, I've been doing this just about a year. I retired, you know, like I said, a year ago, and I've been doing this about 11 months. And I'm the program manager for the Managed Information Technology Services contract at U.S. Transcom. And so I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, what, what they do there and then some of the challenges that they face. And I just wanted to be able to tell the story in the sense so you could see some of those challenges because I know the amount of brain power that's here and you might see some things that resonate with you and um, say, hey, I think I have some ideas on that, on how we can fix that or want to be part of that mission. So Transcom Anywhere, as I tell the story, you'll see why it's Transcom Anywhere and, 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 the, importance of, and the importance of everything working anywhere. Yeah, like I said, mildly interesting. So Transcom Mission and, uh, and, their, and their priorities, right? It's, uh, it's one of the 11 combat commands. Of, how many people are familiar with this organization at all? Oh, that's more than I thought, to be, be very, very honest, and which is why I wanted to tell that story. Um, but we don't get to the fight without this command. There's just no, there's no way around it, right, with what they do. So you, I won't read anything to you, but, you know, you just take a look, uh, you know, at that mission and then at the priorities, and I'll, I'll let you imagine which priority we'll probably, you know, talk a little bit more about or I'll highlight a little more uh, for you all. So um, the component commands that uh, support U.S. Transportation Command, uh, the Surface Deployment Command, Sea Lift Command, and uh, Air, Air Mobility Command, as well as the JEC, which is a little bit of an odd duck in, the, in this uh, series, but they are aligned to a Transcom. And I, I like to think of them as my, uh, my professional planners uh, for all of the joint community, for all, all of the combat commands, which is what they do. And they often, based on some of our collected history, they take graduates from the Joint Advanced Warfighting School, which specializes in operational planning and strategy, and they help uh, guide and mentor a lot of the efforts uh, in the command. So, The Global Distribution Network. So six distinct missions, but uh, air, air, if you see, if you remember just a few seconds ago, uh, the component commands, right? Um, air, um, sea, right? And uh, land, air, air, sea, and land. And um, think about all the things that are involved. And you'd be surprised. We'll have a, 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 a quiz you later on, on which command actually has more ships, um, you'd, <laughs> which is interesting in itself, uh, having seen and, and heard this story uh, uh, many times. But it, all of that, um, that, that network is how stuff gets around um, to serve the warfighters. Uh, critical, uh, absolutely critical. 
And uh, what I like to say, or, or what I'm aware of, and you're probably aware of, a lot of times when the president comes to the podium and he's talking about what we're going to do as a nation, this machine is already, already in motion and it's happening. And many times we have troops already where he's talking about going, or at least pre-positioned. Here's what the command's doing on any given day. Right, so very diverse. You see the ships, air, patients, uh, defense couriers, which everybody doesn't know that's part of this command. I think of defense couriers. I think Mission Impossible. I think briefcase chained to your arm, you know, and them taking secret messages, you know, wherever they need to be, delivering from embassies to other, other places. Um, vehicles, if you're familiar with the military, they move the uh, vehicles from... Uh, uh, overseas to CONUS uh, for families, or CONUS to CONUS, or oh, not CONUS to CONUS, but O CONUS to O CONUS, Pacific to, to Europe. But yeah, that's what's happening. That's what this command is doing. And I, I find it incredible that they're able to do all of this stuff. And, um, and it's kind of a bunch of miracles happening uh, every, every day. Because we haven't talked about this, right? So. Uh, this is what we've done, or we, the command has done uh, for our, our allied partners in Europe and one country in, in particular, as, as you might guess, right? And what makes this important, you can look at those numbers of the things that are happening. Obviously, we didn't deliver anything. The, the, the command didn't deliver anything directly in country, delivered it to um, Poland, and from Poland it got in there, but they did this, right? And if you look at the advances that uh, Russia made um, and they were making, if you go back and look when things stalled for the uh, Russian army or the military force, it's when U.S. Transcom and the United States via U.S. Transcom put all that whoop ass right in Poland and they were able to get it on train right to, to uh, Ukraine. And then that's when uh, things stopped and the, and the tide started to turn. And that's what I find impressive, and uh, it really gives you a sense of mission knowing that you were part of this and knowing that I'm uh, part of this. And my part is essentially as an IT service delivery, cybersecurity kind of uh, person and, and helping lead, lead that effort, but knowing that that's happening. And so, like I said, go back and look and see when it stops. That's when this, this stuff was happening and getting there. So for the joint distribution uh, deployment uh, distribution enterprise, these are some of the challenges, right? I mean, there's a lot. And then within that, right, so the, a big one, one of the priorities is to, to drive cyber domain mission assurance. And, and that, and under those four elements. And so those are the things that I, I want you all to think about and what you all uh, could bring to the table as some of the smart folks uh, in, our, in our community. Uh, Oh, you always can ask questions. Oh, oh, you, you meant you. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. How does this overlap with what, for that part specifically, with Cybercom's mission? So they're, so they're I, I consider they're complementary, right? So Cyber Command um, is the coordinator of, of all of these things, right? I consider uh, Cyber Command primarily the coordinator for offensive cyber operations, defensive cyber operations through uh, Joint Force Headquarters, Doden, orchestrates all of the defensive efforts. Um, more, more distributed, I would say, whereas offensive cyber operations is more centralized. But the defensive efforts, based on the, the vast uh, uh, nature of the, uh, of, the, of the Doden or the defense uh, enterprise, is pretty vast. So they're op we're, we, the, the command, is operating not independently, but they're, they're taking care of their portion of the, of the Doden. But really, the challenge for this for this organization, right? You go back to the other slide. I go back to this. All this equipment going into Poland. It's going in on public. These are public companies that are delivering this stuff, right? It's on a public rail network. All getting all that equipment. You're telling companies, hey, we're getting ready to bring a lot of stuff into this country so that the folks can be ready to receive it. All of that's more or less open networks, not on DOD network. That's what really this challenge is all about in this, in this enterprise. It, and so I would say Cyber Command, Cyber Command has a role in that as well as uh, NSA, 
right? Understanding and being able to defend, um, or I say defend, but really protect that information. But you're only as uh, strong as your weakest link, right? And so a lot of these are mom and pop trucking companies that are, you know, got a government contract. Uh, do we think they have a robust cyber network which they're operating off of? You know, getting, maybe they are, I, I don't think so. Right, so, oh, sorry. But that, that's where I think there's that, that cyber command plays a role is really orca through Joint Force Headquarters, Doden is a defensive lead uh, coordinating all these efforts. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Uh oh. Oh. Yeah, he's my. It was 50 50 if I set it up right, so clearly I didn't. I'm just, every day's a struggle. Oh. It's a learning opportunity. Yeah, I, every day. I, what I didn't do, I'm, I'm a poli sci major. I didn't want to, I just figured I'd share that with you. <laughs> no. While he's working on that, I'll say whenever um, we had our student class, pervasively, everybody's the person you do not want to anger is CL. Like, I feel confident my bank zero, my bank account is zero. I set it up bad. Yep, I embedded it in there. That's what I thought I did. It's, it's He's a good friend to have. Yeah. 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 In a skip, we could talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Nothing unclassified. But I just had one of those, uh, where are your troops and can I go in? No, don't sweat it. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen that Saturday Night Live video, it's worth watching. It's, it's uh, Dick T, isn't it? Anyway, watch that one. But yeah. keep going. Again, from an unclassified level, it, for us, it's really interesting to hear because we don't get to hear uh, you know, some of those capabilities sometimes. Um, you know, again, yeah, and I, I think it's I think it's public, I, you, not cyber tech stuff. That's VIX uh, specialty, but just from a general connectivity standpoint and being able to, to defend the platforms, I don't think there's anything secret about that, right? Again, this is part of the story. We need to be able to defend those uh, platforms, and and most of that is down at the service level. When I talk, when we talk about aircraft, that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, there are efforts. I know Vic was in a unit uh, that had to defend their aircraft, and I was in a similar unit in the had to defend their aircraft. And so that's still in a maturation uh, process, at least from my view. Uh, but I know the service is, is working hard and, and Vic's actually responsible for doing some of that stuff now in his, in his role, is really uh, resourcing that capability uh, to more robustly defend um, our aircraft. Um, and I'll, again, these are, these are interesting, but I, I worked at the 89th, again, presidential uh, airlifts uh, support. You know, you got Air Force One, Air Force Two, or, or whatever you want to call them, right? The, our, system, our system is built on trust. Our, everything we do is built on trust. I mean, uh, undersea cables just come up on the beach. They're, they're, not guarded, they're not protected. Our aircraft, it beacons out, tail number, tells you exactly where they're, you know, not where they're going, but you can flight follow them, right? You can, I got an app, it'll tell you this is so-and-so, and, it, and it's headed here from point A to point B. That's, that's, a, a, that's gotta be a culture shift if it's important. Um, and I know there's some challenges that, are, uh, that we face with that, where we get into deception and all, all that stuff, which is not the goal. We're just trying to protect uh, folks' lives, right? Do we want everybody tracking where the president's going? I mean, directly, yes, he's going to a, a conference, he's going to the G7 or whatever. Sure, we know that's happening, but do you really want somebody to be able to follow um, step by step? And so those are things that I think have to be considered. And C-17s, right, we, we're waiting on the C-17 to, so we know when to load it. And, you know, instead of calling over, you know, to ops, my guys would just put on, oh, I mean, they just pull up a public app and go, oh, yeah, it's, it'll be landing in about 10 minutes. That's awful. I mean, it's good. It was good to know, but it was, 
But think about it, that's awful. Public app, faster than calling over to our own ops to know when, it, when it's coming. That's, it was, it was frustrating, like I said, but when I you know, watched my, my team do it, I was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, so I mean, it really was. So, video is really just uh, General, General Van Ovost, who's the commander of United States Transportation Command, uh, talking about the importance of, of, of this, of this uh, cyber domain mission assurance, really. And I think just based on this conference, you all know, you, you all know that importance. Um, and, and that's really the, down at the bottom, you, you see the quote, we, we have to protect these, the networks that, that serve this enterprise. It's absol absolutely essential. Again, like I said, it's, this command, every command is important, they'll tell you. CENTCOM's the best, they're doing everything right now. But if you're watching news right now, what, what, what's happening right now? What's being airdropped uh, into that area right now? Right, so it's CENTCOM's AOR, but TRANSCOM is uh, serving it, plain and simple, putting food in place, taking, taking care of folks. Um, whether it's a uh, natural disaster, you pick it. They're, they're able, to, they're able to, to get there. But again, all of that's happening in public space, and that drives uh, being able to uh, protect this domain, or the requirement to protect this domain. One of the big, one of the big challenges, you know, I highlighted a few things and uh, some of the subjects that have, uh, you know, have been uh, spoken about uh, earlier today, uh, for sure. You know, whether it's AI, ML, uh, predictive analysis, trying to pivot to where the bad folks are, are uh, going to uh, try to try to take us down. And I, so we, I, the, the country, needs your expertise. And how can you help help protect? That's again, that's what I want want you all to to think about as you look at some of these uh, look at some of these uh, challenges. Um, if you understand, like I said, if you know that. Everything we do or everything is public, you know, we load an aircraft and, you know, you fight follow it. You know, China or, I'm sorry, not China, one of our major adversaries, you know, they're trying to stop this stuff from getting from point A to point B, equipment wise, right? And so, if they stop this, then their success in war goes up. Like I said, Russia found out the hard way. They were moving fast and hard and then until, until they weren't. It takes about 12 days for the machine to get, get, get everything there via ship, be an air ship, be land, air, and sea. So, but yeah, I just wanted to highlight some of, this, some of these things and be able to you know, take a look at that from your perspective. And here's the three other areas. Um, that I'd like you to consider, and you know, I just highlight in blue, it's a lot of words, but really highlight in blue things I wanted you to take a, a closer look at. Technical solutions, that's what, again, that's what I look at you all for. You all might have a solution right in your, right in your head, um, or as you work through some of your projects, or thesis, uh, things like that. I just give you some ideas on, on uh, some of the enterprise to take a look at. But indicators and warnings are, are essential. We got to understand uh, where the where the threats are coming for or will come from before they come. Whew. How many people have heard of zero trust? Oh, thank. You. Oh, that's awesome. You probably know it better than I do. Um, is this part of the academic? Uh, it is built into. Oh, that's sweet. So I mean, that's like three slides. We don't even have to talk about. Uh, so a lot. This is a lot, right? And so in my current job where I feel like I, I contribute but need to do better uh, to fulfill the requirements of zero trust are the network environment and devices, right? Like I said, I run the network for US Trans Command. When I say I, I have a team of 171 folks that run the, run the network. I do a lot of personnel stuff, fire people, hire people, stuff like that. But, um, but those, are, those, are, uh, those are what I consider my bread and butter. They're all important. Um, but I'm trying to get better for myself, the team, at, to, for the command. And so, so the network and environment pillar, uh, absolutely essential. And we are just talking about this at an un, unreasonable time of day, but we we end up talking about this along with um, some other key partners with uh, the uh, ops, the ops uh, lead, uh, 
and the cyber defense lead or the CSSP, excuse me, cyber service, cyber, cyber security service provider uh, for the command. And so we're talking about how this, these, these uh, actions are very important and we're always looking for uh, expertise, both as an individual company, small business or otherwise that can help us implement some of these things, right? And uh, when we get into um, you know, macro and micro segmentation, um, software defined networks, SDN, all of that, all of those type of things will help us better secure our network. And the idea is that a lot of this will lead us towards um, uh, being able to talk directly to our uh, partners, our, our commercial partners, Transcom's commercial partners, which is 90% of, of who they talk to, um, to to make the mission happen. What can you all tell me about Zero Trust, about this pillar? Anybody, this is, is, it, is this anybody's bread and butter, this pillar? Networks? No? I do have a lot of problems with data flow mapping. It drives me nuts. But, uh, because <laughs> so often we do, a, we have a lot of people, uh, even a lot of our admins will to walk me through your data flow. Right. And they'll just go, I don't know, I just keep the server running. I'm like, yeah, but what's your data flow right. through there? Yeah, so capturing that, capturing the data flow is, is foundational to moving on to those, to those other three. You really can't be successful at the other three if you don't understand your, your data flow. So th thank you. You all got, I, I got to do better or I need more questions. <laughs> and devices, oh, devices, proliferated. I don't know how many people have any, I mean us personally as humans, we have a lot. Um, in the command, individuals, leaders uh, have a bunch. We're adding more. Uh, we're adding more every day. Um, one of my, one of our key responsibilities is um, identifying and inventorying all of the items that are connect to the enterprise, which is a daunting, um, a daunting job. We do it through something called the configuration management database, uh, which is a bear. Uh, been at it for about five months just trying to capture all, all of this correctly, right? So we know that we are tracking what's supposed to be on the enterprise. Anybody know why I hi highlighted hardware updates and software patches as opposed to anything else? I mean, it's hard to have those updates and patches rolled out if you don't know what you have. That, that's one. But what's the, what's the primary threat vector, right? I mean, out of all the complex ways that our adversary could get at us. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I get, a, I get an update, you know, a couple times a week, but this is it's known stuff, stuff where we haven't done our part. And for me, on the other side, in, my, in the blue suit, I, you know, it was always important. On this side, m my job is in jeopardy. So it gets kind of more serious for me. Like, our job is to make sure all the servers uh, are patched and all the devices are, are patched, right? And, and you, you can only guess who the biggest culprit, uh, at least on, on the, I'll say on the device side, small device side, we'll say cell phones, uh, our team, because they don't, they don't use them. I mean, they have one, they take it, they forward it, they put it in a, in a Faraday bag, they leave it somewhere, and then they change it out, you know, every time somebody else is on standby. And then my, my team that actually monitors the, uh, uh, the, the currency of, of the patches and software for the phones, they said, hey, they did an you know, announcement, say, hey. They narrowed it down. It was like the only people remaining were the people on our team. And so that was uh, a bit frustrating for me. I mean, they got it all, they got it all done, at, done in a week, but the fact that we cyber folks sometimes are the uh, worst culprits uh, in this area. But yeah, that's still the, the easiest uh, path for our, for our adversary. All those other things, again, actively trying to get that squared away for our network. Uh, when I walked into Transcom like 11 months ago, like I said, and just it, within a week, I'm like, we're still operating in 1983. And I, it, was, it was amazing to me um, from an infrastructure standpoint, which is outdated, from a device standpoint, um, outdated, 
And so, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're part of that team now is they wanna, want us to help, help them modernize all, all of this stuff, the infrastructure and, and the uh, processes and procedures that, we, that we've got going on. And when you ask why, um, you know, there's really not a good, there's really not a good answer. Um, we got things like VDI, everybody here familiar with VDI. I've been to other commands, CENTCOM, NORTHCOM, they all had VDI. I, when I came back, I said, hey, how come we don't have VDI? Um, and they're like, well, we tried that like eight years ago. It didn't work real well. And that, that was it. That was, that was the answer. So we're actively taking steps to make that part of our, uh, our, part of our refresh uh, and, it, and modernization for both the main um, facility where Transcom operates out of on Scott Air Force Base, and as well as you might imagine, there's a numerous alternate facilities for which they need to operate. And I think you can think about the efficiencies and security opportunities associated with um, um, that modernization. Yeah. So, so I have a question. So we, we've, we've talked a lot about networks. Yep. What about platform IT? What about like robots and f uh, factories and not just SCADA, and we're talking about air conditioning and power, mm -hmm. but like those systems, because that directly correlates into what I'm trying to get after protecting things that fly in the air. Right. So when I, I think about that, I'm you know, not necessarily from this job, but when I think about it as it ties to Transcom, that's where I feel like uh, Cyber Command um, would at least um, own most of that. But then down at the base level, um, I, I'm not sure that our civil, civil engineering squadrons are, are there, uh, civil engineering squadron who maintains all the infrastructure on most uh, Air Force bases anyway, or something similar uh, for other services. I don't think they're all there. I know they are making advancements in that area, I think of uh, the school, uh, Idaho Labs, right? Uh, we've been sending, or we, the Air Force, they, now, I'm tired. Yeah, the, the, those people, the Air, the Air Force had been sending uh, folks to um, Idaho Labs, specializing in SCADA systems for quite some, uh, at least 15 years. And then when I was in the, the role as the, um, uh, the career field manager, I asked the CE folks, I go, how come you all aren't sending anybody to these? They're like, we can send people to that? And so we um, started trying to work, work a deal. I don't, honestly don't know what came of it, but bringing it to their attention was just, I, I, it was a giant step because they, they understood that need. They, they have to pivot too, because not, everything's not analog anymore. So they understand that, that need to make the pivot. But I think there's more that needs to be done. And I believe, if I'm, um, I believe they have learned some things in how they rebuilt Tyndall in, in that regard with uh, more security in mind. And Tyndall, if you're not familiar, it got whoosh, wiped off the map down in, uh, down, but down in the panhandle. And, yeah, by, by a hurricane. And so they were going to build that like the base of the future to consider all of the things um, from the ground up, from uh, cybersecurity, uh, both infrastructure uh, and, and network standpoint. So think about things like 3D printing. Right, and, and those those uh, modern logistics systems. Right. So, if any of you are working in those areas, we are very interested uh, in that those skills coming on because in the future, that's where the jobs are going to be. Right. Who's going to be the one maintaining those robots? Who's maintaining that artificial intelligence that's driving all that? Right. All of that additive manufacturing stuff that's coming around the corner. That's a huge area, not just the internet and emails and server farms and things of that nature. That's all coming along. It's that new next step that I'm interested in hearing. Just to pig, oh. piggyback off of what you were saying, sir, I can say from the uh, Navy side, uh, the CNO just designated a new MOS called uh, Robotics Warfare. So. I don't know if the other branches are following suit with that. But I haven't heard that this one. This new MOS is supposed to deal with uh, drones, autonomous technology, AI, and that sort of thing. And also, I know that uh, as far as 3D printing goes, the, the Navy's been working on that for years. Yep. Because if we can print something at sea, yep. then, then we don't have to have MSC bring it out to yep. us. We can repair a ship. While we're in an active engagement, you know, it's um, it's a game changer. Yeah, that's pretty good. I have seen some of the the uh, 3D printing. We can also do medical supplies. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to comment, and this is kind of people that are in school and stuff. 
that very first bullet. Um, yeah. I think if you're, if you're new to the field, you probably think that's the easiest thing you can do. If you have a larger organization, <laughs> it is the absolute hardest thing you will ever have to do to identify what you've got out there, what, what your inventory is, what they're running, you know, what apps are supported by these servers, what servers, you know, what, I mean, that's the hardest thing out there. If you can't get to that first stage, everything else is playing catch up around that, because you're constantly finding stuff that's like, oh, I didn't know we had that. Um, yeah. So it's just like a huge. Yeah, so you, you, since you brought that up, right? <laughs> I have a young lady back in uh, O'Fallon, in Illinois, Scott Air Force Base, trying to get all the inventories for all the, all this. This is all manual right now, because I don't have the CMDB operational. Um, 87 accounts, don't even know how many pieces of equipment, but 87 different uh, accounts um, that are all supposed to be fully inventoried. Uh, by uh, next Friday. Uh, we're at 51 c complete uh, now. We'll cross-check that against the, uh, the CMDB. Uh, but what got us here is that during COVID, um, this hasn't been done for three years. Just letting you know. And it's because it was, I got it. We, we were challenged. People weren't home. They're like, don't worry about hand receipts. Don't worry about anything. And now, lucky me, um, it is written in into our contract that thou shalt inventory wall to wall, all, all, all IT equipment. And that, that's the individual side of it. And we're also doing the same thing on the server side. But there, it has been a challenge. Um, like she said, if you don't know that, and even right now, again, this is all manual. This is trust. You know, us cross-checking manually. Again, not us. Again, I have a team back there that is actively doing this right now. Cross-checking several numbers against what we bought, purchased, making sure it's in the DLA system. Um, you know, just again, trust them, but verifying all of that stuff. And then ideally, when we get this right, when we inventory what we have now, that's a starting point. But in the future, what I would like to see us do is when we buy, when we buy, when we do these large buys, five or 600 computers per quarter, which is about what we do, we have all those serial numbers. They're already um, programmed at Dell, and they plug into the network, feeds the CMDB, and then I don't need these folks to do these manual inventories, right? I have a better source of data, and it's really essential to, again, it's essential to, to make this work. If you don't, if we do it any other way, right now we're just, we're this, fingers crossed. Um, she's grinding away. I signed her time card because I signed time cards. Now it's really big, real weird, but I do it. And, you know, she worked like 55 hours this past week doing, doing this, trying to, trying to get this by hand. Meanwhile, she has the same team that's building the CMDB, so ideally we can get it automated. But, yeah, it looks easy. On paper, it's easy. I should say that. It was so easy. I go, we'll have it done by 31 March. <laughs> that's what I, <laughs> and I have since been educated. Um, you know, as we uh, as I went from weekly updates to daily updates to to see how uh, see how we're doing in that. But yeah, all all of this is uh, all of these elements are, uh, are are critical. Oh, wow! Does this does this resonate with you? Does, it, does this make sense? These are the elements of of the command. Uh, and what we're trying to achieve or what they as a team, what we as a team are trying to achieve with Transcom Anywhere. We have the components. Um, we have the components. A lot of uh, IT uh, services and capability fed from DISA. You all familiar with DISA, Defense Information Systems Agency. Um, we've got our headquarters, remote users all, all over the globe, um, the JEC component command, Cloud One um, and Air Force capability. Uh, but um, adopted, I say adopted, it's being utilized by Transcom for many of its uh, systems of records, or programs of records, I should say, PORs. Um, there's, I think there's 54 programs of record that make this whole enterprise work, which means lots of vulnerabilities, lots of opportunity to excel. Um, but a portion of those are being uh, moved off of legacy systems, modernized, refactored, and put into, put into Cloud One. And then we recently, we run an instance of uh, AWS Cloud, GovCloud on-prem, on team of about uh, 12. And 
And so some of us in cloud one, some of us in that AWS on-prem. And then the alternating operating facilities that I told you about um, that are located at very various locations, needing all of that to be synchronized. And uh, the whole premise, when I the, the name of the brief, Transcom Anywhere and Securing the, the JDE, um, that's what this is all about, really being able to make all of this work seamlessly. Right now, it is, it is uh, far from seamless, in my opinion. I mean, it works, but it, it's not, I mean, it works, it's secure, but the capability to get everybody in is not there again. This doesn't include, right now, it doesn't include our mission partners, uh, mission partners, our commercial uh, mission partners, I should say, our, our uh, military mission partners are certainly integrated into this effort, and, uh, and it works. So using that zero trust framework, uh, which is daunting, I'm glad you all are learning. I'm glad you all are learning that. I'm getting smarter on it every day. Like I said, focus on those main areas, but they're all interdependent, of course. So I have to understand those other areas as well. Uh, but getting this operational across the globe, uh, paramount, whether it's, uh, what do we got going on, Haiti? Is it Haiti? So inevitably, so we're doing stuff with Haiti. Um, I believe Africa has asked us to get, get our stuff out of there, say go home, right? So. And this command, airdrops, Israel, serving, uh, bringing equipment to Ukraine. And that's, you know, kind of over on that side, of, that side of the globe. And then there's numerous things happening uh, in the Pacific at any given time. But all, all the stuff I'm talking about is all happening, uh, you know, right now as we speak. And that challenge is not going anywhere. And to fight the high-end fight, there's still more things that have to be done for this command to be able to serve uh, in the Pacific because of the, the distance between things, that, that tyranny of distance that you're often here uh, talked about. So if you, you all, have any ideas on how to do some of these things, that is what I'm counting on. That's why I was happy to come. Well, I was happy to come because Dr. Mary Bill asked me to come. But, but the opportunity to share with you all the, this, this challenge. So this is... This is really what, these are the key things that, are, that we're trying to get done in the command. Uh, opening up seaports. I think, have y'all saw in the news, they're getting ready to open up a, a, a port Gaza. Yeah. Yep. Communication on demand, boom. I think all, all of these things, uh, you know, make sense anywhere, anytime. Um, zero trust framework, cloud. And in a, at a hand wave level, what I'd like to see is, uh, you know, either, you know, cloud instances, um, synchronized cloud instances um, throughout the, all the locations, that, the major locations that we operate at, right, alternate facilities, main, main campus, uh, that are all synchronized uh, with uh, multiple uh, cloud vendors. And when, when we talk to cloud vendors, whether it's me or, or the government folks, right, they go, oh, well, Amazon will go, I'm a multi-cloud vendor. But that's not really what we want a multi-cloud, multi-vendor um, you know, offering where we can have any one of those stacks and we can bring them up and down to keep the adversary on their toes while making sure the entire enterprise continues to operate seamlessly. That's, that's kind of the vision of what, um, of what uh, General Van Ovos and the uh, J6 uh, want to see happen, J3 as well, um, but essential to provide that, that resilient uh, communications uh, that, that, it need, that we need a, as a nation. So um, this is probably, probably zoom through this in about 30 minutes or not. <laughs> I'm, I'm big time now, I'm getting close. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, 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 I'm really passionate about this, uh, this enterprise. Uh, I've been a part of it. When I wasn't doing personnel stuff, I've been part of this enterprise and trying to make this machine go and operate securely and efficiently. And when I was offered this job, um, I actually was visiting, um, I was vision, visiting uh, Scott Air Force Base at that time when the, when the opportunity uh, came up. And they asked me, and I, 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 they go, do you want a job? I go, sure. And they go, what about Scott? And I go, I said, yes, it took me zero seconds. Because being a part of this, it's just an extension of what I was doing, and I felt very comfortable that I could help in his organization, and I, and I feel that way today. Um, and I feel like I have a great uh, partnership uh, with the government. Uh, they, we consider ourselves teammates in this effort, 
even though they've contracted it out. You've heard many uh, folks speak about that. You know, none of this works without that overall partnership of government, commercial, contractor, all, all of those things. And, um, and we'll continue to uh, try to advance myself. I'll continue to try to advance this mission as best I can. And where I, where I uh, can't or when I see challenges, I'm looking for folks like you all uh, to come in. That's, wh that's what I'm trying to do. I'm a hiring manager. I'm all of those things. Um, and I, bring, I look for talent, right? And, and that's one reason why, why I'm here, like I said. Um, I would love to see you all be a part of it, whether it's an intern or a contractor or government, any, anything to help contribute. But I know you all have the, the brain power uh, to help solve some of these tough problems for the command, but really, really for your nation. That's what this is all about. I love this stuff. And do it all. I mean, I really could do it all day. And I've, hell, I did it for 30 years, and I'm still doing it. I guess. <laughs> so, any questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, from a hiring perspective, um, like if anybody's asking, like, what's the difference between being a contractor and being a contractor? Yeah, I, I, I refrain from put, I almost put that link, and I, I said no. It'll, it'll frustrate somebody. <laughs> So if, I, if we look at it holistically, um, like I said, my, I would say I'm, I'm one of three major contractors that support the enterprise. It's divided. They have a cyber, uh, a cyber security office um, and a cyber uh, operations force office. And then my MITS, uh, Managed Information Technology Service, those three are the major, major ones that uh, interact with the government. And... I would say getting on with uh, one of those three, doesn't have to be, uh, but getting on with one of those three, I'd say 50% of the current government employees that I work with started on one of these. Because it's just all be one contract, they broke it up. And what the government has done over time, and my equivalent, the government equivalent that I work with every day goes, it's all a team effort. I'll, I'll look, we win-win. It's a chance for them to preview talent and bring it on. He encourages me to bring on younger folks. The enterprise doesn't really support bringing on students, but we are trying to find creative ways to bring on students. They get evaluated and, and cut them over to the GS system. And I, I'm okay with that because I'm going to keep hiring. It's, it's pretty, because it doesn't take me 279 days from the time of applica application through USA Jobs to bring somebody on. I could have somebody on in three days or something. I, I was on in three days after they said yes. That's the real world to me. I don't see a lot of people going from like contractor necessarily, I mean, uh, to federal government. You don't? Just because federal government usually tends not to be able to pay. So I, it's different reasons. I honestly, I just lost uh, my test integration lab lead to the government to lead, to be the government lead for the test integration lab. I don't know the dollar figures involved. I don't know if it's comfort. I don't know if it's security. I mean, we just started a five. So he had easily four more years, and it's the government's one of their top two priorities is, is the test integration lab to build a lab to replicate all the things so we know how to, you know, how to take care of them out in the uh, operational, on the operational network. I didn't ask him. Not my business. He gave two weeks. He worked all the way up until the last day and then moved over to the government. I don't know why, I honestly, but people do it. I've watched some of my peers at my level go back in the government. They're working in the Pentagon Cyber Policy Office. I, I don't know. I haven't known anyone personally enough to, to say, hey, bro, why, why'd you leave all that money? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I, I, I haven't had that opportunity. It's all been folks I don't know as well. Vic, yes, I'm there. So, so I want to make a pitch for the Garden Reserve. Um, back, in, back in the early 2000s, uh, you'll remember the commercial sector was getting hit a lot with nation-state hits. Mostly Microsoft was getting nailed by China, right? And so they hacked back. It was all over the news. And then the Obama administration uh, said, you can't do that, right? The DOJ was going to prosecute them because it's an act of war, right? And as a result, most of those folks at Washington, up in the state of Washington, are now part of the Washington National Guard. 
so Monday through Friday, they work for Cisco, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, right? And they go on the weekends and they get to do work with me and they get to be offensive, right? Um, and I say that we need the same thing on the defensive side. Most of our cyber protection teams are actually in the National Guard, right? And so getting in that avenue through the Guard and the Reserves is a way to get into those contracting jobs full time, but then also to transition over to government civilians. All of my, uh, all of my government civilians when, when I was working offensive cyber, every single one of them was in the Guard, number one. And then every single one of them uh, had started as a contractor before they flipped the GS. Because once they're in the GS system, they have stability for when the contractors change. Yeah. Because that's the thing that becomes complicated. Yeah. Is every time those smaller contractors flip from one company to another company, they have to rehire the that, And that's what I just went through. That's why I was surprised he left because we just started. It's four years left on the contract. But he, so he left, just, he left uh, December, so just eight months in. Or so to the contract, he went. He went over to the government. Go ahead. Just a caveat: what he was saying, the South Dakota Army National Guard does is part of a multi-state CPT. Uh, I used to be on it. I'm now on a different cyber team at Joint Force Headquarters. But that's converting to a CPT mission element this October with the new TDA. So we absolutely have cyber capabilities in the South Dakota Army Guard. Um, I'm not aware of any in the Air Guard, and I don't know, your Naval Reserve, you could talk what opportunities you guys have. So. Yeah, so um, there's not a lot, I mean, being in South Dakota, we're pretty landlocked, right? <laughs> so um, I do drill here, um, but most of us, were all cross-assigned to somewhere on the coast. And, uh, you know, we do have an information warfare community here, uh, but like I said, for us, it's trying to get our trying to get our sailors out to their component commands as often and as much as possible. And you know, it gets difficult because you run into budget constraints and you know things like that. But um, that's kind of where we we that's kind of where we're at. You know. Um, the reserve center here, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Navy. This is my opinion. <laughs> my opinion, and uh, no one else's. This is my personal opinion. But uh, the, the uh, reserve centers that are more landlocked tend to deal more with the admin side, so your, your uh, physical readiness, your um, uh, financial readiness, which is huge to the military your readiness on uh, as far as your uh, training goes, but as far, you know, your general military training goes, but as far as getting the actual experience, we want to get you out to, like, Bremer.
All right, can you guys hear me all right? Is that good? Awesome. I'm terrible with public speaking, so I'm just going to start with that right off the gate. Uh, and thank you for making it to the last talk of the day, which is uh, locking down the life cycle, integrating security into CI CD processes. I'm Joe. I'll kind of cover an intro and go through it. Uh, so here's an agenda of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you're going to learn about me, because I'm sure you guys don't know who I am. Uh, talk about some basics of CI CD, because I'm sure. If I start going right into the gambit, you guys are going to be kind of lost, so a good overview is usually needed. Uh, we're going to talk about some traditional uh, software security guardrails and kind of what that entails. We're going to talk about threats and some real world examples, what's going on out in the world. Uh, we're going to talk about advanced practices, so how can you kind of elevate your engineering bar at your org. Uh, and then I've got a quick Q and i uh, I'm the last talk, so no one's really pressing up against me. So if you folks have questions, I'm happy to hang around for a little bit. Uh, so about me, uh, right now I work as a manager for the DevSecOps platform team at Paylossi. It's a payroll company uh, based in Chicago. Uh, it's a really great team. We really focus on software scanning, so SAS, DAS, SCA, IEC, all that fun jazz, and I'll kind of talk all about what that means, but it's a really great team. And before that, I worked, f uh, I managed a product security team uh, at a fintech, st a fintech startup. And then before that, I worked uh, for an Amazon subsidiary uh, managing a couple different security teams. So my background's pretty diverse um, and a lot of different kind of security domains. Uh, the fun part, I'm from Vegas, so coming up to South Dakota uh, was less than ideal because it's absolutely freezing here and I'm shaking, not only just because I'm nervous, but because I'm absolutely cold and I don't want to wear a jacket on stage. Um, but yeah, I've been in Vegas for six years. It's great. I love the city. A lot of fun things to do. It's warm. Uh, I'm a DSU cyber defense PhD student, uh, so I should get some good public speaking in before I go through uh, comps in five weeks and my dissertation. Um, my dissertation is going to be on supply chain, software supply chain security, so this will probably kind of come in use for the talk. Um, if you guys go to DEF CON or do stuff like that, I'm one of the original co-founders of the DEF CON AppSec Village. Life gets really busy when you decide you want to go into a PhD program and work full time. So it's one of the things I kind of had to leave behind uh, and turn it over to my, my teammates. Uh, I enjoy visiting national parks. I have a scratch kind of uh, map at home. I think I've been to nine. It's a great thing just to get away from security, get away from a computer. Um, so anytime you can kind of get away, great idea, highly suggest it. Uh, so let's talk CI CD. So CI, continuous integration, uh, automatic in integration of code, um, code changes from multiple contributors into a single software project. So again, a lot of my background knowledge kind of, or like space that I play in, is mostly in like larger enterprises, software uh, kind of first kind of companies. And so when you're dealing with many, many different people trying to put code into a code base, it gets really messy. I'm sure if there's some, is there any devs, hands up? Couple, few, great. Um, so yeah, doing software at scale can get really messy. Um, and so with that, not only getting code to the place, the code should be working correctly, which means you should be testing each change before it goes in to make sure you're not breaking the software. Because again, you may be working on a pull request and another team's kind of working on something else and if you merge them in together and they're not kosher together, you're gonna have a bad time. And uh, also like standardized artifact storage and versioning, so you wanna make sure you're working on the same uh, package versions, dependencies, vice versa, because if you're starting to rip things out and just lump it in, your teammates are gonna hate you if you're not communicating it, so. Um, I have some graphs in that which will kind of like explain it and visualize a little bit better. Uh, continuous delivery, so that's actually taking the code once it's built and pushing it to a production ready system. That's all it is, getting ready for that approval process. And so, right, we don't typically push code directly to prod. Say it with me, we don't push code directly to prod. We go through multiple environments, preferably a staging area where you would test your code, um, right? So just throwing that out there because a lot of people sometimes are like, yeah, let's just push the prod. No, don't do that please. Um, and also, right, delivery and deployment are sometimes used interchangeably, and I got a nice picture on this um, from NIST in the next slide, but 
Deployment automates the entire release process. Delivery is just getting it to the server and then you kind of do a manual review. So this is delivery versus deployment. This is a really great slide from a NIST white paper. If you go on NIST's website and look for the implementation of DevSecOps for microservices based application, yeah, it's a mouthful. But it's a really great chart if you love reading white papers. I do because I'm a PhD student. And so right, you can see that top chart where everything's green because it's automatic except for that deployed to production, that's a manual process, right? So you're kind of reviewing the code, testing the code, doing all that fun jazz because you don't really trust it before it goes out. And then for continuous deployment, you're doing the whole spectrum automated, start to finish. Um, from the moment the PR is going in, all the way through, it's all automated. That's really hard to do. Um, awesome, so I, I really like this picture, the splat your bugs. Uh, so, but this is traditional security guardrails. And this is probably a review for some folks. You guys know, show of hands who knows about static code scanning? Great, a couple people. Uh, so technology is typically associated with CID, CICD pipeline scanning, right? Static application security testing, SAST. Um, so what we're doing is looking at the actual source code, maybe the binary, we're not executing the application and we're just trying to go through the actual code and see what kind of vulnerabilities there are. So. Uh, maybe we find some SQL injection, maybe some buffer overflows, things like that. We're just trying to kind of parse through that source code. Uh, software composition analysis, and so what we're doing versus SAST is we're looking for actual vulnerabilities within uh, open source libraries, third party packages, dependencies, things like that. Um, so right, so SAST is typically looking more at your actual source code. Uh, software composition analysis is looking at how it's actually built and the vulnerabilities of the packages that are kind of being nested together. Uh, infrastructure as code, as you folks, uh, I don't want to date myself too much, but you might remember a time where uh, developers only did one thing, right? They only did like either front end code or back end code and then we started bringing in things like agile and right and now it's like the dev team is managing the infrastructure, they're doing the networking, they're doing the security, they're doing the coding, it gets really messy. So now we have this great concept of infrastructure as code where you can actually provision uh, infrastructure, maybe it's Terraform, maybe it's uh, CDK, right, if you're using AWS, uh, things like that where you're actually putting out that infrastructure and, right, if you don't scan it, which is what IAC scanning does, um, you can find misconfigurations, right, like maybe you were going to uh, deploy an S3 bucket but you put it on the public internet. And that's probably a bad idea if you've got sensitive data that's going in that bucket. Um, so you wanna go through that scanning and just go through those, um, those kind of configurations just to make sure that you're cleaning up anything that shouldn't be there. All right, in parallel, right, runtime scanning. So these are additional kind of uh, scanning that happens a little bit later in the pipeline. DAST, this should be pretty familiar to the folks that raised their hands for SAST, is that true? This is a quiet group. Um, so DAST, right, we're looking at typically like web applications, once they're built, uh, we go through and actually scan them and we're trying to observe its behavior. So, right, you're typically looking for things like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, uh, server-side request forgery, things like that. Um, it's a pretty standard process. A lot of folks are probably familiar with Burp Suite or uh, OWASP's, OWASP's Zap project, right? Um, those are DAST scanning technologies. Container scanning, right, we need to package software um, and sometimes it's easy just to deploy on containers. And so with container scanning, we're looking for vulnerabilities and misconfigurations actually in that container image itself. So the underlying infrastructure itself. Uh, and the last one, right, is fuzzing. So um, tip, there's a variety of different tools and sometimes fuzzing gets kind of synonymous with DAS, right? So if you're talking about burp, you can actually use burp to manually fuzz the application and test it. Um, but also sometimes you could take a binary um, that's executing and using something like AFL and you're actually just trying to throw garbage and see how the um, software resolves, right? So you could be looking for interesting crashes uh, and things associated with that to try and find and do vulnerability analysis. So that's a lot and if you guys kind of remember, right, this is our, our pipeline now, right? Continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. So if you guys really weren't paying attention for the last five minutes, I'll make it easy for you at the end of the day, right? So static code scanning kind of happens in this part of the process here on the left for continuous integration. 
runtime scanning happens later because right this infrastructure has been built it's out it's deployed onto a staging box and now we actually want to kind of probe once that infrastructure is there and then once that's all kosher we deploy for production do i have any movie buffs or i'm just trying to gauge everyone's uh attention at this point sure we'll go with that you guys are really quiet uh, you'll know this from uh, my cousin Vinny, right? Please answer the question. Does the defense's case of a secure pipeline hold water? This is kind of a play on words, but so based on that pipeline that you guys just saw on this last slide here, do you guys think that's reasonably secure? Is that a thumbs up, thumbs down? I see some thumbs up. Everyone, everyone's okay with that? Yeah, reasonably good, right? Well, if you guys know the movie, <laughs> she goes, the defense case is wrong, right? The defense doesn't hold water. So uh, let's actually talk some threats and real world examples while we're at it. Does everyone know where this is kind of from, this picture? It's from a white paper last summer that uh, CISA published along with the NSA. And it's called Defending Continuous CI CD kind of uh, environments. And so what are bad guys actually doing out there when it comes to CI and CD environments? Well, they're dumping your credentials from environmental variables, right? And they can leverage that in a variety of ways. Uh, they're utilizing your stolen keys, so your Git tokens, access to your Git repositories. Um, if they adversary steal your code, there's a lot of juicy information in there. They can modify the configuration of your CI CD infrastructure or the application source code itself. Um, they can inject code into the source code, right? Backdoor your code. Uh, we talked about IAC. Temp like right, so you can build infrastructure with that IEC code, but if an adversary injects into it, they can kind of tamper with it and redirect or uh, put it in a place that you don't want it. Um, building and testing, right? So injecting a bad dependency. Maybe you're using a third-party library, and you know someone compromises another third-party library, and they inject that bad dependency. You just got backdoored, right? Um, implant runners and, and CICD images and containers, right? Doing implants and that. So uh, if anyone use GitHub Actions, I see some hands, right? And what does it basically do? It runs arbitrary code. So if someone implants your runner, you just got pwned. Um, your CICD server, right? That's building and deploying all your infrastructure. You compromise that, you've just compromised your entire cycle and you've also been pwned. Um, bypassing reviews. So, right, as developers or software engineers, we get some PRs and we go, okay, my teammate built some code. Now I should review it just to make sure it's kosher, it looks good. But what if you um, also are able to create a new account into that CI CD kind of system? You can bypass the review or not do reviews and just force merge and do other crazy things. And then it's like, okay, we have an audit trail. So and so uh, reviewed it. That account's not legitimate, right? So there's things like that, or just abusing admin permissions because admins can force merge and do other crazy things. So uh, I think this is a really good slide because if you're kind of looking at that secure pipeline where people are like, yes, it's secure, none of these things kind of <laughs> fall into that. And so as like a defender, right? Like I think a lot of us in security, we all go through our own like microchasm of of like the stuff we work on so uh right if you're really into like apple zero days and like citizen lab reports there's like a there's a field for that that are just like oh my god i gotta update my iphone immediately to the next version because there's some crazy citizen lab report that's out there right everyone has their own cycle so for me when i look at this as like a defender of of ci cd environments and software engineers it's just it's been a rough year um so January 2023, uh, Circle CI, really popular um, um, CI kind of environment. Uh, malware on an employee device uh, led to the uh, exfiltration of a subset of database and stores. So customers lost their environment variables, their tokens, and their keys. Everybody had to re-rotate all their stuff really, really bad. So you gotta think, right? If an adversary um, pops a vendor, and now all your secret keys to all your stuff is gone, all of your source code and adversaries now tr uh, driving through it, and now you are that vector um, for, for theft, right? The adversary is looking at your stuff. So that really, really bad event. Uh, do folks know about the 3CX supply chain compromise? Show of hands, has anyone heard about this? 
It's kind of a popular event last year. So what's notable about this, and Patrick Wardle has a really great talk um, from, from Black Hat. You should go and watch it from last year. Um, and so North Korean threat actors actually um, compromised the software called Trading Technologies, and they backdoored it. That software was then consumed by a 3CX employee, which then led to the compromise of their infrastructure. Um, and they're a telecommunications kind of company. And so it was actually a double supply chain compromise attack. So it's kind of like the first notable, like there was a supply chain compromise and someone got popped and then someone else consumed it and then they also got popped. Um, and so it's kind of a really notable event, aside from like solar winds, right, of course. Um, this one is still kind of going on from the last I saw back up in January of this year, but there was a GitHub, GitHub forked repo, repo, uh, repo campaign. I can't talk today, it's late. Um, so adversaries were taking legitimate GitHub repositories and they were forking them, and then they were putting malicious code in them and redistributing them online. And so when people would go and pull those repos, they were pulling down the backdoor code. So even though the library worked as anticipated, right, because it was had the actual code in it, they threw in their, their backdoors as well. And so over 100,000 repos were contaminated and Microsoft was going back through to try and clean all this stuff up. And they were able to get a lot of them um, from, from doing automated analysis, but there was a lot that kind of went underneath the radar. And that started in May of 2023. Uh, are folks familiar with this one, the Team City kind of remote bypass? Show of hands on anybody on that? I see one hand, great. Awesome. Um, so Team City, another kind of build build tool as well, was exploited by not only multiple North Korean threat actors, but also the Russia SVR. So there's a bunch of CISA reports and things like that on it. But again, if you compromise folks' build environments, uh, you have complete control of their underlying code and infrastructure. So think about all the things that uh, software developers and teams are building you can cast a pretty wide net and get into anything you want. And then also, right, there's, there was another nasty Jenkins CVE that started right in the beginning of this year. Uh, again, another kind of allowing, remote, uh, allowing attackers to remotely grab cryptographic uh, keys and execute, execute arbitrary code. So if you know anything about that, really, really bad. And Jenkins is another popular um, uh, build tool. What's also funny is as I was writing these slides, there was actually another uh, CVE for Team City for a remote bypass this month, and I was just like, well, that sucks because I don't have enough room on this slide. So there's actually another notable event. I just was like, oh, this looks really good from a formatting perspective. But as a defender, like, it's really, it's really exhausting. And so you're probably wondering again, like, Joe, why are threat actors targeting CICD infrastructure? And, right, TLDR security is expensive and hard. Um, but you get indirect access to many targets. So if you compromise a single organization's CICD pipeline, the downstream effects are huge, right? You could have hundreds or thousands or millions of customers. So, right, think about the effects. If you compromise, say, Apple's code, right, and that code is shipped to hundreds of millions of devices worldwide, that's pretty big impact and pretty good capability for an adversary. Um, so, right, if you're not wanting to a target head on, going through a supply chain compromise or through targeting another org is another great way to get indirect access. Organizations have underinvested. So, if you want to talk to me about my dissertation that I'm going to have to write in a little bit, this is kind of where I'm going with it. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, enterprise security invents, uh, investments are expensive. So, like, I don't know if anyone's actually had to go through, like, security procurement for tools? Anyone like a hiring manager do budgets, things like that? Couple. Tools are expensive, aren't they? Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions. Um, I'm going through a SaaS kind of renewal right now. One tool for one set of scanning, 300 grand for my devs. Really expensive. Um, and so I think orgs just like, when you're thinking about all the different things that they have to balance and all the different needs that they have, just there's a lot of focus on traditional things that are well known, right? SAS, DAST, and those kind of tools, but also like you can't just always over index on one area. You gotta buy things like your EDR, your SIM, your other kind of security technologies. And so when it comes to supply chain security, orgs have just underinvested. And that's a whole nuanced topic, but 
if it's underinvested, adversaries are going to look at it. Which leads me to my next point, right? There's a lot of initial access vectors for this. It's really juicy. So malicious packages, uh, vendor CVs that we just kind of talked about. If you fish a developer, you steal their secrets. Um, you have exposed cloud infrastructure that's running uh, build servers, right? It all leads to the same adversarial goal, which means they're going to get access to your stuff, and you're going to get pwned. And if you're a public company, you're going to end up on the fun SEC kind of tracker bot that's on Twitter. Uh, so the uncomfortable truths, right? So like, why does this keep me up at night? And this is the scary lady that's like sweating profusely because she's like, oh my God, I'm afraid. Uh, so first bullet point, right? Like traditional software security guardrails, all that fun stuff we talked in the beginning. The only thing that that's doing is making sure that your organizational developers have not created uh, software with vulnerabilities. There are different vulnerabilities found at different times, but that's all it's doing. It's basically just saying your org has not contributed to more vulnerabilities. And so that's a key element to uh, you know, secure by default, secure by design. Absolutely, but there's a lot more to securing your code and infrastructure than just doing those scans. The other fun one, right? Developers have privileged access to systems and software. So, right, like devs need to run code and they need to build systems and they need to stand up infrastructure. So someone with the absolute minute permissions is not going to be able to do their jobs. And so sometimes they're like, hey, I need local admin access or hey, I need root on this box. Um, it leads to a lot of scope creep. And so if you fish a developer or you target a developer in lateral movement, it's really bad, right? Because they have that access to those systems. Um, CICD infrastructure is usually integrated to other systems, usually ticketing systems, so JIRA um, or like communication systems like Slack. It's a, if you've ever kind of worked in like enterprise software or like um, kind of like a big community like that, it's really great when you have um, a Slack bot that kind of feeds your PRs and says like, hey, this needs approval, this needs review. But also you have to remember that underlying integration. So there's an API key that's linking that all together. So if someone steals that API key, you've got lateral access. Uh, large organizations sometimes have multiple pipelines, right? If you think about really, really big companies, mergers and acquisitions are a thing. Um, teams that build mobile build differently than folks that build web, right? The Android team needs to build things a different way than the normal website team. The way that iOS is built is different than Android. And sometimes people are just like, eh, I need to do something crazy with Ruby or I need to do something with, with, with a new technology and I want to try it out and I don't want to go through all this process of setting it through our CICD so I'm just going to kind of do a one-off. It's great, but it's really hard as a defender when you're trying to normalize and standardize a stack. And the last one, which is everyone's favorite, right? Software technical debt can prevent your hardening initiatives because sometimes it's like, hey, we have this customer that is using this old product of ours, um, but we can't upgrade the software because the customer is still using it. And so that just provides that adversary a larger attack surface, right? Because it's not hardened appropriately. And so really like the main message here is, right, organizations need to advance beyond traditional security measures, which is like our SAS to SCA, and we need to really embed comprehensive security practices throughout development and operations. Uh, so let's talk the advanced practice stuff. That's this the fun stuff. Is that why you guys came here for the advanced stuff or just to me bash the normal traditional stuff? Cool. Uh, so advanced practices, where does the engineering bar need to be and where is it going? So I kind of threw this list together. These are the things I find that are like really hard to do or like kind of cutting edge or things that you could, should start thinking about and talking about to your teams. And this is everything from software build of materials, software provenance, commit signing, threat modeling, PQC or post-quantum cryptography, hardened images, uh, a vulnerability reporting program, VRP, sometimes a you know, bounty program or pro a disclosure program. There's a million different names for it. And uh, uh, memory safe languages. I'm going to go through all these, so don't stress. So for SBOMs and software provenance and commit signing, SBOMs, right, if you were in the talk this morning, is essentially just a recipe for your software of, you know, think of it like a food label. How is it kind of packaged? What do you have? What's all in it? 
Software provenance is a little bit more tricky. This is actually tracking where all the parts come from, who made them, how they've been changed, and making sure they're genuine and unaltered. So this is really focusing on the history and kind of telling that story. So software bill of materials is that food list of here's my stuff. Provenance is really trying to figure out what's the wider story with it. And then commit signing, right, is actually when you're doing, um, you know, set, uh, committing your code into your repo, you're using dig digital signatures to basically say, I am the one who made these changes or I am the one that is suggesting this or doing this action. So it's a very integrity focused piece. And so for software build materials, I'm gonna preach this because there's a lot of misconception in the, uh, in the industry about this. You give them to others. <laughs> Your organization should already know what your developed software is packaged with, right? If we talk about SCA, you're going to know all the packages because you should be scanning your code that goes through it. And then also, you should know from your SAS scanning kind of what that underlying piece is. So between those two things, you should really kind of know how your software is built and packaged. This is just like basic uh, asset information, right? What is important is giving it to other folks. So the downstream customers. Um, I can envision a world where people will say, hey, there's another log for J. How do I not know that XYZ vendor isn't affected? And you should just be able to go, here's my SBOM. Here you go. And you can grab it anytime, 24-7, 365. The other end of it is you as an organization should be consuming SBOMs from all your partners. So it's not something that like you're using your own SBOM for your own org. It's your org is basically giving it to customers and you're receiving them from other organizations. So I know folks get a little sticky. They're like, what's the value of SBOMs? The SBOMs are, the value is really for other people. And then also when you're the org, you want to consume them from your uh, partners. Threat modeling, PQC, and hardened images. So threat modeling, it's kind of a true and tested thing. How many folks have threat modeled before? One person, really? That's surprising. Uh, I, I wish it was more. Um, threat modeling is really great. There's, it's just a systematic process to go through and figuring out what kind of vulnerabilities or threats are applicable to a system. And so if you think about this, really it should be sitting down with a development team and saying, create me a network architecture, create me a DFD flow in doing that. But if you can think, right, in really large orgs, doing that at scale and making sure it's updated all the time, that is really difficult. Like, what's the record? Think about all the versions, all the changes, what classifies a major change. Threat modeling has kind of been around for quite a while, and there's some great tools and some frameworks for it. But doing it at scale, keeping it updated is very, very difficult. Uh, PQC, so how many folks are familiar with post-quantum cryptography? A couple, great. Where, why is this relevant? So remember how I was talking about commit signing before? How many folks know that PGP is actually doing the commit signing? Yeah, that's not the greatest underlying thing when it comes to like layers of trust and verification. And so when you think about post-quantum cryptography and then basically throwing out most of our existing uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms, all the stuff that you're signing your code with or the certs that you're, uh, you know, binding with your binaries, completely useless. So think about that as you approach. Again, it's not the right now you need to freak out and worry about it, but we really, sh like, Cryptographic problems struggle and plague a lot of orgs. Key management is really difficult. Secrets management is really difficult. Um, and so when you think about those are problems, so is right the idea of post-quantum. Uh, it really kind of changes a lot of fundamental things. Um, this one's a passion of mine, but hardened images. Are folks kind of familiar with like image hardening and distro lists? I see one or two hands. Uh, so this is really great. So right when you're thinking about a container image, you're you're typically building, say, like an underlying Linux kind of operating system that's there and some software that's thrown on top of it, and that's building your your infrastructure, or like hosting it. Um, the great idea and like shameless plug for ChainGuard, no affiliation with them, but ChainGuard is a really great product, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Also, there's this concept of chiseled images for folks that know uh, go, can go look through the canonical repo on GitHub. There's some really great things, and essentially what it is is you're carving out uh, the operating system. There is no underlying operas, operating system. It's all done at runtime. 
And so essentially what you do by removing the operating system is you've reduced the attack surface. It doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, and it's hardened by default. So meaning that there are no vulnerabilities on that specific software package that you're using. So all you need to do when you're building your software is just pull the latest container build. And so the devs really don't have to worry about patching because they're always consuming the latest and always building from on top of it. It's really, really important, kind of that next thing, but it's very hard to do. Why things like hardened images are great. So if you remember me talking about provenance and software build of materials, things like ChainGuard, those images not only do not have the uh, underlying OS stripped, or stripped out of it, but it comes packaged with the software bill of materials. It comes packaged with the software provenance data. And so when you think about that, it's like, well, I have all the provenance data, I'm sourcing it from a secure source, and it really solves a lot of problem with the underlying uh, vulnerable infrastructure. Uh, so I'll kind of breeze through these last two, uh, VRP and memory safety. So, right, VRP, how many folks are, are like familiar with like bounty programs? I see a couple. Um, I've built three from the ground up for three different companies and seen them kind of deployed. So I've worked a lot with the security research community and like on the corporate side of um, that aspect, but you would be surprised how many organizations don't have bounty programs still. And it's really valuable because you got to think like if you're someone on the internal security team and you know you think your software is great, but then someone externally is like sending you an email like, hey, there's a security flaw in your product or like the like some news or you're on a Brian Krebs article or something, right? That's a very uncomfortable spot to, to be in. So the best thing to do is really just have an established process for that. That way you can ingest vulnerabilities for your own product, handle it accordingly. Um, and sometimes like you don't even need to pay anything. As long as you just have that process stood up, of course it's ideal if you can pay the community because things don't always work for free. Um, but having that opportunity is incredible uh, for your org. And I know this is one of uh, Director Easterly's favorite things is memory safety. And I know a lot of orgs are kind of like, how feasible is this? And I can talk all day about that. Um, but memory safety, right? So. For folks that use C, C++, or other kind of uh, memory-based languages, they come with a lot of buffer overflows, uh, memory leaks, different types of vulnerabilities in that aspect. And so, I don't want to rehash your entire like segment this morning, but if you can go to a memory-safe language, you've essentially removed two-thirds of those vulnerability classes. So, it's, right, shameless plug, so even if you do all these other things great, but you're still building on C, you still kind of have that, you know, area of opportunity to do better. Um, no, I, I was gonna make a joke and put a meme in here about like, Rust is going to the moon, but I, I figured I didn't know how many people would get it. But yeah, it's the big joke right now. But, but Rust is okay, it's okay. So putting the pieces together, right, it's really difficult. If folks were doing this stuff, I would be more or less very impressed, but there's a reason why a lot of folks aren't doing it. It's just, it's very difficult. And so, right, each organization is going to have their own unique strategy when they're protecting their pipeline. They're gonna have their own specific set of uh, software languages. They're gonna have their own unique customers. They work in their own unique industry, right? The way we protect SCADA equipment is the way we you know, is different than the way we protect things on, um, you know, banking infrastructure. They're two very, very different pieces. Um, and so the, the biggest thing I can kind of say from like a managerial hat up here is the partnership aspect is really key to success because software and engineering teams, the thing they hate is like security people just lumping giant chunks of vulnerability scans and saying, go fix this, go fix this, go fix this, go fix this. The best thing you can do is partner with them and kind of lead by example and say, I'm here to help you. And so if there's things like that where, right, like hardened images or elevating that bar where, where two groups can come together, you can actually solve a problem and start, you know, versus just like, hey, go clean up my tickets, you're past SLA or this or that, or like security theater, right? But it's really hard, I, shameless plug, like go and talk to people, be friends with your peers, teamwork uh, is really dream work. This is actually my final slide before the Q&A. Uh, I know we're like a little fast, but I also know this is the last talk of the day, so I didn't know what kind of uh, questions folks would have, but essentially, right, adversaries continue to improve their TTPs. 
you know, it, I don't want to go too much down the AI rabbit hole, but you got to think about this, right? They can, adversaries are writing better phishing emails, right? Because now that language gap of not knowing English or how English is transposed from their natural language of choice, you know, that helps. Even think about, not, I, mean, I don't want to talk too much about like vulnerability side of things, but even when it comes to research, if there's a technology that you don't understand and you need to know it better, you can go into OpenAI and be like, can you tell me some things about Jenkins? And it'll tell me, and you just start going down that. And I think honestly, in this modern world, it's a lot better than trying to read sometimes the developer docs that go through on, on their website. Because if anyone's ever read software documentation or API documentation, it is atrocious. And I see some people nodding their heads. It absolutely is like, you're like, who wrote this? Um, you can't find stuff. It's, it's a mess. And sometimes just throwing the, uh, the hyperlink into OpenAI and be like, hey, can you parse this? Can you, can you explain it to me like I'm stupid? Or like, how could I abuse this? And be like, yeah, here you go. Here's how you do it. Um, it's great. But adversaries will continue to get better, which means we really need to strive towards moving towards those advanced practices because that's the only really way to keep your sensitive data safe and keep the adversaries out. Um, right? If you kind of put this together in a mental model, I don't have a picture of this, but all that stuff with software provenance, uh, software build materials and linking it together. If you were to go ask your, um, your IR teams or whoever's in your SOC and say, how do we not know that we've been compromised from a supply chain compromise? They're going to probably go, I don't know. Because, right, like, how do you know that all the commits are valid? How do you know that the software hasn't been modified? How do you know it's not being sourced directly? How do you not know that a developer was just like, yeah, this code looks good, and they just ripped it off of GitHub and they threw it in their local machine. Um, so it's really hard. So that's where provenance and linking it all together is, because if you can take all those verifiable objects from each path, and uh, you know, there's some resources I can talk about later in the Q&A that you can kind of leverage, things like Salsa Framework, right? You can put into your alerting pipeline, like, okay, if this hash doesn't match with this piece of the provenance data, it triggers an alert and someone should go investigate it. Because if someone's trying to merge code, right, where everything doesn't validate, you kind of know that the integrity has been, you know, um, impacted. And so my last kind of thought with this, right, is enterprises that fail to make strides towards these investments are going to become a prime candidate for future compromise, whether that's your org directly um, as a target or indirectly, right, because those build uh, infrastructure, we can see the adversaries are targeting it. And um, if you're on those platforms or you expose infrastructure or using a certain package, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of when, not if. Um, and so really I just want to kind of put this information out there to kind of let the community know like there are ways to deal with these problems. They're very difficult, um, some of it technically, but some of it just partnership and relationship building with your engineering team. And so uh, that's my last slide. I have a little graphic here with like my Twitter slash X, I don't know what you call it this day. So it's kind of merged both with the bird and the symbol. Uh, so if you have questions or want to do stuff, I, I always patrol Twitter. I have a really curated feed. Um, and that's really where I get a lot of like my like normal intelligence of like who got popped and is on the SEC thing. But that's my talk. Uh, any questions from the group? I know that was fast and I probably just rambled. Uh, everyone's quiet. Uh, tuning the tool certainly helps, um, right? Like sometimes it doesn't make sense to look at certain vulnerabilities depending on your org. Um, and sometimes it's like the other way I would think about it, having like been on this side of the fence for a while is look across holistically for your environment. Like bounty programs expose this really well, but um, you'll kind of know like, does your organization strict, like holistically struggle with cross-site scripting? Right, because you'll happen in like one portion of the site and then the bug will get closed and it happens over here. And it's like, well, what's the underlying problem? Is everyone sourcing from the same library? And so it's like, okay, we're using really bad input validation, really bad output encoding. And so just our sanitization efforts are not good. So the thing that I would also like urge you to do is like sometimes it's not the tools, sometimes it's the root problem. And so sometimes taking a step back 
and actually being like, what's the wider picture and what's the root of the problem? It may just be a library that one team is all using, and if you fix that, it fixes it across as many things. I know that's easier said than done, um, but there's that, and that's also why like things like hardened containers are also a thing, where it's like, if you're able to source that with a reduced attack surface and vulnerability footprint, you're not really going to find a whole lot when you're scanning. A lot of that noise is just gone by default. Um, so sometimes it's just changing that engineering lens of how you're looking at the problem. So I, I, that's the advice I would kind of offer. Sometimes it's a tool, right? Like sometimes you're like, I got Ruby and I have a scanner that doesn't scan Ruby or I'm using Golang and I can't scan Golang with this tool and there's gaps. Um, so sometimes that's hard and that can be a tooling problem, but for the most part, it's like, should this really be a critical? Should this really be a high? Making those kind of decision kind of knowledge gaps and prioritization. But I would also say, take a step back and look at the bigger picture. I know someone else had a question. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, right, and this is me wearing like a manager hat, right, is like you have to kind of bring this up at a high level within the engineering org um, because you're always going to, like, developers are very opinionated, <laughs> first and foremost. If anyone's ever worked in software engineering, had to deal with software engineers, they're very passionate, um, they're very opinionated. And so with that, any kind of change to that flow of, like, that's your day-to-day, -day, it's going to ruffle feathers. And so... The best thing to do is really, in my experience, focus on the strategy aspect. Um, so partnering and, and trying to under like explain like this is a problem, right? Because if I if I can't trust your code, if I can't trust your build, then the whole underlying system just cannot be trusted. It's a huge risk, and so you kind of have to. This is where I kind of said like the working together aspect, because I think if you approach people and just say this is a huge concern and you know we all need to work together on it. I think you can approach some of those conversations. And I think, again, like sometimes working and getting a couple principal engineers together, that may or may not be productive, but I think if you really elevate it up to your like senior leadership team or your engineering like directors and things like that, and you say like, here's the information, this is why we should do it, this is why it's important, things can get, you know, brought top down as well. So I think one, it's doing it strategically and helping and lending a hand, not just like, again, throwing vulnerabilities over a fence, but also getting that top-down kind of authority. Because sometimes like security teams, they feel kind of toothless, right? Where they're like, you shouldn't deploy your code because it's got vulnerabilities. It just gets deployed anyways. And you're like, well, what am I doing here, right? Um, so really having that authority top-down also helps. I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but. It, it did. Okay. Very much so. Cool. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> as long as it's for democracy, I guess is the joke. I don't know. I haven't played Helldivers, so but I but I know the memes. What's that? Okay. Yeah, so regarding licensing, yeah, like it's scanning. Personally, like it's not an area I like to get in from a security standpoint. Uh, if you're talking about like license, license aspect of it, right? Yeah, yeah, see what you're saying. Uh, personally, like I kind of like, I, I have the capability and I turn it over to my legal team or compliance team. I'm like, hey, you guys are the licensing experts. You guys are the, the lawyers. Like, is GPL good or other MIT, right? Like, I, I'm a security guy first and foremost. Like, yeah, my tooling basically allows for that underlying side of it. Um, it's not really a space I focus on personally. But, um, yeah, have the capability. Do do it. Uh, I really just kind of dictate that over to legal teams and just kind of say, like, is everything is everything okay here? Because uh, folks know Oracle gets really mad at you when you're... <laughs> you you absolutely could, right? And this is where like SBOMs come into play, right? Because it captures that licensing information. And so as long as you built a policy within your pipeline to say, don't do whatever strings going through, I'm sure you could absolutely do it. Have I practiced it at scale? 
No, but I'm sure you could do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a solvable problem. Any other questions? Right. But I also kind of deep down know the answer really was no. So I'm yeah. kind of like, I don't know what to say here. So I guess maybe this is out of scope for your talk, but it almost seems like you're, you're targeting maybe larger development organizations a little bit. Like, if you were like a smaller team, like, would, how would you kind of prioritize some of your recommendations? I guess, if that's yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, I'll, no, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a good example. Um, depending on the organizational size, the priorities are going to be different, right? Sometimes folks are like, we got to go push a product out, or we got to do a certain thing, and, and so like things get shifted in the stack. Um, so every that's why I said every org is going to be different in that regard. Um, that being said, anyone regardless of size, if they're building software or doing software, have those problems that we're talking about right now. And so here's a good example. There, <laughs> there was a, a, an issue I had to deal with uh, at our office where a dev team was like, hey, we have this problem with this one dependency that we're, we're relying on. And so this project was, um, I think one of like the top like NPM like repositories on GitHub. And so if, once you're up on a certain status within GitHub, I think it's like the top 500, they mandate that you have 2FA on your GitHub account. Probably important, right? Because you don't want your stuff to get compromised. And actually in the, in the uh, kind of like history on GitHub, you can see it, the team goes, this is an undue burden on us, and versus going into like NuGet and whatnot, we're just gonna rip our code off of GitHub entirely, and we're gonna host it on our own domain. So they completely left GitHub, <laughs> minus the legacy versions, and went to this old thing. And so it's like, you know, I get it, like it's a small, like it's a small open source kind of community driven project with a very few amount of developers, but that's, that's not the right take. And I kind of looked at it and I was like, we should look for alternatives. Um, and so that, that's kind of my point, right? Like I get it's a smaller org, smaller team, but that shouldn't be the cop out because you're gonna see that, right? Like, oh, we're just gonna pull our stuff off of GitHub and what do you think an adversary is gonna do? They're gonna look at it and be like, here's an attractive target because we just compromise your infrastructure and none of the security tooling that the rest of the world is on, you're not using it. And now we just have downstream access into all your stuff. And so that's sometimes a business ending event, uh, a community project, like completely game over kind of situation. So I'm not sure if that really answers it, but like, honestly, it's kind of inexcusable regardless of size. I think it just comes down to prioritization and ultimately like trying to dice the, the solution differently. So sometimes like, right, taking a step back, what's important, why it's important. Um, should you go right into S-bombs immediately right now? Definitely not if you're not even doing SAS. Like, go do SAS, go clean up your vulnerabilities first. Like, there's an order of operations. Um, so that's what I would say. Cool. Any other questions? We got, like, 10 minutes left or so. If not, i can happy to call it there. If you have questions, also, like, I'll be hanging out for a bit. You can come and stop me off the, off the stage. Great. All right, we'll close with that. Thank you all. <laughs>